time in the city My hair plugs ain't pretty Hot times in the city I'm feeling kinda bad It's time right now For the David Feldman Show He's talking politics and comedy too He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to He's just a lefty from way back He's a union man with an Emmy for writing Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way right now for the David Feldman show so get your ears on right the buckle in real tight he's got a lot to say and he's coming your way he's got a lot to say and he's coming Welcome to the Mop Up for November 8th, 2021. I'm David Feldman coming to you from a parking garage overlooking an air shaft somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 50 degrees, 56 degrees and cloudy. By now, you've heard about Travis Scott, the rapper and the tragic stampede at Astro World. The lawsuits against him have already begun. They're already suing Travis Scott. They're already suing Drake. And yet... No lawsuits uh, against Alec Baldwin. No lawsuits against the producers of Rust. So I'm going to be taking your calls a little later on in the show. And by that, I mean I'm going to open this up to the Zoom room, our virtual studio audience in the Zoom room. Do you think that Travis Scott is being treated differently from Alec Baldwin? Uh I think so. I do. So we're going to talk about Travis Scott on the show today. And of course, new information coming out about the set, the Rust set and the budget. The budget, the Hollywood Reporter has gotten its hands on the budget for Rust. And I'm going to talk about the budget and how it is identical to this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that got passed off as progress on Friday. We're hearing uh, victory laps. We're hearing that you know the Democrats should take victory laps for passing this $1.2 trillion budget deficit. And get your pad and pencil. There's going to be a little math. I'm going to show you, if we have time, why the the rust budget which has been exposed this is a a a key into capitalism and hollywood bookkeeping why this is identical to the infrastructure bill well let's talk first about cats shall we yes each year the humane society euthanizes 530,000 cats. That doesn't include the cats who are abandoned and left to die. We, we know of 530,000 cats that are killed by the Humane Society. I have no idea how many other cats are killed. And there is only one place to get a cat. It is from a shelter. If your cat is not a rescue, you did something wrong. 
If you procured a cat, you did something really wrong. If you paid for a cat, that is wrong. And if you bought a designer cat, you did something that is evil. If you paid $3,000 for a Bengal cat, you and the individual who sold you that cat, the individual who bred that Bengal cat are evil. And you all must spend two years at the Humane Society inside a cage. There is no excuse for selling, breeding, or owning a designer cat. If you have a designer cat, you are evil. If you're allergic to cats and think owning a hyperallergenic designer cat is the solution, you are wrong. The solution for you is no cat. When you buy a cat instead of rescue one, you are sustaining a market for designer cats. Now, if there is a market for designer cats, many of whom end up dead because they end up looking defective. I can't sell a cat like this. This is a, like a def an irregular Chanel bag. I, I can't sell it. Where does it go? Where does that irregular Bengal cat go? Because nature isn't perfect. If you're a cat breeder, I can't believe there's such a thing when we're killing 530,000 a year that we know of. If you're a cat breeder and you're selling designer cats, they have to look perfect. And the ones that don't look perfect, where do they go? They die, they're killed, they're euthanized. And what does that say about how the people who buy designer cats, the same way they would buy a Maserati, what does that say about how they look at us? What does it say about them and how they view us as disposable? Their cats that they buy are disposable products because many cats have to die in order to get that perfect Bengal cat. The factory that makes your shirt in Bangladesh that burns to the ground with all the seamstress, seamstresses there with them. There's no great leap from buying and supporting anybody who breeds designer cats to not giving a crap that that designer shirt you bought comes from a factory in Bangladesh that burnt to the ground because they locked and they locked all the doors and the, seamstress, the seamstress, seamstresses died inside of there. You don't care that the Amazon workers are forced to toil away in unventilated warehouses without the proper COVID protection protocols so you can get your ab roller manufactured by Guatemalans earning starvation wages. When you buy a designer cat, you are buying into this whole system of exploitation. You're buying into the whole idea that life is disposable. There is something seriously wrong with you, something immoral and evil if you require a cat with a, a specific aesthetic. Like I said uh, earlier, it reveals who you are and it's evil. There is no such thing as an ugly cat. Only ugly humans who think it's worth $3,000 to buy a Bengal cat. It costs $3,000 to buy a Bengal cat like Emilio, who I have up there on the screen. He costs $3,000. Alec Baldwin's wife, uh, purchased this $3,000 cat for one of their kids. And uh, she brought Emilio with the entire brood up to Vermont two weeks ago to escape the paparazzi. And Emilio went with them and then he went missing. And the Baldwins are so out of touch with what regular human beings go through they called the police in Vermont and said, our $3,000 cat has gone missing, as though the police 
have nothing better to do than search for a New Yorker, a Hollywood elitist's $3,000 cat. That is white privilege. Would Travis Scott call the police in Vermont and say my $3,000 cat is missing? How do you think an African-American would be treated if he called the police and said, my designer cat is missing. We're visiting, my designer cat is missing. Now, here's the interesting thing about this sense of entitlement that people like the Baldwins and the Democratic Party writ large, this is the entitlement they have. Uh, they couldn't call the police if Emilio went missing in Massachusetts. Or Connecticut, because Emilio is against the law in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, now, I'll talk about that in a second. He's also against the law in New York City, where Emilio spends some of his time when he's not summering with the Baldwins out on the Hamptons. More about that in a second. Emilio is also illegal in Hawaii. I'll explain why Emilio is illegal in Hawaii in a second. I'm not getting any of this from the tabloids. I'm not searching out the Baldwins. I'm getting this information from the Baldwins Instagram feed. That's how out of touch Alec Baldwin and his ilk are. He just killed somebody and he's trying to market to us sympathy. They're trying to sell us on his trauma, his PTSD. He's, he and his wife are on Instagram telling us what they're going through. We're supposed to feel sorry for Alec Baldwin because he shot somebody and that's traumatic. And we're also supposed to feel sorry for these people because their $3,000 Bengal cat is missing. This is the leadership of the Democratic Party. This is who Terry McAuliffe is. This is who the Clintons are. This is who the Obamas are. They are clueless. They are absolutely clueless as to the plight of ordinary Americans. And they are also tacky and they have no class, even though they have money, they have zero class. How tacky is it a, to buy a designer cat, and then when your designer cat goes missing, when your $3,000 cat goes missing, forget that you just killed somebody, your $3,000 cat goes missing, and you call the paparazzi in and the police and say, please find Emilio, our $3,000 cat is missing. You have $3,000 to spend on a cat but none to spend on a full-time armorer that will keep you from shooting somebody to death. This is who the Democratic Party is, and this is why they, they don't win. This is why, you know, Alec Baldwin is Terry McAuliffe. Terry McAuliffe thinks if he holds a Bud Light on July 4th and does an Instagram video of him holding a Bud Light and flipping burgers, we're gonna think he's just, you know, regular folk. That's what he did from his vacation home on a lake in Virginia. That's like a hundred acres, but he's holding a Bud Light to try to pass himself off as one of us. This is who runs the Democratic Party. Now, we can't pass, can't pass Build Back Better because the money isn't there. The same way we couldn't pay for a full-time armorer on the set of Rust, because the money just isn't there. I'm gonna go over the budget for Rust because this is important. I'm gonna go over, get your pad and pencil out. I'm gonna go over the budget for rest, Rust and it is gonna reveal the lie of capitalism as it's practiced here in the United States. No money for a full-time armorer, but $3,000 for a designer cat, no money for the union workers on the set of Rust. Or when it comes to Build Back Better, no money for a safety net 
for the American people, but plenty of money for those tax breaks. Now, Emilio, eventually Emilio, the $3,000 Bengal cat that Alec and his wife purchased for the kids, eventually Emilio made his way home. But I have to tell you, if I were part of the Baldwin menagerie, I would have torn away from that family as fast as I could have too. I'd be out the door. That's what Emilio, they took him up to Vermont. You know, they had plenty of money to travel with the cat. The door was left open and he bolted as I would have. I would have gotten as far away from Alec as I possibly could and the wife. Are Bengal cats beautiful? Yes, because all cats are beautiful. But what happens when the breeder gets an ugly Bengal cat? See, if you're making designer cats, that means some of them are beautiful and some of them are ugly. So when you breed accidentally an ugly Bengal cat, where does that cat end up? Pretty much the same place the cinematographer ends up. Pretty much the same place the IATSE crew ended up when they made complaints. Out of sight, out of mind. Emilio is illegal in Hawaii. Emilio is illegal in Connecticut. And as I said earlier, Emilio is illegal in New York City. Emilio, Alec Baldwin's Bengal cat, is illegal in the city in which Emilio lives. This is not solidarity with undocumented workers. He is illegal because he is a murderer. Bengal cats, they're cute, they're adorable. We should not be breeding Bengal cats. So when Alec Baldwin brings Emilio from his estate in the Hamptons to his posh ski resort in Vermont, that also means that Emilio is visiting New York City all the time. Now, Bengal cats, there's a reason they're illegal in Manhattan and New York City, because they are only partly domesticated. They are half wild. Doesn't matter how many generations down from the original, uh, I think it's an Asian tiger cat, that you, you can breed five generations down. They still are potentially dangerous and they will always be wild. They will always be wild cats who, like Emilio, when the door is open, want to go outside and kill something. They're illegal in Hawaii because cats, especially Bengal cats, are a threat to other animals. When they escape, they go hunting and they destroy entire populations of birds. That is why cats must be spayed and neutered and kept indoors. They are murderers. I love cats. I've had close to 30 in my life. They're adorable. I was up on YouTube last night watching kittens. I love kittens. They're adorable, but they need to be spayed and neutered and they need to be kept inside. They do not need to be bred. They do not need to, we don't need more cats. We need fewer cats because we kill 530,000 a year in America that we know of because nobody wants them. Cats are dangerous. They're funny. They're adorable. They're cute. I love cats. I really do. I joke about cats, but I love cats. But they are the only animal other than humans who will hunt for sport. And cats, like humans, are wiping out entire species of animals. One of Australia's biggest regrets, other than Mel Gibson, is that they allowed cats centuries ago onto the continent. And those cats are killing rodents and birds that they need. Any argument that the Baldwins can offer up for buying a designer Bengal cat doesn't hold water. I don't want to hear that they have a kid who is allergic to cats. You can go without a cat, period. We don't need new cats. We need to find homes for the ones who have been abandoned and keep them in the home, not outdoors. 
Breeding cats to perfection, like Emilio, means there were some cats born defective and must be discarded. Cat breeding <laughs> is it's so satanic, it's hysterical. The idea that anybody would breed cats when we're killing 530,000 a year that we know of, it's so evil, it's funny, and it's emblematic of the complete and total disregard for life manifest in the ruling class, which Alec Baldwin is a part of. He is a multi-millionaire. He never has to work a day in his life again from the 30 Rock back end that he must have gotten. I've read that he you know, agreed for, uh, to lower his salary the last two seasons of 30 Rock as though that were magnanimous. I can't imagine his not owning a piece of the back end of 30 Rock. He is a multimillionaire who never has to worry about money. He is part of the white ruling elite of public radio here in New York City. He has his own show, Here's the Thing, on public radio. He hosts the Philharmonic. He's at the museums. He's raising money for the museums. He's at the galas and the film festivals out on the Hamptons. He rubs elbows with every Wall Street financier because the Wall Street financiers, like Emilio the Cat, they live in New York City, and they also, they also live out on the Hamptons very well. So Emilio, the Bengal Cat, and Alec Baldwin rub elbows with the worst of the worst Wall Street financiers. Wall Street financiers who are responsible for rust. They are responsible for rust. I'm going to go over the budget in a second. And they are also responsible for this $1.2 trillion transfer of wealth from the federal government to the richest 1%, otherwise known as the bipartisan infrastructure bill. What is so infuriating about people like Alec Baldwin is he presents himself as a friend, as an ally of the working class. But he is running a false flag operation. Like everyone who gets to his status, to, who has the kind of money that he has, the laws do not apply to Alec Baldwin. If they say you can't own Emilio, the Bengal cat in New York City, Alec Baldwin figures, I just punched a guy for a parking spot. I'm not doing time. I can own an illegal cat. I can guarantee you that if Travis Scott owned an illegal cat or punched somebody for a parking spot, he joined the ranks of all the other African-American rappers who are doing time. But the law doesn't apply to rich white men like Alec Baldwin. Uh, you know, can't own a cat, a Bengal cat in New York City. Doesn't apply to me, I'm Alec Baldwin. You're supposed to have a full-time armorer on your set. Uh, Alec Baldwin says, I know, but I've been making movies for decades. I know how to handle a prop gun. I don't need to attend those gun safety meetings or even make them mandatory for the rest of the crew. I got this. I got this. I know how to handle a gun, even though since 2003, there have been laws on sets. You are never to point a prop gun at yourself or anybody else on the set. He didn't attend the gun safety classes. They weren't mandatory. He forgot that you're not supposed to point a prop gun at the cinematographer. It was a combination, that, that killing was a combination of entitlement, arrogance, and of course, greed that killed. It was the greed the sense of entitlement, and of course the arrogance that 
that comes with entitlement. That's what killed Baldwin's cinematographer. Now, I know that you're thinking, why are you harping on Alec Baldwin? Isn't he going through enough? No, as a matter of fact, he's not. I want justice. I want justice. I like Alec Baldwin, but he messed up royally, and I want justice. I want the same justice that Travis Scott is going to face. I want the same justice for Alec Baldwin that Travis Scott is, is going to uh, receive because Alec Baldwin didn't just impersonate Donald Trump on, an, on SNL. Alec Baldwin didn't just impersonate Donald Trump on SNL. He impersonates Donald Trump in real life. Alec Baldwin puts himself out there. He exposes himself. He's an exhibitionist. And by doing that, he offers up a window into the ruling class. Nobody's asking Alec Baldwin to go on Instagram and opine about IATSE and Colin Powell before he shoots his cinematographer. Nobody is asking him to spin the murder of his cinematographer afterwards. And nobody asked him to buy a $3,000 designer cat, bring it up to Vermont, and then lose it, and then try to use his missing $3,000 designer cat as a, as a ploy for sympathy tough i know he's going i know he's going th through a horrible horrible time he should have the class to disappear but he's out front thinking that he can he can control this he's smart enough i can spin this well you've opened yourself up to who not just you and your wife are, but the entire ruling class that controls the Democratic Party because Alec Baldwin is the Democratic Party. He's the one throwing the fundraisers on the Hamptons that Chuck Schumer goes to. He is the Democratic Party. He is the Clintons, the Obamas. That's the Democratic Party because they, they have no shame. And so the Baldwins right now are spinning and preening on, on Instagram and presenting themselves uh, one way, lying to us. And while doing that, they pull the curtain back on who the rich and powerful truly are and who they truly are. They're grotesque. They are ugly. They are ugly. They are double dealers who are constantly marketing to us, tricking us into forking over cash for their movie tickets or what they're selling on Goop. We're supposed to you know, watch their shows or endorse their candidates. All the while marketing to us on social media all the while marketing on social media that they're conventional, that they're just like us. They're, they're conventional. They're not conventional. They're pocketing our money and wasting our time promoting causes that they themselves couldn't care less about. They only care about themselves and how they come across to others. That is what a sociopath does. They present Ted Bundy, Alec Baldwin, his wife, the Clintons, the Obamas. They are no different from Ted Bundy, although compared to the Clintons and the Obamas, I, I, I think Ted Bundy has less blood on his hands than the Clintons and the Obamas. They present as one of us. They are not. The hypocrisy is laughable. Uh, the Baldwin wife, she uh, constantly beseeches the paparazzi for privacy while constantly updating her Instagram. Please stop taking our picture. Meanwhile, she's 
marketing to her one million followers on Instagram with photographs because this is what the ruling elite does. They want to control the perception of who they are. The Baldwins don't want the paparazzi controlling the narrative. That's what social media is. It, it's, it's been built so the ruling class can control the narrative and they present their kids, the Baldwins pose with their kids after the murder and they show themselves living their best lives. They, we see their best selves out in the open. The faces of his kids, I think he has six, five or six kids. Those are supposed to be blurred out. I feel guilty bringing up the menagerie of kids, but they're not blurring out the faces of those children. Uh, I think there's something seriously diseased about anybody who uh, exploits their children that way. Those kids, like the gun Alec Baldwin fired, are props. I'm sure he, lo I know he loves his kids, how could he not? But they are props, just like uh, Bill and Hillary, Barack and Michelle, Joe and Jill, Donald and Melania, Mitch McConnell and Elaine Cho. They are, they are craven, and they do know they do not know right from wrong. They are in. They are where they are, because they are amoral, not immoral. Amoral. They do not know right from wrong. They could pass a lie detector test if you ask them, do you think your good outweighs your bad? They are gaslighting themselves, us, their children. They are amoral. They know, like Ted Bundy, they present compassion. They present compassion. They present themselves as inspirations and that we should mimic them while all the while they, they, they are nothing to be mimicked. You, 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 they are not role models. If anything, you, you should see how they act, the way they live their lives and do their opposite. When you spend $3,000 on a designer cat, that's wrong. Then to go to call the police because your $3,000 cat is missing, that's wrong. When you then present to the world your $3,000 cat, $3, cat who's gone missing, you're beyond redemption. Your, your lack of taste, your lack of mark, knowledge of how to market, you're, you're just stupid and craven, which is what Baldwin and the Clintons are. Mo normal people don't behave this way. Normal people know that if you spend $3,000 $3, on a cat, at the very least, you keep it to yourself. People say to me, why are you fixating on Baldwin? I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to go over the budget for Rust in a second. Baldwin is a whistleblower inadvertently a whistleblower and this killing and the trials to come, although I don't think we'll see the kind of trials we'll see with Drake and Travis Scott coming to us from Astro World. I think uh, Hollywood and Wall Street will circle the wagons uh, and protect the producers of Rust. They'll blame probably the, the guy Halls, the assistant DA, They'll, and they'll blame the armorer. But more importantly, they will blame the cinematographer. I guarantee you that someone will make this the cinematographer's fault. They will blame the dead woman. Mark my words, they will circle the wagons. There will be massive settlements that we don't know about. And in the end, a blue ribbon report will reveal that it is the cinematographer's fault for getting killed. This killing and the trials and the settlements that we will not 
find out enough about, they will lay bare how business is conducted, not just in Hollywood, but in America. It reveals right now what the rich and powerful, the people who present themselves as our liberal allies, Democrats, it will reveal what they really think of us. Now, the Hollywood report, get your uh, Get a pencil and a piece of paper and do the math with me. I apologize, but this involves math. The Hollywood Reporter got its hands on the budget for Russ. That's the movie where the cinematographer was shot to death. And it is everything I said it was two weeks ago, but worse. If you go back and listen to the show I did two weeks ago about Rust, everything I said was true but three times worse, worse. And, and I'm, I'll show you why it's three times worse because of the budget. Uh, the budget for Rust exposes the invention that people in charge are entitled to more money because they've risked their own money. Now, this is really important. I know I tend to ramble and go on and on and on. But if you take away anything from today, you will learn that anybody who says the rich are entitled to more money because they risk their own money, anybody who says that to you is lying, is lying. We're gonna go over the budget, which speaks truth to the lie that your boss, that the owner of your business that you work for is entitled to more money because he or she risked his own. Whenever the working class goes up against the rich, the rich say, you didn't risk anything to build this business. I did. That's a lie. They risked other people's money. For example, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. That is going to contractors. That money is going to AT&T. It's going, you know, for the broadband. It's going to all the, the uh, John Deere. It's going to the rental companies who rent, you know, these lifts. This is tax dollars being paid to corporations and and contractors, defense contractors, who also make tractors. This is federal money being t turned over to private enterprise so they don't have to risk their own money. Because the truth about American capitalism is the people in charge risk other people's money, like the government's money. They risk the government's money. People in charge, people like Bill Gates, people like Steve Jobs, risked other people's money and had nothing to lose. For example, Amazon, right? Amazon is a publicly traded stock. And it is not owned entirely by Jeff Bezos. He owns probably half of it but not all of it, because he didn't want to risk his own money when he started Amazon. So he went out and got investors, which means he didn't have to risk his own money. And he gets half the company because of what is called sweat equity, because Jeff Bezos came up with the idea for the company He's entitled to half the ownership, even though he didn't put any money into it. That's how the lawyers structure the corporation. So while he's building Amazon, Jeff Bezos is risking nothing. He's getting rich. He's getting rich. He's drawing a salary from the investment. He's not... Amazon didn't make profits for more than a decade. 
Amazon was losing money for at least a decade. And then when it did turn a profit, it was barely making anything. I think they had revenues of like $46 billion with like $20 million in profits, right? So that would you would assume that Jeff Bezos isn't making anything because he owns the company. Bullshit. He's drawing a salary off the investment. The angel investors put money into Amazon for a piece of it, and he's drawing a salary as the CEO. So he, he's entitled to half the, the profits when it becomes profitable, and he's drawing an amazing salary while it's unprofitable for a decade. He risked nothing. In fact, if Amazon had failed, and I'm going to get back to the rust, what, your head's going to explode when I tell you about what's inside the rust movie inside their budget your head is going to explode uh and just uh, just to warn everybody when i say get out the guillotines i'm talking about uh taxing these people into oblivion i am not advocating cutting off anybody's head but this is your uh they're cutting off my head my head is about to explode they might as well put me underneath a guillotine when I tell you what, when, it's unbelievable. If Amazon had failed, if Amazon went into the dust heap of history, uh, Bezos and his wife would have walked away with millions. They get a cut of the investment. When venture capital pumps millions of dollars into Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, these founders, right? Gates, Zuckerberg, uh, uh, Bezos, they get a huge salary off the top. They don't risk a penny. They make a lot of money. And that's why the budget for Rust, Alec, Alec Baldwin's passion project, is so illustrative of how capitalism in America is a figment of the worker, the worker's imagination. They have sold us. They've branded capitalism. It's a lie. It's a lie. They don't risk anything. The people at the top do not risk a penny. They are guaranteed millions every step of the way, even when, as is the case with Rust, it goes belly up. The producers of Rust, Alec was one of them. Get your pad and pencil out. Alec Baldwin was one of the producers. His greed, their greed and disregard for unions and working people is incalculable. I'm going to crunch the numbers here. And again, it's it's the guillot It's time for the guillotines, not, you know, with with our tax code. Uh, we have to tax these people into oblivion. I'm now going to explain the financing on Rust, which is a window to the financing for every startup in America. The financing for Rust, the movie, is no different from the financing of every new company in America. This isn't just Hollywood. It is America's iteration of big business. So pencils and paper out. As I said two weeks ago, and I don't mean to blow my own horn, uh, but I'm going to blow my own horn and swallow what comes out because I got it completely right. I got it completely right, but it's three times as worse. So I said two weeks ago, Alec Baldwin got a, a piece of the investment. They always talk about, you know, I'm going to sacrifice my salary for a piece of the back end. He has a piece of the back end on Russ, the, you know, the, the, the profits, but he's got a piece of the front end. Before anybody shows up to work, he's getting a piece of the investment, right? I didn't realize how much. It's insane. Uh, the shooting budget, this is the Hollywood Reporter came out with this. And this is the second budget, the shooting budget. There's a pre-production budget that we haven't seen. 
the shooting budget for Rust was a little more than $7 million. Now, there are other, they call them tranches. Uh, there's the pre-production budget, which we haven't seen yet. We probably won't see it. It will remain sealed. Even when it goes to trial, it'll remain sealed. There's the pre-production tranche. Then there's the production tranche. That's the $7 million tranche. And then there's the post-production tranche. That's the editing. And then there's the advertising tranche. I'll get to all that later. And every step of the way, Alec Baldwin and the producers are skimming off the top of each tranche. So the production budget, $7 million to go shoot the movie. Not the pre-production, not the post-production, not the advertising and promotion budget, just the production, $7 million, goes into shooting the uh, movie. There'll be another investment later to hire editors and you have to screen the movie and test it. That'll be another $7 million for po post-production. It has to be $7 million because th this is all about money laundering and tax breaks. They have to pump up the costs of the post-production the same way they pump up the costs of production because they need to show profits and losses. They're moving money through this LLC. People will invest $7 million into post-production for Russ the same way they invested $7 million for production, no questions asked, because they need to clean drug money, whatever. The producers are going to get another $7 million. They're cleaning up money. They're, they're, it's a tax haven. They're getting tax breaks by showing a loss, by showing a profit, but it's in New Mexico and, and it's being shipped to uh, an offshore account in the Cayman Islands. And there's something in the tax code that means the federal government owes you money. If you, if I guarantee you that someone is investing in Rust and they take they put a million dollars into Rust, and then Rust transfers the one million to the Cayman Islands, and because of that transfer, somehow the federal government pays the producer an additional a million dollars in, in a tax rebate. If you think I'm kidding, Jeff Bezos, the richest man in America, there were a couple of years where he paid zero taxes. How do you do that? We've talked about this. We've talked about this. So you want the budget to be as big as possible because this has nothing to do with making a movie. This is about moving money around. So uh, while all this is going on, you have six producers plus Alec Baldwin, and they're putting a, a doughy face, a pretty face to all this, making it look legitimate. And because they're making it look legitimate, the producers get 10% off the top of each tranche of the investment. 10%. That seems fair. I mean, you know, that's what an agent gets. Why shouldn't the producers get 10% for fronting this tax scam slash money laundering operation? So that's the $7 million production budget. Then once this hardened dingleberry is finished being shot, uh, then they have to edit, edit it. That's another seven million. Maybe it's 10 million. Uh, they need to then spend money taking it to the festivals. And that's a whole new budget for advertising. And the producers will need another seven million for that, of which they take another seven percent. And don't forget every step of the way other you know forget the 10 percent off the top of the investment they are also charging the company for services that are never provided they are they are busting out the movie it's a bust out seven million dollars for production for a three-week shoot of rust are you kidding me Who's making the money? It costs $7 million. Where's that money going? It's not going to the crew. 
It's not going uh, for film stock. Where's it going? It's being stolen. So here's the math. On the first $7 million for production, actually, that's the second $7 million. There was probably another $7 million for pre-production. The producers got 10%. And if you look at, at the Hollywood Reporter's breakdown of the budget, $750,000 was set aside for the producers off the top. Just, they went in there, the producers all got the total of $750,000 that was uh, split by about six people. So there was no risk for the producers whatsoever. They'll say when they're negotiating, they'll say, we only get the back end. We're risking our money. They're not risking their money. They're risking drug money. They're risking dirty money. And they're skimming 10% off the top up front. Uh, Baldwin, according to The Hollywood Reporter, according to the budget, he got $100,000 as a producer from this tranche, from, from the production budget. There will be there was a pre-production budget, there's gonna be a post-production budget, and then there's gonna be a budget for promotion. So off the production budget, he got $100,000 as a producer. The other 600,000 was split among the six other producers for less than a month work. He gets $100,000. Then he earns $150,000 as the lead actor from this budget from the production budget, but he also wrote the movie and we don't know what he got for that. Uh, this is, uh, he probably got, uh, I don't know, 700, I don't know what they paid him up front from the first budget pre-production to write the movie. We don't know yet. This little so-called passion project, this little independent movie that he just has to make. Uh, You know, I'm, I'm going to guess, not knowing anything, that Baldwin thinks in big round numbers. I, I'm going to guess by the time he showed up on the set, he already had a million dollars in his checking account from the producing, from the uh, acting and from the writing he got before the movie even went into production. And... Uh, the way this plays out is Alec sits in the Hamptons with sycophantic lawyers and accountants all competing to show off for him how much money they can make for Alec Baldwin for as little work as possible. That's part of the game they get off on. And no risk whatsoever. In fact, and this is in the budget, there's a $300,000 contingency fee. I looked that up. What does a $300,000 contingency fee mean? It means that the producers split $300,000 if for some reason production is shut down and the movie never gets made. Like if there's a shooting, if a killing, and you know, you have to cut production, just shut it down. The producers split $300,000 among themselves from that $7 million budget. There's a $300,000 kill fee. There's no risk whatsoever. $300,000 for a kill fee, but no money for a full-time armorer to make sure Alec Baldwin doesn't kill somebody. Alec Baldwin got all his money up front and baked into that contract is that 350 is it 300 I, I can't tell either it's either 350 it's 350 i'm sorry it's a 350 thousand dollar contingency fee split six ways they all got 60 grand for destroying the movie for shutting it down when alec killed his cinematographer he he automatically got a, a $60,000 kill fee. Uh, meanwhile, the 24-year-old armorer working 12 to 14 hours a day for a month, seven days a week, got eight grand total. Plus, she had to do more than just be the armorer. 
which is why she wasn't on the set when Baldwin killed the cinematographer. Now, the only reason we know all this, and I'm not, you know, I'm not fixating on Alec Baldwin. There, this is a window into the, the lie of capitalism. This isn't capitalism. This is theft. This is mob shit. This is really mafia shit. The only reason we know this is because Alec Baldwin killed the cinematographer. Those guns were going off days earlier. Had the guns that went off days earlier killed somebody and it wasn't Alec Baldwin, we wouldn't know anything about this. The movie would still be getting, pun intended, shot. They would still be shooting this movie if, if the cinematographer died on the set, but it wasn't Alec Baldwin who fired the shot. We, we, you know, they would cover this up had the, the person who fired the, the kill shot been a crew member. And we wouldn't know about the budget. We wouldn't know about this if one of the crew members fell asleep driving home from the set of Rust and hurtled into a van carrying a family of six and killing everybody. We wouldn't know about this. We would know that an accident happened, but we wouldn't know the accident happened because the producers reneged on their promise of providing hotels near the set and not 50 miles away. See, IATSE, the union, had been promised hotels near the set because it's exhausting to work a 12 to 14 hour day, especially if you have to get up and drive 50 miles to the set and then drive home 50 miles. They had been promised in the contract, a hotel near the set. But when they arrived, the producer said the money wasn't in the budget. The money, our hands are tied. The money isn't in the budget. So the crew had to drive 50 miles each way to stay at a crappy hotel in Albuquerque. No money in the budget to keep the workers safe, to keep them from falling asleep on the road and killing people. But when Alec Baldwin shoots his cinematographer to death, there's, there's $350,000 for, for the producers. That's, that's the fee they get because the project has been killed. The mafia calls something like this a bust out, and it really is. It really is a mafia bust out. And most businesses in America go bankrupt, they go belly up, because most of them are bust outs for the for the these mobsters, you raise $7 million, and then you run all your expenses through this fictitious LLC called Rust Movie Productions, LLC, Rust Movie Productions, LLC, there's, it's, it's a figment of your imagination. They set up this company in September. It's been around for three months and it's going to disappear and it's going to have no money. They're just running money through it. It's literally a shell operation. And the way you bust it out, the way you seven million dollars for production on that movie, where was that money being spent? Well, the producers were buying things that can be passed off as necessary for the production of the movie, charge it to the movie, but keep it for yourself. How many bottles of expensive wine? How many antique watches? How many pieces of 19th century antique art were purchased using that $7 million, claiming it was for this period piece even though it never made it to, Al to, to New Mexico. It was shipped directly to the producer's home or Alec Baldwin's home up in the Hamptons. We'll never know the gifts that were paid to the producers and to Alec Baldwin. We'll never know those gifts that came out of the $7 million budget. We know Producers of The Wolf of Wall Street gave Leonardo DiCaprio a 3.2 million Pablo Picasso 
and a nine million Jean Michel Basquiat, as well as Marlon Brando's Oscar statuette. And then Leonardo DiCaprio was forced to turn all those gifts over to the federal government because it turns out the producers of The Wolf of Wall Street got caught running a money laundering operation. Google it. The Wolf, the Wolf of Wall Street, fun movie, was a money laundering operation. How appropriate about a huckster on Wall Street. The movie turned out to be a money laundering operation. And Martin Scorsese's the director, and he plays it innocent. I'm, I'm just a director. I'm an artist. How could I, Martin Scorsese, spot a money laundering operation? Look at my entire body of work. Where would you get the idea that I, Martin Scorsese, would ever concern himself with mobsters laundering money? I mean, sure, I directed Goodfellas, and there was that scene where Pauly takes over the restaurant he becomes a partner because Joe Pesci can't behave and Pauly uses the restaurant to bust it out, to order liquor that goes in one door and out the other. He racks up debt until the restaurant goes bust. It goes out of business. But that's a, res that's a restaurant uh, in a movie, but it's not a movie, yes. Movies are bust-outs. They are mafia bust-outs. They are identical. These movies are the restaurants in Goodfellas or the sporting goods store that Davey ends up turning over to Tony Soprano because he got into the executive poker game and he's a compulsive, degenerate gambler. So he lost everything and Tony took over his sporting goods store and they busted it out, right? Watch that, I think it's in the third season. They start ordering airline tickets, putting things on the uh, sporting goods uh, credit that they have no intention of paying back. And Russ Movie LLC, that's that's a manufactured bust out. You run liquor through it. You run airline tickets. You run trips to France, first class trips through this. And then it shuts down after the shooting and it never shows a profit. Alec Baldwin, I guarantee you, was guaranteed a million in his pocket the day he showed up on the set. But the IATSE crew, they couldn't get paid. They could not get paid. So they walked off. They walked off. They, uh, and the police escorted them off. The day Alec Baldwin murdered, shot accidentally, he didn't do it on purpose, shot the cinematographer, the police were called in to escort the IATSE crew workers off the set, even though they were just peacefully disassembling their equipment, the police were called in to escort them off the set, even though they were owed money. They couldn't get paid. New reporting on this, and it's really important to follow this because it's a window into how business is done in America. The crew is telling The Hollywood Reporter and The Los Angeles Times that they couldn't get paid there was reportedly paperwork problems. How familiar are we all with paperwork problems? Anybody who does temp work knows this game, this hamster wheel. And it's how the producers on Rust float money. And this is what the Los Angeles Times was told about what was going on on the set of Rust. The workers, the, the crew, the below the line, the, the saps, the people who actually make the movie, they, uh, they're asked to fill out a stack of paperwork when they show up. 
bring your passport, bring two IDs that prove you're an American citizen. And that, you know, that takes an hour to fill out all that paperwork. Then the producers conveniently lose the paperwork. How many times has this happened to you? How many times has this happened to me? They lose the paperwork, they claim, but they don't tell you they lost the paperwork. They don't call you and say, hey, we lost the paperwork. They wait until you say, hey, I've been here two weeks. I've been here three weeks. I haven't been paid. And then they say, let me look into it. And they come back and say, oh, you know what? You need to fill out the paperwork again. This, this was, was going on on the set of Rust. The old, oh, you need to fill out the paperwork again. Sometimes they'll say, it's your fault, right? Most of the time, they, they're magnanimous and they say, we, we gave you the wrong paperwork. And then, while that money is floated, sitting in the bank, collecting interest, you're forced to wait another two weeks to get paid as you fill out the paperwork. If you're lucky, they don't make you fill out further documents. We've all been through this. And the accountants, the people who, you know, the associate producers, they watch you to see how angry you get. Because the angrier you get, the happier they are. Because this is also about the sadistic thrill that comes from power and exploitation. It's the heady high that comes with getting something over on someone. You're not like this, but there are people who are. That is the creative joy that accountants and lawyers get and producers get. They, the joy they have is watching you squirm. They enjoy it. They do. I know it's hard to believe, but they do. They like the idea that you're not getting paid and they have that power over you. It's not, a, it's not only about greed. It's also about sadism. Like Emilio the cat who, you know, hunts for sport. Humans hunt for sport. They're enjoying watching you go down, watching you get angrier because they hate themselves and they hate the people they work for. And so they take it out on the people who desperately need to get paid, the crew. They take it out on the crew. They kick down, they kiss up, kick down. So yes, it's about money, but it's also about the cruelty. They are mobsters. Most of the people in charge of these corporations, which are money laundering operations, they have a mobster mentality. And mobsters become mobsters not just because they want money. They become mobsters because they enjoy the thrill of hurting somebody. They're in it to either X somebody out or break some knuckles. You're behind on your payment? I Please, I can't wait. Let me go crack his knuckles. You all know people like this. They wear suits. They put on cologne. They are mobsters. Alec Baldwin is a very cruel man, but he's also very smart. So while he punches someone because that person is in his parking spot, he's smart enough to know that's wrong. He's smart enough to also lie to himself and do things that convinces him and the people around him that his heart is really in the right place. So he can't wait to support liberal causes because when you support and speak out for liberal causes, that convinces 
himself and everyone around him that he's not a sadist. But I can assure you, Alec Baldwin is a sadist. I can assure you that he is a sadist. And he's terrified. He, see, he's very smart. And because he's an actor and a pretty good one, he's in touch with his emotions and he sees his sadistic side. That's his job to identify his emotions. And he doesn't like what he sees. So he works very hard to, to, to try not to come across as a sadist, but he is a sadist. On a very visceral level, when Alec Baldwin showed up on the set with a million dollars already in his pocket, on a visceral level, when he was tapping into his emotions to act, he knew that he was delighting on a visceral level that he is surrounded by people who are getting financially screwed while he has a million dollars in his pocket. He identifies it because he convinces himself he's exploring his senses to get to the character. But he knows he's delighting in the fact that the people around him haven't been paid yet. And uh, if you were to go up to Alec, because he's he will present as one of us. So if somebody had the temerity on the crew, somebody had the temerity to walk up to Alec and say, hey, man, uh, I haven't gotten paid yet. He would be apologetic. He would go, those effing producers, this, I hate this system. And because he's a great actor, Method, he will tap into that period in his teens when he was working at the ice cream store and got screwed by the guy who ran it. He'll actually believe Watch his Instagram when he comes out in favor of uh, IATSE two days before he uh, shot the cinematographer the same day he screwed IATSE. When he's saying, I support IATSE, he's tapping into that part of him that believes this shit. He's lying to himself and to the people. I'll look into it, but he won't because he doesn't care because he has the money and he doesn't want you to have it. And meanwhile, on the set of Rust, those producers, Google them. They're despicable. They're the children of bankers. They're despicable. The producers sit around doing nothing. They're, they're staying at the best hotels, dining at the finest restaurants. And they're sitting on the set in their director's chairs with their names on it and they're face down in their, you know, uh, iPhone 13 playing Candy Crush. Trust me on this. They're playing Candy Crush because they're craven, no talent morons cashing a check by risking somebody else's filthy money. And Alec Baldwin is 63, so he's smart enough to, to play these producers. And he plays them by making them feel that they're actually part of the creative process. He plays them. He plays them so they'll want to raise more money for a future bust out, for a future money laundering scheme that he can call a passion project and walk away with, at the very least, a million dollars. They'll look up from their candy crush, one of them, one of these idiots, uh, will say, you know, Alec, uh, you should look to your left when you say that. And Alec knows how to play them. He'll say, wow, that is such a brilliant note. So good. So good. I've been doing acting for, for 40 years. That's a brilliant note. So brilliant. And the producer will be happy. He'll think he's creative. And, and he, he'll think he's more than just a money launderer. And uh, they'll, uh, the producers will be happy. Everybody's happy. Alex happy. Everybody's happy except the crew or the people who pay $15 to sit through rust, this fetid, trichinella infested viral gastroenteritis that Alec Baldwin tries to pass off as a morality 
Western. Why am I picking on Alec Baldwin? Because, as I said, his killing of the cinematographer rips the sunny liberal mask off America's diseased brand of capitalism. If Alec Baldwin and his wife choose to live their lives and their children's lives out in the open, if they choose to brand themselves as ordinary people with ordinary struggles, when Alec Baldwin brands himself as a friend of labor and goes on Instagram two nights before he throws the IATSE workers off the set to say, you know, goes on Instagram two nights before and says, I support IATSE's right to strike, then I will use Alec Baldwin, the budget for Rust and him as a window into the psyche of the ruling class. Alec Baldwin, and I do feel sorry for him, uh, he is a very sick man. He was sick before he fired that shot, and he's going to be even sicker afterwards. And I feel sorry for him, not as much as I do for the cinematographer's son and the widower, but Alec Baldwin brought this on himself by propping up a system that divides the world into two. People you can use and myself. That's who Alec Baldwin is. He divides the world into two. Those I can use and myself. Those who get served and those who serve. He is to be served. People around him serve him. He was using everybody, including the producers, who were also using everybody. The crew, though, the people who actually make the movie, like the cinematographer who ended up dead, because they want to make a movie, not a killing, they end up getting killed. The crew was being exploited. The Los Angeles Times is now reporting that crew members were promised a hotel near the set, right? And they were, instead, the contract was the agreement. It's a Hollywood agreement, doesn't matter. Uh, they were instead given a hotel 50 miles away. And when the crew complained, the producers made t-shirts. They made t-shirts mocking the crew members for whining about not getting their hotels, right? They treated that promise that they had made to the crew as a joke. Look it up in the Los Angeles Times. There was no money for hotels, but the production staff found the money to make custom black long sleeve t-shirts that read, and I quote, error 404, that's an internet term for an error, housing not found. And then they spent the extra money for printing on the sleeve for it to say Albuquerque is an hour away. They printed that on the sleeve. Think about the sadism, the mockery of the working man. We, we promise you a hotel near the set, and then when you complain, you say it's not in the budget, which is a lie. And then when you complain, they have the money to make a T-shirt to give out to the rest of the crew to make fun of the crew for not getting their hotels. Think about the kind of mind, the sadism, the contempt for humanity that it takes to go and make that T-shirt and how out of touch you are. It's almost as though you would go buy a $3,000 cat and then ask for sympathy when Emilio, your $3,000 cat, goes missing. It's the arrogance, it's the entitlement, it's the contempt for everybody, including yourself, to make a t-shirt that mocks the crew for wanting a hotel near the set, the, the hotel that was promised to you. This is evil. This is America's iteration of capitalism.
I was promised a hotel room so I wouldn't kill myself driving home after a 14-hour workday, and all I got was a lousy t-shirt making fun of me. So what if you promised the crew hotel rooms? We changed our minds. So what if Bengal cats are outlawed in New York City? I'm going to spend $3,000 on one anyway. The laws, the basic laws of human decency, don't apply to the ruling class. One day I'll say I support IATSE on my Instagram feed. The next day I'll watch as they're thrown off the set by the police. I'll narrate a PETA video telling people to boycott circuses because of how they abuse elephants. That's what Alec Baldwin does. He narrates uh, a, a video for PETA telling us to boycott circuses because they abuse elephants. But I'll, I'll spend $3,000 on a designer cat that is outlawed in the city I live. PETA doesn't know until now that their spokesman spent $3,000 uh, on, a, uh, on a designer cat. Alec Baldwin will write a piece for CNN entitled The Path to a Better Planet. He writes, here's a fact. Human activity is fundamentally altering the planet. We are causing what scientists call the sixth great extinction, erasing countless species from the face of the planet. What are you talking about? Humans or your cat? Emilio, then he writes, I love this, we are without much or not nearly enough introspection destroying the planet. Introspection. Alec Baldwin is telling us we lack introspection and we're destroying the planet. He has seven kids and counting. He drives a, a Cadillac, a tank throughout Vermont. He has a power boat and he made his crew members drive 100 miles a day instead of springing for a hotel. We are causing the sixth great extinction. No, you're causing the great, the sixth great extinction, Alec Baldwin. We, without much or not nearly enough introspection, are destroying the planet. No, you're destroying the planet. How many private jets, Alec, on his Instagram, he, you know, his support of IATSE, uh, he talks about, when he's not praising the life of Colin Powell, Alec is uh, talking about how he supports IATSE and he hates how Hollywood has been taken over by the marketers. He says everybody who runs Hollywood is a marketer while he's marketing bullshit to you. He claims to hate the bankers. And that, go watch his Instagram video, Two Nights Before He Kills the Cinematographer. He talks about how he hates the, the bean counters, the bankers. Meanwhile, he's doing commercials for Capital One. How many millions did Alec Baldwin make doing commercials for Capital One, which offers poor people $300 that they don't have at 27%, at 27% interest, biblically usurious rates. He's the face of Capital One and the face of the Democratic Party. He's the one doing all the fundraisers on the Hamptons for the Democratic Party. According to the New Republic, Capital One collects $23 billion in interest per year. $23 billion in interest. What is that? Like, at, you know, 30% interest rates? An average that works out to $181 from every family in America, but it's not every family in America. The Federal Reserve says most of that money is paid by people who are poor at 30% interest rates, Alec. You know who uses Capital One? Poor people to pay for a crown on their teeth. Poor people who can't afford to get their teeth fixed, their kids' teeth fixed. There's huge money. I was reading the Wall Street Journal. There was huge money in poor people putting their medical expenses, especially their dental expenses, on a credit card and then paying 30% interest. But Alec Baldwin is the face of Capital One, and he's supposed to be the liberal Democrat, earning millions off the suffering of the poor. 
because of Capital One. Kind of reminds me of Joe Biden, uh, the senator from the great state of credit card country, Delaware. But he's going to lecture us about liberal values. He's going to lecture us about climate change and Donald Trump. Capital One is evil. They run uh, about 80,000 experiments a year trying to figure out, they hire physicists to help them figure out that perfect combination of payment options, interest rates, and uh, you know prizes to keep poor people in a permanent cycle of debt. Their business model is debt keeping poor people in debt. They don't want poor people to pay off their debt because at 30% interest a year, why would they want poor people to pay off their debt? Why would they want Medicare for all? Why would the credit card companies want the government paying for your dental when they're making $26 billion a year off poor people who have to put it on their credit cards and stay in a permanent state of debt. That's Capital One. And that's who Alec Baldwin and Joe Biden is the face of. And that's why we lose. That's why we lose. That's why the Democrats are not trusted because we got Alec Baldwin fronting for us. And, you know, if Alec Baldwin, if his Twitter account were still alive, right now he'd be the person celebrating Nancy Pelosi and Biden for passing that big infrastructure bill. He'd be saying it's huge. One third of American bridges might collapse in the next 10 years if we don't do anything. According uh, to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we need to spend an additional $2.6 trillion on roads, bridges, and tunnels in the next decade to keep the tunnels and the bridges from collapsing. This infrastructure bill that these neoliberal hacks like Pelosi, Biden, and Baldwin are celebrating as a win, it's a lie. It's not $1.2 trillion. It's only $550 billion in additional spending. The other half, more than half, was already earmarked for infrastructure. It's what we normally spend on infrastructure. They've only added $550 billion to infrastructure. And it's going to add to the budget deficit. We have to spend two more weeks to have the Congressional Budget Office score Build back, better, build back better, right, to the social safety net bill. We want to find out if we can pay for it. But the bipartisan infrastructure bill is going to create a, is going to add $250 billion more to the budget deficit. But Manchin and the GOP, they call it fiscally sound. Why? Because all that debt, all that money is going to contractors who will overcharge and underpay. It's not going to the workers, it's going to the contractors. It's a transfer of tax dollars to the wealthiest 1%. So of course, that infrastructure bill can add $250 billion to the budget deficit. They don't care. That money is going to Manchin's friends. It's a transfer of tax dollars to the wealthiest 1%. I'm a, uh, is, is Cyrus here? Because I just want to say, I, I'm rambling here, but I... Cyrus here? Oh, we okay. haven't seen him yet. Okay, so let me just, sorry, I'm running along here. Uh, uh, according to The Economist, infrastructure, the kind that this bill, Friday's bill, is, it's notoriously padded. Uh, it's going to cost 25% more. Infrastructure, when you build bridges, when you build tunnels, they are notorious for overcharging by 25%. The big dig in Boston, and there's all this foreign bribery. I watched the San Francisco Bay Bridge get rebuilt about eight years ago. They were going, they were, they were using federal money, California money, and they were buying cheap cement from China, and, and the bridge kept falling apart and cracking because those contractors wanted to 
overcharge and underpay. And, and what about uh, the guarantee of using environmentally safe cement? Cement accounts for 8% of greenhouse gases. There are carbon neutral ways to make cement. I don't see that in this 1.2 infrastructure bill. There's, there's actually some can take CO2 out of the environment. They're not using that. So let's all do a victory lap for, for this infrastructure bill. A victory lap for what? For, for breathing? For doing what every other country on the planet has already done and what we should have done? Yeah, let's give Washington credit for doing what it should have done 20 years ago. It's like when your landlord finally fixes the faucet after 10 years, and now you can take a shower instead of a bath, and, and you're supposed to be grateful. We have crumbling bridges and roads. Our tap water is poison. And now Pelosi and Biden have finally gotten around to addressing some of it, and they want a cookie. Oh, thank you. The Democratic Party flushes the toilet and thinks they deserve a parade. All right, you're listening to the David Feldman Show. Yes, there are good things in, the, in that 1.2, that, that $550 billion infrastructure bill. Yes, there are good things in it, but it's 20 years too late. Uh, I have more to go. I'll have to talk about this later on in the show. You are listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. And office hours every Friday night. Dan in the newsroom? Is Cyrus here yet? Okay. Why don't we do this? Yes. Oh, you are there. Yes. I, I apologize. Let me do this. Let me load some more snark. We're loading snark. Let's take a 90 second break and then we will come back with screenwriter Dave Cyrus. It's time right now for the David Feldman show. He's talking politics a comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome back. You're listening to the David Feldman Show. Where, what am I doing here? Did I do it right? I think so. Uh, joining us from Brooklyn. Are you in Brooklyn? Sure. sure. You're probably off in Hollywood. I bet. No. He is. Uh, just got nominated for an Emmy for his work on Saturday Night Live. He wrote the movie The King of Staten Island, which everybody 
should go watch. They love it. And he's also a roast battle champion. Please say hello to our friend, Dave Cyrus. Hello. Hey, how we doing? We're doing great. We're, I'm feeling great. I'm actually getting some sleep. I'm I, I, just, I, I don't know words. if you watched the first 90 minutes of the show, but I took a very long nap during the first Yes. Night. Yes, I, I caught a few seconds of it, and I feel like I, I know everything you said. Right. Yeah. So how are you? I don't know. Travis Scott, let's talk about Astro World for yeah, a second. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, if you were white, mm -hmm. the lawsuits, it would be different, wouldn't it? I honestly don't know. I, what I do know is that there, Travis Scott was the organizer of this event, right? Yeah. He created the event. So he was he was the creator of the event. He was the person on stage when it happened. The buck does kind of stop with him, doesn't it? And I don't know what you're referring to in terms of what of the racism in the lawsuits, because I don't know what the specifics of the lawsuits are. I can tell you this. The one that there is a lot of responsibility here for the people who were organizing this, the people who were responsible for security and safety. However, there is also a very disingenuous bent to when people start trying to say, and it's, it's amazing to even hear these words say out loud in this year, that the lyrics are what the problem was mm. and that they start parsing through old songs of his saying, well, these lyrics are violent. And right. it's like, if you really believe that this kind of violence happens because of the substance of the material being sung, you are either a liar or have no idea what you're talking about. They right. did the exact same thing at Woodstock 99. They said that, well, you know, clearly the reason there was violence and sexual assault at this is because Megadeth has has lyrics that say peace really? sells, but who's buying? Is and, that what happened? Yeah. There were a lot of people who tried to claim it. There's a new documentary that just came out where they have these 20 something year old music journalists just basically saying that the, the late 90s were an evil time and people who liked music then were bad people. And that's why people got hurt at Woodstock, not because the organizers were dangerously corrupt and incompetent and right. did not provide security, did not provide right. water, tried to s literally squeeze these people for more money than they could get by saying, well, you're, you'll die of starvation and thirst if you don't pay as much as we're hiking the money up for the for the for the water from five to fifteen dollars. Right. No, no. It's because Limp Biscuit yells. And right. that's what's so disgusting about this. Any event, any event with this many people will have dead bodies if you're not responsible. I'm sorry. You know, wasn't just didn't just as many people almost die in Israel a few months ago at a giant faith rally? Was there something wrong Travis with Scott was playing Israel? No. Yeah. Oh. But no, there was a giant uh, event of all Orthodox Jews where oh, right, people right, died right, right. because yeah. of a crush of the crowd, because it has nothing to do with what's on stage. When 50,000 people are in one place and you don't listen to the organizers who say you need lines, you need aisles, you need security to have access to everyone, th bad things happen. Coachella is not known for having angry violent lyrics in the musicians, but people still get hurt there because men, by the way, just on the, on the side, away from the crushing, just the sexual assaults of Woodstock, I don't trust men of any music uh, liking. I don't, li I don't trust men who like any kind of music. If you put them in the wrong situation, you have to expect them to do something horrible because men are horrible. And you need to treat us like animals and not allow us to do these things because there's only so much we can force each other to behave, to, to act like human beings. A lot of men out there are just truly monsters. And when you put them in a sea of people and they can cl clearly see that no security is going to get to them, bad things can happen. And right. it is. So they really have to change. They have to change. They don't have to change. They have to no, do no, what no, the no, other venues are doing. Focus. No, no, hang on for a second. I'm saying they're going to they have to change the focus. And it, it, the same thing with rust. The conversation immediately turned to gun safety when gun safety on movie sets is not an issue. It never it's happens. Not, it's, not. it's been it's 30, 30 years since years. this happened with rust. Right. Yeah. And this was about two things. Number one, 
that you can't let low budget movies cut these corners because people die. But number two, someone essentially is, is guilty of at very least manslaughter. Because someone, be put, someone put a live someone put a live bullet in a bunch of dummy bullets and Alec Baldwin is not qualified to look at a dummy bullet and know it's a dummy and not a live bullet. That He's wasn't his. qualified to sit in on the gun safety class. No, no, he was, a, he was a producer. So he is responsible in that sense because he is a producer. And every producer in that movie is somewhat responsible for what happened. But you're never supposed to point a gun, gun safety laws. You don't point a, a prop gun at anybody on a set. I know, but the but director of photography Alec wanted... Well, yeah, but he wasn't the one saying, I want it down the barrel shot. Someone told him, we need you to point this way to get it down the barrel shot. And so I, they will blame the cinematographer. They will blame, they, they will, I guarantee a you. A lot of people are guilty here. No, but they will blame the cinematographer for telling Alec Baldwin to point the gun at her. And they will blame the victim. That's how it works in America. Okay, David, 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 hold on a second. If the director of photography. Hello? Hold point the gun at the did. And he shot that gun and killed someone who wasn't the de director of photography. Would that mean that she wasn't responsible? Hey, 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 is up. the director of this movie not responsible at all because he, he got up. shot? Is the director of this movie le okay? Is the director of this movie less responsible because he got shot? No, no I'm talking about how this is going to no, work. Answer the question: Is the director less responsible for what happened on that set because he was the person who got shot and lived? He's responsible because he I would right. assume that he he knows guns, what the protocol is as the director. Right. He uh, what I'm saying know. is that if this director of photography had not been killed, she would be one of the people who would be held responsible for this if it was someone else who got killed. The if she was the person, if she was if if she was the person who made the decision that he had to point the gun down the barrel in order to see down the barrel. So, you know, you you would she should have been overruled. These are all young inexperienced tier one crew yeah. members and everyone who was in a position to overrule that is partially responsible here right but they will blame the cinematographer well i think that it, if she, if they can if the other people there said she was the one who made the decision that you of where the gun was pointed then it does mean that it's a little bit less of the person who pointed the gun's responsibility of what of doing that and a little bit less of their mistake Everyone, look, a lot of people here are responsible, but I do think that it's not about, you're right, it's not about gun safety. When something hasn't happened in 30 something years or 30 years, it doesn't sound like this is an epidemic, but it's still something that has to be very seriously uh, looked into. But we, we can still talk about, you know, Travis Scott. Uh, that yeah, let's talk about because Scott. Now he is paying for the paying the funeral expenses for everybody who died at the Astro World Stampede refunds he's re refunding the tickets it's obviously not premeditated oh, he's good. a performer he was doing business with live nation the, but the lawsuits ben crump is suing him they're they're claiming that the tragedy was preventable obviously and i guess there have been a history of injuries at his performances really how many um, yeah, I think that there is a, yeah, in that sense, absolutely. I, I, I'm not going to say that it wouldn't happen if he was, you know, Kid Rock. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't know. Maybe it would be easier. Maybe it's going to be easier to get people to believe that he's responsible because he's black and racism. But I will say that, you know, I go to a lot of concerts. I've been to a lot of very small shows and, and, and festivals as well. People get hurt. It's mosh pits are a place to get punched in the face. And that's why you have that. I'm saying everyone who goes in these concerts, the very idea of saying, you know, you should have you should have not gotten as excited on stage because people were wanted to see you is ridiculous. And people are kind of making that arg that argument. They're saying that Drake is partially responsible for this, you know, with things he said. It's like, look, Drake is not exactly the most aggressive singer. So let's not like I think that this idea that the music was bad and that's why people do this is this this happens at religious festivals. This can right. happen anywhere with this many people. And what's going to happen now is you're going to see more strict protocols, probably, of how crowds this size can be controlled. I mean, Coachella you, does a lot of things that they learn from Woodstock that prevent dehydration, uh, prevent the ability, you know, prevent it to be impossible for an ambulance to make it to a, a body 
in the middle of a mosh pit or in the middle of a crowd. You know, I've, I've been to Lollapalooza. I've been to Warp Tour. I've been to a bunch of these things. You know, when you're in the middle of that sea of people, you do get the impression that if something happens, no one's going to do anything and there's, and no one's going to be able to help you. And yeah. now, you're a live I, performer. You've, yeah. you've been on shows with me. My shows are very sexually charged. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. the, a fevered pitch of testosterone. Yeah, but no one dies women, because women are throwing their panties at you, David. No, no, it's I'm different. throwing my panties at the women. Yeah. That's what I do. I throw my panties at the women and it excites the crowd. And uh, I wear six pairs of panties before I step on stage. You're a performer. Well, you're a performer. Performer. So and does I Ozzy. So my panties see. at the crowd. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. I just think it's so puritanically ridiculous. Most of them are clean, by the way. Good. I'm glad. Well, the, the ones on the outside, sure. Yeah. Just, I mean, the very idea that we're going to look at, you know, that that's people always do. They, they try to blame. They're going to try to blame him because that's how you get money. Because if you say that it's gross negligence, that's where you get your real cash. And I don't know that that's the truth, but Travis Scott, unfortunately, was not just the person on stage. He's the person who ran this festival. So he is right. he is he is very responsible in many ways. But I don't know that there's any evidence that this was any different than any other major festival. Just sometimes things happen. Right. Um, now you don't uh, listen. I, it's a tragedy. Uh, and. Travis Scott, I, I don't know the whole story. I just know that he didn't, that was not his, the, the, that was not on his set list. No, no, I, I, I'm sure he's devastated by this. Yes. And I don't have any reason to believe that Travis Scott cut any corners that other major festivals did, unless that evidence comes out. You know, I think we have this, we have this need and you know, it's, it's called proportionality bias, I believe, where people cannot accept that horrible things can happen by coincidence and accident. They need to blame people. It's exactly why people saw COVID and needed to believe that billionaires were conspiring to do this and governments were doing this on purpose because they, they, they are terrified to live in a world of chaos where a little coincidence, where a butterfly can cause a chain reaction that kills a million people. Right. That's too, it's so much easier for them to live in a world of supervillains. And I think that's what's going on here a little bit. People see this tragedy, they see a terrible thing, and they say, I want someone to hang. I want someone to be brutally punished so that we can feel like these things don't happen unless bad people make them happen. And that's just not the world we live in. So explain this uh, to me. I, I was going home uh, last week, and I pass a club. And people are lining up around the block. And they're young, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. And it was a Saturday night. It was Saturday night. And I and I was on the phone with a friend and I said, I would line up to get out of that club. I mean, well, so that's how out of touch I am. So 50,000 people at Astro World, right? Yeah. You know, I'm not a big festival guy either. I've gone to plenty. No, how could you I, not? I preferred... I like to go to small shows. I like to go to basement I know I'm, shows. I know I'm. I know I'm old. I know that. I, I and I when I if I were, you know, your age or younger, I would under. I, but I don't understand how you could be among fifty thousand people, and not have a panic attack. Forget the stampede. Mm -hmm. How can you not have a, a massive panic attack just being surrounded by all these people, knowing that you're trapped, that you can't that's going to be really hard to leave, that you have to wait your turn to leave. I think when you're a kid, when you're a kid, there's so much energy and excitement about being around so many other people said, for the same reason. The chat room said drugs help. Yeah, they do. They do. I mean, there's a, there's a very old joke about, you know, because look, there have been a lot bigger concerts than this and no one got killed, you know, and I think, I think it's more coincidence than not, I think is the problem. Because, I mean, look, I mean, fish, has shows this side uh, was having has had probably thousands of shows with this many people and they've never had any major problems like this uh but it's also because they're a, more of a well-oiled machine of knowing how to put on giant festival shows so you're and, going there for more than just the music you're going there to it's a social event yeah it's, it's exciting event. there's so much think about when you're a kid little you know teenagers want to go to the mall 
Why do they want to go to the mall? They literally just want to be around other people. There's a element of possibility of, 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 you know, of hope of just ways that you can have fun because you're this endless sea of, of like-minded people, your age, there is something about being a teenager that makes you desperately want to be around large groups of other people, your age. And right. these people love Travis Scott. He's a good musician. Right. And this is the only opportunity they have to see him live. You know, I wouldn't want to go see my favorite musician with 50, 50,000 people. You know, I'd rather go see him in a club, in a small club, but I'm now, also old. The fact that, let me ask you a question. Again, I, by, uh, it's it's a tragedy. Yeah, uh, it's in Texas. What does mm -hmm. that suggest? I don't think there's really, honestly, nothing to me. Um, I don't think there's anything that. I'll put it this way: the only way Texas would have been a factor to me is if this was in the summer, because in the summer it is more irresponsible to have these kinds of festivals in places like Texas because the heat is a very big factor in what kills people you start seeing you know people get exhaustion and but that's the thing this was in october this was like around halloween it wasn't that hot so if this would if this was in july more people would you're you're, you're frozen Question. and if this were july you wouldn't from that, i don't blame texas i'm sorry sorry uh yeah but yeah yeah i yeah if this was july uh, it would have been worse but uh you know i don't think there's anything specific about texas to me that because honestly, these were teenagers. I don't think the teenagers of Texas are embodying the kinds of problems that you may be implying. Right. These were a lot of minority kids. These were not the rednecks that you're associating with Houston or, or, or Dallas or Texas or any part of Texas. And there were like, kids. I mean, there were young kids there. Yeah. A lot of kids died, honestly, because they're kids and they had like less. 14, like 14. They were, yeah. They were small. Younger. So they were more vulnerable to getting trampled. And here's the really weird thing about this. I just want to say, what's the big story, I think, about what's going on here? There are two very different stories about what happened. People on the ground are saying that when Travis Scott started his performance, the whole crowd just started crushing towards the center, towards the front, to get to the front to watch the show, which is a danger if the crowd is too big. But then another group of people were saying that it was a stampede of panic when they saw a security guard get dropped by one of the people there that a security guard and they and they, they they said this is not a rumor the police have confirmed this the security guard was jabbed with a hypodermic filled with with heroin right that's that do we have we, i was going to ask you about that do we know I, that i saw I, at least i can say i saw a police officer a police officer claiming it was confirmed that the that the man that the man was revived narcan and it was an opiate that he was injected with. And, you know, it's not the hardest thing in the world to imagine happening at a concert where people are doing drugs and someone's trying to get away from, from a security guard who's maybe going to. And did that create the stampede away the, from the, the heroin or towards? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're saying that that might have caused a panic of people running. Right. And there's a thing with that where the smallest thing can have a chain reaction at these kind of right. events because at that event in israel which i guess even more people died uh they no one even knows what caused the panic they just know that a small group at some point panicked about something and it spread exponentially and everyone started stampeding so it doesn't take much right also i looked at the the apple video apple had some kind of live streaming travis scott looked he asked if everybody was okay and from his perspective it seemed like it was okay and from my perspective from from the apple stream i guess i was looking at what travis scott saw and it looked like people it, I, you, it was hard to spot yeah yeah i don't see I don't, how and, how yeah, the examples that they give like david grohl stopping his set because a kid needed to the kid was in the front row you yeah, know where they people like have been know. like david grohl you when it's you're unfair, looking unfair. at fifty thousand people it looked like they were jumping up and down i agree with that i think that people are really trying too hard to make this to make travis scott the performer guilty here when travis scott's only guilty as a producer he's guilty because he owned the thing and that everyone who's on that level is guilty but i don't think he did anything from the stage that was what people are trying to make it out to be that he somehow caused this to happen you know 
his presence caused people to rush the stage, just being there. He didn't say, hey, go hurt someone. How much of this is a, a supply chain issue in that we are having trouble finding people to come to work? They can't, you know, uh, they, what if they just couldn't find the right number of people to do security? Well, then they should have uh, offered more money for security. I'm just saying that this yeah, is. A, I, I don't know. I have no idea if that's the truth. But if you say we couldn't afford, we couldn't find security people, well, then you weren't offering them enough money. And that's the way the world is. That's supply and demand. If you can't get security, you pay more for it. And right. this is, you can't skimp on security. And the, the really dangerous thing here would be the sort of, if, if, there's, if there was ever a, an acknowledgement by someone at the top, we don't want that much security. We want people to have fun. If that kind of decision was made and there's proof of it, then you're really talking about a, a tremendous amount of trouble. If there was a conscious decision to not have enough security. But the fact is, there's a lot of people who organize these events who are now saying, oh, we consulted. We said do blank, blank and blank. And they didn't. Right. So were, let me again. I'm, this is a tragedy. Yes. And, I, and, and it's very sad. It really is. No, it's horrible. Uh, and it, it's horrible, horrible every time this happens. Yeah. And I, mean, and I don't mean to. Tr but with the supply chain issue and it being Texas. And yes, I'm politicizing this because everything is political. The minute you step out of your home, it's political. Texas is very insistent that we go back to living our lives. And we're in the middle of a pandemic, correct? Yes, pretty much. We had 50,000 people on top of one another. It was outdoors? Yes. 50,000 people on top of one another. Uh, I'm not going to even ask you about masks. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I don't think there was very much mask wearing. Right. And if this were a country concert, the panic would have been that somebody was jabbing security guards with the vaccine, not heroin. Yes. But yes. That's, yes. But That'd be a much bigger deal. Yes. Much bigger deal. The idea that we have, that Texas is in denial about what this country is going through that they would allow a, a, a concert with 50,000 people and assume there isn't a supply chain issue, that would assume that, that there isn't a worker shortage, that, that we can throw the same type of concerts we had before COVID and that workers will show up. There's arrogance in that state to assume that we're, we can just do what we used to do I mean, there's a lot of guesses in that statement, but it's very possible that it's the truth, that they had a cavalier attitude to security and safety. And basically, may, it, maybe it is possible they said, well, this is how many security we could get. I don't know. I, I have no idea if that's true. They very well could have had a full complement of security and it wasn't run properly. Or they could have had as much security as they thought they needed because someone underestimated it. Uh, right. This has happened many times in history, and it doesn't happen as often now as it used to. I feel like in the 70s and 80s, this happened more commonly. Oh, uh, the who. Oh, oh, yeah, exactly. The Who is a, is a great example. Altamont is a huge example. Uh, you know, the Great oh, right. White. Altamont. 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 Great, great White. I think 100 people died. In at Rhode fair, Island. At, a, at, at not even that big a concert. Like 2003. A, Right. Like a, a significant percentage of that crowd died. But that was also gross negligence of using pyrotechnics inside. This was different. But this does happen a lot. And it, it used to happen more often because concerts used to be a bigger deal. Used to be that was basically the only thing you could do as a teenager. And uh, they had less. And, you know, they, you, it used to be legal to have one door for an entire stadium that could open. And there Jeez. are there are ways that we change this. But giant swap giant numbers of people are really dangerous and this has absolute this has absolutely nothing to do with this you should be allowed to do a concert where you have a, a a paper mache devil that you cut in pieces and blood squirts everywhere and there's and people have giant plastic guns or what like you should be allowed to put anything you want on stage if in my opinion to you know within reason and it has and not be blamed if that's why people get violent you know people could just as easily have trampled each other at a wiggles concert if you had the wrong 
uh, if, if you had the wrong kind of precautions. So we need to let go of this whole idea that Travis Scott's lyrics or that he needs to be less aggressive in the way he grabs a microphone. No, you need to right. have goddamn security at your event. Right. I just want to point out that Dave Cyrus and I are comedy writers and the chat room right now is torturing us. Oh, yeah. Have you looked at the chat room? I try not to. No. Why? What do they oh have to God. say for themselves? No, no, I can't. Don't repeat any of it. It's just don't, don't, don't. It's highly inappropriate and not fair. Well, I'm to, seeing a lot uh, of LOL. Don't read it. No, 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 a lot no, of people no. seem to love things I said. No, no, no uh, I'm talking about jokes. I'm talking about gallows humor. Oh, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, don't gallows worry about that. humor that is coming over the transom from the. Uh, oh, speaking of gallows. Oh, boy. Now, and well, by the way, yeah. you think the yeah. chat room, you think the chat room is. Uh, yes, yes, we got a funny a group. group here. Yeah. Uh, you know, but of course, you know, that's a guy who knows a lot of bit, a lot, a lot about crowds. I, I bet Mr. Breslin well, does. Let's let's bleed. Uh, let's bleed into our next guest. Uh, we're going to talk about Travis Scott. I do have a question. I would like to ask Mark. I would like to ask Mark. Mark Mark, Mark, Mark Breslin, the the founder and tr founder and president of Yuck Yuck's the largest comedy chain in the world, and he is also a Canadian royalty. He is a uh, seriously. He's been he's like a duke or something. I'm being serious. Yeah, duke no. I'm, and, and I actually really wanted to ask Mark honestly, Mark, what comedian ever had the most effect on an audience in the sense of route is there a comedian that ever actually got crowds rowdy to the point that you had to prepare and be and know about that in advance well a lot of people did crowd work and that was their job is to whip them up so it's difficult to to single anybody out i mean kinnison would play that that role certainly um i would play that role uh, in fact i loved when the audience would would get so riled up that they were one step away from rushing the stage. <laughs> they had to be one step away from it. If they actually came right. to me, um, I was terrified and I would run off the stage. And that's uh, comedy, though, where it's like three, four hundred people tops and it's not it, it's manageable. Well, depends how many <laughs> three. You ever had three, four hundred people come after you? I've had <laughs> four or five. No, no, probably three, four hundred people. Um, who want your scalp? Not a not a pleasant thing. And I would deliberately do that to. Uh, you used to do open pogrom system. night, didn't you? I'm sorry. You used to have an open pogrom night, I believe, on Tuesdays. Well, I think you're thinking of the first when well, first yuckex, which was on a Wednesday night. But it was eh, no, but no, but no. It was a different kind of uh, vibe in the room. It was all pretty sophisticated people because you had to be kind of sophisticated to know that the show even existed. So, you know, you'd have poets sitting next to women in mink coats, sitting next to academics, sitting next to mobsters. It was a fantastic mix, but nobody ever got violent or weird about it. I used to host a show in L.A. Uh, for like a year and a half. And in that year and a half, two people tried to fight me from the crowd and I wasn't even screwing with them. I wasn't even making fun of them. Literally, it was just because it was a it was a bar that had a surprise comedy show and people would just get mad at me from drunks would get mad. And and I, I didn't even know the guy was trying to stab me until afterward. Literally, a guy's trying to get on stage. I'm like, oh, this guy wants to say something. And they were holding him back. And then afterward, they're like, that guy had a knife. Yeah, um, I, when I, when I would go on tour, especially out west in Western Canada, which can be very rough. And, and you know, we would be booked into biker bars. And I don't know if you can tell just by looking at me. But I'm not a kind of a biker bar kind of guy. <laughs> they would they would smell that right off the top, and I was in danger for the entire show. Um, I was I was decked uh, out cold. I was knocked out cold in a suburb of Vancouver in a really rough bar by uh, a lesbian biker. <laughs> yeah, funny to you now. Not so funny then. Did you really get punched by a lesbian biker? I was knocked out completely. And, you, you know, I should have realized something was wrong when we had booked the show and it said, um, you know, gay biker, uh, gay biker night, also yuck yucks. Um, nice. When you're 
when you're when you're second in the bill um, to somebody's sexuality, you kind of know that maybe maybe this isn't for you. <laughs> By the way, you know who gets it worse than any comedian? are the wrestlers, especially old timey wrestlers back before people really knew how fake it was. Right. Classy Freddie Blassie has had a had a fake eye from getting hit in the eye with a with a, with a, a hard boiled egg by a fan. He'd been stabbed multiple times because you go to these small towns, you're attracting the crazy people who think this is real. I bet soap opera actors deal with this. Yeah, we've booked we've booked a lot of wrestlers. A lot of wrestlers do uh, comedy clubs now. Um, yeah, I they're know. not particularly funny. But, you know, they tell sort of witty stories about their careers. What amazed me is when they and they would draw really well. And these people would know these wrestlers back to front. They knew everything. So they would tell stories that would start like, all right, remember in 86 when I fought the Sheik? And everybody would cheer because <laughs> they would know that. Yeah, and right. I sat there as if I were watching people discussing Greek literature in Greek. I had no yeah. idea what they were talking about. Honestly, there is one really good stand up in, from wrestling and the rest are just jocks who think everyone wants to hear their stories. It's a good one. Oh, Mick Foley. Yeah, we booked him many times. No, Mick Foley's a genius. He's actually yeah, like we booked him many times. Yeah, he's but like I actually had no idea what he was guy. doing. I've never I, I yeah. think I went to a wrestling match once in my life. I have no interest in it. Um, we just booked it because we knew it was a good book. But I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no clue what they were talking about. Yeah. Now, I created a stampede the first time I worked for you. I'm being serious in Vancouver. Yeah. Oh, when you walked the crowd? I was walking the crowd every night. And uh, and I also, I've done that before where people just Let ran me tell out. You, in that city, in Vancouver, you can make fun of Jews. You can make fun of blacks. You can make fun of gays, but you better not touch the whales. Right. <laughs> you go after the whales. They're coming after you. That By is way, Mark, exactly what happened. This is I'll, the last thing I'll say, and I'll let you guys talk. Uh, Mark, tell me if you're familiar with this. I feel like you probably have heard this story. You've probably seen this video. Very famous video from the 90s, I believe, of a guitar comic getting heckled. And he's getting Dennis heckled. Dennis bought that guitar. Oh, go really? Ahead. Oh, OK, so the guy is getting heckled. He's trying to do his parody songs. And this guy in the front row is just being a complete troll, bothering him, won't stop. And at one point, the guy puts his back to the comedian, I guess, to go to the bathroom or something. The comedian smashes the guitar over the guy's head, knocks him unconscious and then goes, you all saw it. He was coming right at me. I think that was Kelly Rogers. Is that who it was? He's an old school New York comic, and he was famous oh. for his parody that went, I'm being followed by a big Negro. Big Negro, big no, Negro. No. I don't think hang on, I have to I ha hang on for one. I have to step in here because I not only watched that video, and I will play it on Thursday's show. Nice. I Dennis Miller and I watch that video <laughs> over and over again and he called the guy up and he paid thousands for the guitar so, let, so i excuse me I'm, I'm eating into mark's time but i don't know the name of the guy i think his name was kelly he's playing he's i think he's playing oklahoma oh my god and right it, now <laughs> oh, oh. and he's being heckled by a guy in the front row and he's a guitar act i've watched this like this is a prude. I, I'm telling you, we would watch <laughs> like Dennis with a foul out. Get in here. I want to watch this. And go ahead, Mark. If it's Kelly Rogers, he's really funny. I usually don't I like don't, the tracks, but I think Kelly Rogers is really funny. I don't think it's Kelly Rogers. Well, there's and a video. If, hey, uh, somebody just, just posted a video in your chat if you want to take a look and see. So the guy I, I have it memorized. So he's going he's trying to shut up a heckler who's in the front row so nobody can hear him in the back. And he goes, uh, okay, shut the fuck up. Okay, shut the fuck up. Where are you from? And he tells him, he goes, okay, uh, 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 he goes, you're, you're, from, uh, you're from Oklahoma. That's the okay state, or in your case, the homo state. Call the guy a homo. And the guy stands up because he didn't want to be called. Different time. Yeah. Different <laughs> time. And Kelly takes the guitar off the straps and says, Oh, get on up here, motherfucker. And oh, he starts God. swinging the bat like it's, you know, a Louisville, like it's a Tom Tresh 
bat. And the guy comes to the stage and he el kabongs him. Or I thought it was on, the, on the fucking head. Hang on, it gets better. I thought it was from the back, right? I thought he went. It, it, it's he the back of the back. guitar. He didn't. He was smart enough not to destroy the frets, and then he flips the guitar. You see the back of the guitar broken, you know, but the frets on the front, and he puts the pick in between the strings on the fret. He re, and he goes, "What do you, What do you say, folks? He had it coming, didn't he?" And you hear, I swear to God, you hear the guy. I want my money back. The guy's on the floor. And so Dennis called the guy and bought the, the broken guitar for a couple of grand. And it was it would hang in the writer's room. That's great. We would it was it was it was in, and I don't know who probably Mike a guy named Mike Carano probably ended up with that guitar. That is sorry, I just it's a feel good story. All right. Have a good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Uh, violence to, to hit somebody over the head with your guitar and then think the show could still go on after. Like he thinks the show could still go Greg on. Campbell, I'm sorry? Greg Campbell, who's a comic who now lives in England. He's from Canada. Uh, but while he was in Canada at one of my stages, there was a guy who was really, really acting up. He took the mic stand the flat end of the mic stand and just pummel the guy in the face. Not wow. cool. Were you able to, did he, did he still pay his ticket? I don't think he paid his bill, no. no but he didn't sad, sue us either. I'm sorry? He didn't sue us either. Yeah, what is, well, I don't, can we talk about that or is that too? Yeah, sure. As well, long I mean, what, ha what, what happens? If you book somebody and they uh, <laughs> they beat up an audience member. Well, we had a problem with a guy who stirred a drink with his dick. It was New Year's Eve, Vancouver. Again, Vancouver. A guy was, <laughs> you know, kind of yappy in the front. The comedian pulls down his pants, takes out his dick, takes the guy's drink, and stirs it with the with his dick and gives it back to the guy. That must have killed. It killed. I wasn't there, but I heard it killed. We had to buy the guy a new drink, obviously. <laughs> you know? And I thought if he wanted to, if he wanted to take it even further, he should have stuck his nuts in in the drink and said, "There, a lychee cocktail." <laughs> Well, wait a second. Now those drinks are cold. Yes. That that that. And so he sued. No, the guy wanted an apology. I gave him an apology and some tickets to another show. That's all he wanted. <laughs> so Mike Ward. Yeah, uh, Mike Ward. I haven't spoken to you since Mike Ward. Tell us who Mike Ward is. Tell him what happened. Okay, so Mike Ward is famous, but really only in Quebec. Quebec has a whole ecosystem of stand-up comedy that nobody else knows about anywhere else in the country because they perform primarily in, in uh, French. So um, Mike Ward and there's a bunch of other guys like this. There might be even as many as a dozen could sell out Place des Arts, which is a place in Montreal uh, that has like 2,500 seats, and they could probably sell it out for a week a week going they could do seven or eight shows that's how popular the guy is that's how well known he is he's a very edgy comic uh and he was doing a bit and this was quite a while ago this is like a decade ago on overrated quebec uh celebrities so he included celine dion um he included other people that you would know if you were a quebec and one of them was a kid named petit jeremy and petit jeremy had some facial uh, issue. Uh, he needed reconstruction on his face and he had some disease that caused his face to be um, look, look kind of off. Uh, and he would, but he was famous because he would be trotted out to sing the national anthem at sports games. And it was, you know, one of those things where everybody would go, ah, because he was you know, kind of pathetic looking. 
And uh, you pitied him as much as you and might have enjoyed it. So he made fun of him. He made fun of him. And this is all in French. So I can't repeat the jokes, but it was all in French. And the kid and his parents sued him, sued Mike Ward, um, saying that, uh, you know, it was uh, it hurt. It hurt his feelings and he was being bullied at school and he was suicidal. My guess is he was probably being bullied and suicidal anyway. Um, but uh, it went to the court. It went to a kind of quasi court, which is not an actual court, but a kind of recommendation court. Um, so uh, it has no real legal uh, status, but it's the place you go before you go to a, a court, of, uh, which is actually legal. And they ruled against Mike Ward and ordered him to pay $45,000 to the child and his mother. Ward refused. And it wasn't that he couldn't afford the $45,000. He could have simply paid it and made the whole thing go away. But it was an issue of was an issue of pride and an issue of idealism on Mike Ward's part. He believed that comedy has to be free. Um, we see that issue coming up again and again and again, Dave Chappelle. And uh, they took it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Canada, and it ruled against the child and his mother and ruled in favor of Mike Ward. Well, what Mike Ward can't get back is what I would estimate is three to $400,000 of legal fees that I am thrilled that, you know, Mike Ward can afford. He's rich. He's really famous in, in Quebec. Um, he's done shows for me in, in, in English just to try them out, but it's obvious French is his first language. French is his métier. And um, it's a victory, not just for Mike Ward. It's a victory for two things. It's a victory for all comics who want to speak whatever they want to say. And it's also a great victory for bad taste. How was, the kid, how was the kid he made fun of? Well, the kid is now like, I guess, 18 or something. And, uh, you know, he went on, on TV and said he was disappointed with the outcome, uh, that he'd had a horrible time with his, uh, the things that were wrong with him. And, and, you know, Mike Ward only made it worse, but he accepted the decision. And that was that. Well, it's and you're, that. yeah. I mean, sh you know, my position on this is, Yes, my, Mike Ward should be allowed to make fun of anybody. Yeah. But why? But why? Why make fun of? Well, I mean, he wasn't making fun of him because he was a child. He was making fun of him in spite of the fact he was a child. It wasn't all that much different when I did my Terry Fox jokes when Terry Fox was, you know, running across the country with cancer, and I was, huh. I was, I was ruthless on him. Remind uh, us who Terry Fox is. Terry Fox. In the late 80s, early 90s, had cancer. He only had one leg and he ran across the country to raise money for cancer awareness. And my joke was, um, hey, remember when Terry Fox ran across the country? Yeah, I tripped the fucker. So um, now, what was the joke about? Was it really about Terry Fox or was it about heroism and our blind acceptance of heroism? Heroism to me is, is to be made fun of not Terry Fox himself. Right, right. And I think this, similarly, Mike Ward wasn't making fun of the kid. He was making fun of the way that the media escape created a hero out of this kid with minimal talent. Right, right. So Comedy, it's how are- It's pretty and sometimes there's uh, collateral damage. Right, have you ever been offended? No. No, I don't think I could do my job if I were offended. I, I'm trying to think if there's any time. Anytime I'm actually offended, I'm laughing. I'm laughing that I'm offended. I think it's really funny that somebody could make get me to be offended. No, I, I don't think in any real way I could I've ever been offended. Well, what do you know? So but you have a young son. Yeah. And uh, I hope he grows up to be the kind of person who's so tough that he's not offended. Okay. But do you teach him? I'm curious. Do you teach him there's a time and a place for certain things? Well, he's a bit young for that now, but no, that's not true. I'm sorry. Yes, I do sort of teach him that. 
because I always say we take them to the shows all the time. And some of the right. comic PCs are really way out there. And there's a fuck is every other word and 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 all this, you know, completely sick humor. And he laughs, but he also mm -hmm. knows that it's for the stage. Right. Even myself, David, um, I was always a person. I never swear. I never swear. I only do it as part of an act. And right. when I started doing stand up, uh, people from my high school would say, you got to go down to Yuckex and watch Breslin. He swears. <laughs> he does jokes or he's a stand up comic. He swears because it's so unlike me to swear. I never swear in the house. Right. In my life. We don't swear. We don't swear unless it's part of some, you know, art project. Right. I don't either. I, 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 yeah. I make disgusting jokes. I, I always feel you don't need to swear. You know, you can be disgusting without having to resort to vulgarity. Well, um, you have to understand how vulgarity was particularly political uh, in the mid 70s in Canada when no one ever swore on stage. It was kind of a, an unwritten rule that you did not swear. So for me to say fuck on stage was revolutionary at the time. Now, it's nothing. In fact, I probably resent the fact that everybody uh, is doing it and it's become so much part of the language that it's actually taken all the power away from those words. But at the time, at the time, it was really radical. Right. Radical. Right. And, and my quarrel with this is. I I don't mind that Mike Ward is making fun of the kid. But there are things that he wouldn't say. Mm. He would, he would, you know, there are things that, that there is the illusion of free speech. I'm talking about sex. I'm talking about race. I'm making fun of crippled people. But Mike Ward, the people walking the edge don't go after the truly powerful the people, you know, not, I'm not talking about the politicians, you know, the, the people who really are dangerous. I don't know. At least, I don't know enough about Mike Ward. Quite yeah, frankly. I don't know. He might have a bunch of Mark Zuckerberg material. I don't know. He might have well, a lot even of Mike. What I'm saying is what, what's passed off as edgy. And I again, I don't care if people want to uh, go after whomever, but it's real edgy is going after the people who can destroy you. And therefore, they need to be destroyed. Well, I don't think. Well, I don't think that's interest. I don't think that goes Sorry? with Mike Ward's act. That's not his. Act. But it's not really anybody's act. It, it's uh, there's this thing of you before. If somebody did that, you'd have thirty people in a room watching and going, "Yeah, that's good." Right. My audience, the audience in a comedy club, they're not political in that kind of way. You might get a, a laugh or two if you if you went after Jeff Bezos, but then it would stop because they're just not that interested. And in the end, as I've said, I think everybody would like to be him. So to be yeah. Jeff Bezos, they want to be rich and they want to be rich. They want to be rich and powerful. They do not question the the um, inequality of life so much as they want to be the guy on the top. Right. You well, and I want to be Jeff Bezos, but most people most people are normal and wouldn't want to be Jeff Bezos. You and I would want to be Jeff Bezos. Well, I wouldn't want to be Jeff Bezos specifically, but there are other people that I, I wouldn't mind being more like. If you had yes. half a trillion dollars, how much fun would you have? Wouldn't you buy the Washington Post just to destroy it, to keep it in business so that you could just have like just the front page would be attacks on ex-girlfriends and. No, because then people would stop reading it. But what I would do is I would rename it uh, the Washington Compost. It would, <laughs> it would be very similar and it'd be in that same kind of script. And then everything else would be the same. And yet with that title, it would change the framing of every, every story. W wouldn't you, if you had the New York Post, Forget the Washington Post. You know how much fun? Here's what I would do if I had a hundred 
billion dollars. I would buy, I would start a, a, a New York Post in like Westport, Connecticut, in the Bever Beverly Hills, and I would just go after hedge fund. I would treat hedge fund managers the way we treat celebrities and write gossip columns about them and follow them and just try to make their lives miserable the same way we try to make Alec Baldwin's life miserable. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure that that's what I would do. But, I, you know, that's the sort of the plot of The Magic Christian, if you remember. Yes. The movie? Yep. A movie that just didn't get enough attention at the time. but some Terry just, Southern? Yeah. Terry Southern and Badfinger. But he, he wrote it. And Badfinger. Yes, that's right. And uh, Ringo. When was the last time you saw the movie? Before it came out. <laughs> that's how old I am. Watch it again. It's what would people be willing to do for money? It's really interesting, and it's way ahead of its time. Right. They have people swimming through shit for money, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, right. It's a game show where they swim through shit to get toasters. Sorry, but too funny. Yeah, yeah. What do you read? Are you reading? Oh, please don't in embarrass me. My friend Ralph Ben Murgy wrote a book. I've got to read it because I'm in it, and i got to know whether I should give it to my lawyers or not. But uh, uh, this is a guy who, um, he's a Canadian celebrity. And I went to school with him. Uh, he started off as a stand-up comic at Yuck Yucks. Then he became an actor. Then he became uh, uh, the, the lead singer in a rock band with, Joel, with our friend Joel Axler for a couple of years. Then he landed on, on his feet as a midday talk show host, you know, one of those midday shows i think the show was even called midday you know he was very pleasant and then after that uh what did he do yeah he was an advisor to the green party uh and then an advisor to the liberal party and now he has become a kind of non-ordained rabbi and he has a podcast called not that kind of rabbi so he's an interesting guy and i've got his book and i owe it to him to read it so that will be the first book I actually get to. This is the longest you've gone with being. No, but it's been a long time. And I know I should. I, I, I counted. I have eight books on my night table waiting to be read. But what I've about getting a garbage book? Getting a. Just like, you know, when, I, when, when I'm not in the mood to read, I'll read, you know, like uh, Rob Lowe's autobiography, which isn't that bad. It doesn't, uh, well, because he has the word blow in it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I can't do that because my time is too valuable and I'm really aware that I'm wasting my time. So if I'm going to read, it has to be something that has some value to it. Where are we with COVID and where are we with comedy in Canada before you yeah. go? Uh, Saturday night, I went down to my club in Toronto and now there are no capacity limits anymore. And I was so thrilled to see there were 230 people sitting in a room um, laughing and just going crazy and glad to be there. And uh, the room holds about 300 people. But when you have 230 people in it, it looks busy. It looks full. And it was just a breath of fresh air. I hope it continues. I hope it continues across the country. Um, we still need more shows, but at least we... You could see that it was coming. You could see that it's changing. Yeah, and it is flat in America. It's, it's flattened out. So hopefully we've turned the corner on this. Yeah, well, it's really flattened out in Canada. We have, you know, in Toronto, we have 90% vaccination. And I'm very, I'm very excited about the pill that Pfizer's, that Pfizer's uh, coming out with because I think that's a real game changer in the sense that, oh, so I got sick. Okay, no problem. I'll get the uh, the pill from my doctor, and three days later, the symptoms will be gone. Right. That right. will make an enormous difference. And still, even so, I know a lot of people who have been doubly vaxxed, young people, not old people, and they're getting, they're still getting it. And so I'm still careful, and my wife is still careful, and we have a an unvaccinated child at home, so we're still being, you know, we're still being cautious. 
great. Go see comedy in Canada. Go to Yuck Yucks. Support and enjoy live comedy. Mark Breslin, founder, president of Yuck Yucks, largest comedy club in North America, if not the world. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Nathan. We'll see you again soon. Yeah, I'll see you hopefully next week. Let us now go to California, where Howie Klein and Dr. Daniel Lee are standing by. Are you there, Howie? I am here. It's good to see you. Thank you for doing this, as always. We have a special guest. He's running for Congress, I believe. He's supported by the Blue America PAC. We're in the, uh, he will be. We're in the final stages of, um, of vetting, although we're not really vetting him anymore. He passed with flying colors. He's an amazing candidate, as you're about to find out. We're just waiting to see um, what the district is going to be, and we'll know on Wednesday. <clears throat> California is redrawing its, um, the, all of the L.A. city uh, districts very radically, and, uh, and, and so no one knows exactly uh, where his district is going to be. But yes, we, we, we're definitely going to be endorsing him. Karen Bass, Congresswoman Karen Bass, represents the 37th district in California. She was con up there. She, there was a possibility that Joe Biden was going to pick her to be vice president. So she is giving up her seat. If Joe Biden and, and our next guest is running to replace her. If Joe Biden was thinking of Karen Bass as a vice president, Howie Klein, how good a congresswoman could she possibly be? Well, uh, she was uh, she was she was better than average, uh, and, and that's about all all I can say about about her. She she was okay, you know. She she was she wasn't she you know she's not AOC, she's not Cory Bush. Uh, she's, you know, she's, she's, but on the other hand, she's not, she's not a blue dog. She's, she's an okay, she's an okay standard variety, garden variety, Democrat, a little bit better than that. I had high hopes for her. She had been the, uh, I, th I think the speaker or the, or the majority leader of, of the, uh, state assembly. Uh, and, and I, I kind of had high hopes that she would turn out to be a much better congressperson than she did. She's okay. She was an okay congressperson. Now, our next guest, on yes. the other hand, when I said that uh, Karen Bass wasn't uh, Cory Bush or AOC, uh, we're about to meet somebody who is going to be uh, Cory Bash or AO, uh, Cory Bush or AOC. Of course, uh, Daniel won't be. He'll he'll always be Daniel. But he will. People will be talking about him. Uh, holding him up as a model the same way they, they hold up AOC and uh, and Cory Bush and Ilhan Omar and some of the others as models. Uh, th this is uh, this is an amazing uh, candidate, like one of the best we've uh, ever had on the show. I know you always regret when I offered to bring AOC on the show and you were kicking yourself and saying, oh, why didn't we do it? Why didn't we do it? Well, now you'll be able to pat yourself on the back because uh, Daniel is as at least as good as that. Hopefully he'll be in Congress to prove that to everybody. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and thanks for that incredibly positive and vocal support, Howie. Uh, happy to be here and happy to join the conversation. Good. Well, we're glad to have you, and I'm sure they, I'll beat David to say it, that we hope that we'll have you back again uh, uh, many, many times in the course of this campaign, and once you become a congressperson as well. And I will do the honors of telling our listeners to go to com and donate money. com, and this is how he talks and introduces Daniel Lee to you. You'll see that we need to get him money as soon as possible. When is the California primary, Howie? Uh, it's, it's in June. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah, it's uh, June 6th or June 7th. Um, but uh, because Karen Bass is running for mayor, she's not running for Congress. So a lot of people think there's going to be a special election, but it will be in line with regularly scheduled elections because she's focusing all of her energy on running for mayor of Los Angeles. Right, and whether she wins or loses, she's uh, she's done with Congress. Although she, 
I, I kind of think she's the front runner right now to be in, and to be uh, the mayor anyway. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I noted that there was a, a new map proposed today. I, I, it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of foolish to talk about the uh, about the new maps because I was told that if a map comes out, uh, you know, a map that came out three weeks ago and a map that comes out today, and neither of those maps is more likely to be the final map than the other one. They they just putting maps out uh, because people suggest different things and. Uh, we won't. When, but on Wednesday, we'll know. And I'm, I'm not even going to ask you if you have uh, if you have any inside information on this because no one has any inf- inside information on this. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, what I've heard from people that I've spoken to about it, they just said November 10th we'll know something that's closer to the final maps. Everything else has been speculation because in one, you know, districts were merged and another, like uh, a lot of the black and brown population and district 37 was cut out. Uh, and a lot of the more recent ones have been sort of close to the same as the 37th district has been for about a decade. So it's hard to tell. And I'm looking forward to Wednesday because we want to know there are strategic decisions we got to make based on the shape of the district, and we want to be able to make them now. Uh, we know we're going to be running against a corporate Democrat. We're not exactly sure who yet, but we know it's going to be someone who has progressive language skills, uh, but who doesn't actually uh, push progressive policies forward and is more in the mold of Karen Bass, who I appreciate. I think Karen Bass. You know, for the role of a Congress member that necess- doesn't necessarily put climate change as a priority, you know, she was fine, but she's not progressive and she doesn't push. And I think in the context of both the, the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic fallout that happened, we need people to push and we need people that know how bad the economic part of COVID-19 has been for people, not just in the 37th district of California, but around the country. Let me go back for one second to uh, what you were just saying about pushing, if you don't mind. Um, On on Friday evening, or Friday night, uh, the Democrats voted uh, overwhelmingly for uh, the, um, the conser- all conservative, only conservative, hard infrastructure bill. And, uh, and there, a deal was, was made that supposedly House conservatives, Democrats, will then vote for the social spending bill. Uh, although the, uh, neither Manchin nor Cinema, both being senators, were party to that, uh, to that agreement. So it looks like that agreement isn't worth a piece of toilet paper. There were six Democrats who who didn't vote for, who said, who said, you know, we've we've just been had, and they refused to go along with the Progressive Caucus, who basically waved the white flag. And yet, it's very, very hard to vote against a popular bill like that. You know, people don't know the intricacies, they don't know the infighting that went on, they don't know what the bill could have been, they just know that you know some roads going to get fixed and some transportation and some lead pipes and there'll be some things done and that are popular. So it's hard to vote no, but yet there were six Democrats who did vote no. Um, where would you have been on, on that bill had, had you been in Congress? Do you, do you want to talk about that with us? Sure. Like for me, uh, how in our conversations, I think you know where I would be, uh, but I would have been with the six Democrats who voted against it, but I would have also been very passionately lobbying people and various other districts to tell them why they should vote against it. I think, mm, I I don't wanna say this, but I always say it anyway, the Democrats uh, policy when it comes to negotiation. And I think this has been true under Barack Obama and it's been true under whoever is the speaker of the house um, is preemptive capitulation. Like they think about what we can get rather than what we can ask for uh, and pushing to you know make that larger ask, which is my negotiating strategy. It's like, okay, I might actually want a $10 trillion infrastructure bill, but in that context, I'm gonna ask for 20 trillion. You know, I'm gonna make sure that that my ask is much higher than the minimum that I think we should be doing for the American people. I think, you know, this bill is 
it's it's incredibly disappointing. And I, I read a few things today that said like about 550 billion of it or around 500 billion was just normal spending that we were gonna do anyway. So talking about it as like one point whatever trillion is just intellectually dishonest. All of that spending just would have happened anyway. So what we got was like point, you know, five or 0.7 trillion or, you know, 0.9 trillion. Uh, but we need more. Like uh, there was a there was a the chart that I shared uh, a couple days ago on Twitter that compared what we're getting in the infrastructure bill to what weapons manufacturers and or fossil fuel companies get each year just without having to really negotiate. And it pales in comparison. Uh, we just went through an unprecedented pandemic. We're not done with it, but the economic part ha continues to affect people. And it's mostly working class people and middle class people. The people at the upper echelon, they're not feeling it. Uh, so they can be fine with saying, oh, trillion. Like, I think there needs to be a whole lot of education in the general populace about billion and trillion, because it's a lot. But in the context of government spending, it's much less than the Democratic Party wants you to think it is. And it's much less than we give the corporations. And it's much less than we give to uh, fossil fuel companies, coal companies, oil companies. It, it, it's much less than we deserve. And we need to say that. Um, I think you know one of the flaws with some of the six that voted against it was not taking their show on the road. I, I, I was very happy to see Bernie Sanders, you know, running uh, an, an ad in Joe Manchin's district because he was holding stuff up. And I don't want to get off on a tangent, but like right before I got on, I saw in my email from the New York Times, uh, Maureen Dowd talking about how wokeness, you know, <laughs> canceled this for the Democrats and it was like wokeness is and I'm like what because you know if we were passing something that was woke you know it would have you know at least five or six trillion dollars more uh it would be 10 trillion at least but you know what we've compromised on is very small what people are pushing in terms of build back better is small and unfortunately I'm in that pe pessimistic camp that's like okay we passed the infrastructure bill a lot of moderate Democrats say, OK, we passed that. Now I'm going to vote for Build Back Better. I think instead, a lot of them are going to be advocating to make it smaller because that's what they do. That's what they get influenced to do, because a lot of their funders are people who don't want government to do as much so the private sector can come in and charge a whole lot more for all of the services that were that that are essential to people in this country. You know, Daniel, the stuff that you just have been saying is music to the ears of, of our listeners. I, I know, I know it, they're just loving it now, and they're probably sitting there with their jaws agape and saying, where, where'd you find this guy? And, and I didn't really talk at all about that. It, it just all of a sudden, you know, we're introducing you out of the blue. But you're the, the vice mayor of Culver City, one of the, the biggest uh, cities in the district. Can, can you tell us how the work that you're doing uh, on the city council there and in the uh, in the Culver City government, how that that's um, preparing you to be a member of Congress, and and how people can look at the job that you've done there and say, yeah, this is the guy that I want to see representing me in the U.S. Congress. Sure, and I'll I'll try to be brief, and you let me know if um, you wanted me to talk about something specific that I didn't. Go on as long as you want. People are meeting you for the first time. We want them to get an idea of who you are. Sure, sure. So I I have worked with a lot of different groups in terms of organizing in Los Angeles County for quite some time. Uh, prior to being elected to the Culver City Council, the biggest issue for me was closing down the Inglewood oil field, uh, which is the largest urban oil field in the United States. Uh, it's an oil field that's surrounded by millions of people. Millions of people live within about five miles of this oil field. A lot of them in Culver City, a lot of them in Ladera Heights. Uh, most of the communities are actually uh, ethnic. A lot of them are weirdly, and this is sort of a nuance, but like weirdly affluent ethnic communities, but ethnic 
nonetheless. Uh, and it's one of the reasons, and it's one of the stories about Los Angeles that people don't really talk about. This is an oil town. People think Los Angeles is Hollywood, uh, but you know, our biggest industry is really like importing, exporting, you know, that's why we have the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of San Pedro. Um, but then again, on the other hand, this is an oil town. Like if you look up where there are oil derricks or refineries or anything like that across Los Angeles County, you will find them everywhere. You'll find them close to Beverly Hills High School, to parks in Beverly Hills, places in Culver City, places in Van Nuys, places in Long Beach. Uh, this is what Los Angeles was actually built on long before Hollywood actually, you know, became this economic force. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that I was prepared, propelled to city council here in Culver City. And one of the things that we did that I'm very proud about is that we, we basically voted to close down the Inglewood oil field and Culver City because it was a non-conforming use and we had some legal backup. But as a result, Los Angeles County, a couple of weeks after we voted to close it down in our you know, semi-final vote, I feel like I've taken seven votes because of the way city councils work. Uh, Los Angeles County voted to phase out neighborhood oil drilling in the county. That's a huge thing. We're waiting for LA City uh, to follow up and to really join us but that's a that was a propelling factor for me and that's one of the things that i think is one of my wins and one of our wins as a council another what do you thing up that against well, uh, this i find this really interesting because when you drive from lax into los angeles you pass all these oil wells what kind of how many gallons of oil are we talking about and what are you up against in terms of taking on the the frackers and the oil companies what kind of lobbying were they doing so i'm not sure about like uh, the amount of gallons but the oil field is almost 100 years old uh it's been operating for a long time uh in the last 10 or 15 years it's been owned by like four or five operators exxon mobil was one of the owners like 15 years ago um but in terms of opposition one of the things that i've had to push back in specifically is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, and that's the thing that people talk about and they get union support. When they when you talk about phasing out coal, coal plants or oil operations, uh, we, as part of our provision for closing the Inglewood oil field, we added a provision for a just transition so that we could help transition workers who work in dirty fuel industries into other union jobs. For a while there, there was much more of a focus on uh, really transferring them from like a union fuel job to a union clean energy job. But to be frank, the clean energy sector is not as unionized as the, you know, dirty energy sector. So I pushed and I continue to push for us to just transition them to a union job. And there's a housing crisis in Los Angeles. It's shared by um, a lot of California and a hell of a lot of the country as well, we can transition those folks who know how to work on things like pipes, who know how to build things, who, who have, you know, a variety of skills within specific trades to jobs that are union, they don't have to be clean energy sector. If people want to move into those, that's, that's good. But otherwise, no. And I, I reached out both to IBEW, uh, Local 11, which is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and to uh, the building trades. And I told them, hey, look, we're going to do this. If you want to focus on something, focus on what we do that would benefit your people. Uh, focus on the just transition aspect of this. Because I tell people over and over again, people think you know we're going to phase out fossil fuels in like a gradual way. But I tell them, look, look at the Industrial Revolution. Look at the emergence of automation in the factory sector in the 20th century. Look at the impending revolution that's going to come from artificial intelligence. Uh, it's going to be a cliff. It's not going to be gradual. So your workers at some point will be out of a job if you don't work to train them in clean energy technology and construction and fiber optics and a variety of fields that are unionized, 
right now. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important. But in Culver City, we've all also passed rent control for the first time uh, in the city. The city has not ever had rent control. I'm the only renter on the council. I think I might be the only renter that's ever existed on the council. Uh, we toughened our polystyrene ban. We passed a, an apology for our city's history of racism. And as a provision of that, uh, we included uh, I feel like I'm using provision too much, which is why I'm delaying, but we, we included a provision for reparations. So reparations in the form of housing, because Culver City is one of the places that has been the most redlined uh, in Los Angeles County. Uh, so we want to try to address that through housing policy. And in terms of reparations, we're one of two cities in the entire country that's passed a reparations bill. Additionally, we passed a uh, hero pay for hospital workers. Uh, a lot of cities thought about it in California, but we're the only city in California that's actually done that. Uh, and we're- Sony of, headquartered in Culver City. Sony headquarters is in Culver City. Do they uh, plead poverty? Sony has actually been a fairly good partner. Um, do they create jobs, good jobs over at Sony? And, and do they add to the tax base? They do. They do. Sony has been a good partner, not only in the context of the tax base that they add, but also in terms of their contribution, both to city events and school board events. They could do a hell of a lot more than they do, um, but they have been a, a good partner. One of the things that we're facing and one of the things that I want to actually uh, tackle in Congress is Sony's here. The headquarters of TikTok uh, in the U.S. is here. Apple Studios finished their building, so their production headquarters is here, and Amazon Studios is done with their building. So, are you paying them to? Do you give them tax credits to build there? No, none. None of that has happened. No, no. They came in of their own accord. Culver City is very historic in the film community. Of course, you know, Gone with the Wind was filmed here. Very other, various other films that are important in the context of film history. My undergrad is in film. Uh, filmed here in Culver City, you know, before Hollywood was Hollywood, people were shooting in Culver City primarily. Uh, so some of the new media companies see it as a way for them to have more legitimacy. What I'm working towards now is trying to see what we can get Sony, Apple, and Amazon to do about housing. Because when a trillion dollar company moves in, and Apple and Amazon have been trillion dollar companies, when they move in, People get scared. They're like, am I going to still be able to live here in a year, two years, five years? So we've been pushing on to Amazon and Apple to see if they could actually build housing. Even if they build housing just for their employees, that would hate that would so help. They pay pay their fair share of taxes. Because of uh, uh, Prop 13, they do not. Uh, Prop 13 was a, a property tax bill passed in the late 70s and went into effect in the early 80s in California. Uh, so our property tax has been sort of restricted, you know, since that time. So while they do participate in community, they participate on a voluntary level. Their taxes are nowhere near as high as they should be. Uh, if I and I've brought this up a number of times and uh, one of our uh one of our more active residents brings it up and I try to confer with uh, my colleagues, but they don't seem interested. I would be very interested in a large corporation's tax because Apple and Amazon have been valued at a trillion dollars within the last few years. Um, I know a lot of places where they have offices are probably thinking the same thing, but I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Like if we're going to provide for our people here and there's a company that, you know, for whom a million dollars or two million dollars or five million dollars really doesn't matter. They could probably make it back in a day, a day and a half, if not four or five hours. Uh, we should really consider a large corporation tax, which is why I was really. Uh, well, what about Howie? 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 How are you on time? Can you go longer tonight? Uh, uh, no, I can't. But Daniel probably can. OK, then can you go a little longer, Daniel? Sure, sure. I have some time. Okay. I, have to... I have some more questions, but let Howie. Uh, no, no, go, go right ahead, David. That's all right. No, 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 you go. No, no, I, 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 please, Howie, please. Okay. So, uh, so Daniel, Daniel and I haven't, haven't met in person yet. We're going to be meeting, uh, in a few days. We're going to be having dinner together, 
but he he's working on a uh, an introduction to uh, to uh, Blue America members and Down with Tyranny readers that uh, I'm very very excited about. Uh, and uh, the tentative title I don't I don't want to give too much away, but the tentative uh, title for this uh, piece is um, Beyond Bernie Sanders. And 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 the reason that it's beyond Bernie Sanders is because, uh, well, actually, Daniel, why don't you explain instead of me explain wh- why uh, why we came up with that title beyond Bernie Sanders? Sure, sure, happy to. Uh, for me, like I became a Bernie Sanders fan, and uh, I became more knowledgeable of him when he did his filibuster, I believe, in uh, 2010, 2011. Um, but I believe like a lot of the organizing for younger progressive folks has been focused on him. And a lot of the people um, who are really passionate have not really grasped his message. You know, not me, us. Uh, our campaign slogan is it's up to us. Because I, while I do feel like I have great ideas, um, as I sort of explicate in this piece, a lot of the ideas that people like to characterize as radical or like asking for too much have existed in other countries for many decades. Uh, some have existed for over 100 years. The first social uh, social um, health insurance program was was uh, enacted in Germany in like 19, 1887 or 89. Uh, these are not new ideas. These are not ideas that haven't been tested. These are ideas that are old. These are ideas that actually, frankly, could be improved upon. Uh, but in America, we are behind the curve. We are behind the curve of acknowledging people's humanity in a way that says, yeah, you should not go into debt if you're sick. Yeah, you should not spend 50 to 70 percent of your monthly income, however you get that, on housing. That should be a basic understanding. Paid leave for women and men and non-binary folks should be the standard. Universal pre-K, which I'm glad to see has not dropped off the list yet, should be the standard. But also, and one of the things that I hear from a lot of young families, universal child care. I actually hear that child care is much more, especially in California. It's much more expensive than their rent or their mortgage. There are a lot of things that we allow to be characterized in the media, slash the media characterizes them that way. We don't like give consent. Uh, they they are characterized as, you know, asking for a handout, like we don't pay taxes. They're characterized as asking for something for free when we give huge tax breaks to the richest people in the world, like Elon Musk uh, and Jeff Bezos. We need to get over that. We need to get over that and start iterating newer ideas that adapt to the 21st century. Something like access to universal internet should be a standard. There should not have been kids very early on in the pandemic going to places like Starbucks or McDonald's or Burger King and sitting in the parking lot just so they could have internet access so that they could actually go to school. Everyone should have have broadband broadband internet access. That should be a standard. But really the focus of this, the piece is to characterize the things that Bernie Sanders has pushed in the last few years as no brainers. They are not things that are controversial. They are things that recognize the humanity of everyone. And I think we can do much, much more than that if we challenge ourselves to really push back uh, much more passionately on their characterization as, you know, radical. You know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have to jump off in a second. I'll I'll leave you with David, but I just want to say something before I before I go, which is that I, I think a lot of the people who are listening right now are uh, very excited uh, about the idea of Daniel getting into Congress. There aren't a, there's not a candidate like Daniel in every district. There are very very few few people anything like Daniel. We 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 don't have many in in Congress. We don't have many running for Congress. There were six who stood up on Friday and said no, only six. Daniel would have been the seventh. There aren't a lot of people like Daniel. 
Daniel is going to can win this um, this race and go to Congress and represent everybody, not just people in his district, but the whole country. The same way that Jamal Bowman represents the whole country, the same way that Rashida Tlaib represents the whole country. We need we need to get behind a, a candidate like Daniel when there aren't that many of them. It's important. So usually I ask people to go to um, a, Blue, a Blue America page, the Blue America page, and in a week or two you'll be able to do that. But for right now, <clears throat> there's, there's also a page that I use before we officially endorse candidates where, where we can raise money for candidates. And Daniel is one of the only, um, the only candidates who's on that page. And that's the, uh, the Down With Tyranny page. So that's the name of my blog is Down With Tyranny. And if you go to Act Blue and look up Down With Tyranny, you'll get, to, uh, you'll get to a page where you can donate to Daniel or you can go to Daniel's own website and donate to him there. It's really important that you do. Even if it's five or 10 or $20, uh, that's how grassroots campaigns work. Daniel's not going to be getting money from the oil companies. You just heard what he had to say about the oil companies. They're not going to donate to him. In fact, they'll probably donate to anyone who runs against him. They don't want people like him in Congress. He represents us, not them. So whatever you can give, whatever you can give is would be really appreciated by me, by David, and by Daniel. So please do. There's no such thing as a contribution that's too small. And with that, David, I'm going to leave uh, Daniel with you. Thank you, Howie. Uh, Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC. Read him over at Down With Tyranny. We didn't get a postmortem on Tuesday's elections. We'll do it next week. The best way to thank Howie Klein is to go to his website and give money to Daniel. To be continued, Howie, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And see you, see you on Saturday, uh, Daniel. See you then. Thank you. We're talking with uh, Dr. Daniel Wayne Lee. He is vice mayor of Culver City, California. And go to DanielWayneLee.com and give him money. I'm going to ask you two hard questions that I ask every candidate who, who comes on the show. Uh, the first one is... Are you for Medicare for all? And then there's a follow up. I'm definitely for Medicare for all. I usually just like to state that uh, it should include dental, hearing and vision. Right. This is the tough question I ask. Do you support getting rid of health insurance companies? I do. Putting that business. I do. And I and I feel like, you know, one of the big conversations is uh, around using some of the existing infrastructure for some healthcare companies to allow, you know, some type of transition period. I'm not sure if I'm in favor of that, but I feel like that might be uh, an interesting compromise. Uh, to right. some degree, I myself actually have a number of uh, chronic pain conditions. And anytime I have to have you know, a procedure or a test or whatever, it has to be approved by an insurance company. I think that should be your doctor's decision. Like right. you and your doctor should talk about that. Um, we don't need insurance companies if we have universal health care. If we take care of the health of everyone in our country to include residents, to include immigrants, to include people who might be here uh, traveling uh, as tourists, uh, then we have no need whatsoever for insurance companies. And of course, they are not huge fans of me. Right. You didn't mention, we didn't mention that you're a veteran. Yes. Uh, you served in Iraq? I, I did not. I did not. I served during the time we were in Iraq. I was lucky. Uh, I was in the Air Force. Uh, we actually right. declared war on Iraq when I was in basic training. So a lot of us were paranoid that we would be there soon. Right. Um, my unit did not end up being sent. It's partially because my specialty when I was in the Air Force is SATCOM, wideband telemetry and space systems. Um, and we used to collaborate with the Army and the Marines, uh, but now they actually do that job themselves. So there was less of a need for my particular specialty. So Ronald Reagan told us that he served in World War II. Where did he serve? He served in Culver City, processing <laughs> film. But he would talk about his service. He described 
liberating the concentration camps. He was in Culver City. He liberated film, yeah. literally, of the concentration camps. And he told the lie so often that he believed, he, it. Yeah. He believed it. So this is my one tough question. And uh, did the Taliban attack the United States on 9-11? That that is uh, sort of a difficult question. It was more of, um, I would say, from what we know, um, an organized group of people uh, in um, in coordination with Osama bin Laden, um, who more or less responded uh, to some degree, and I don't want to let them off nicely, but they responded, they responded to. to U.S. foreign policy. Um, a lot of the policy that we have precipitates um, these responses that might seem untoward. But if we go to places like Afghanistan, if we go to places like Yemen and Somalia, if we go to places where there are drones basically dropping bombs on people that we haven't declared war on, we can understand a bit more uh, why an attack was motivated. Um, we were attacked, yes, on 9-11, um, but what we don't talk about more is how our foreign policy precipitated that. We don't talk about it in the context of immigration either. You know, We talk about our Southern border, but we don't talk about the policies that we push and the corporations that we push in, um, in areas in South America that make it so people have to migrate. Uh, we're seeing the beginning of climate wars, uh, wars around natural resources, mostly water, but also other things. Um, and a lot of things, a lot of things don't have the type of deep analysis that they need to have in order for us to have well-informed foreign policy. So while we were attacked, um, there was a lot of things that were leading up to it. And there's a lot of information that we had, President's Daily Briefing, um, many, 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 many days, many weeks, uh, maybe even a year. I think there might have been something sh shortly after uh, George W. Bush was elected that told us uh, that the Taliban would like attack, like to attack in the United States. Um, I don't want so to get... If you, I'm going to push back on this. Are the Taliban and Al-Qaeda synonymous? No. Uh, the Taliban did Afghanistan, did Afghanistan attack the United States on 9-11? Afghanistan did not. Uh, and did the Taliban order the strike on 9-11? It was more of an Al-Qaeda thing, but I think it gets into a very gray area there because I feel like, and, you know, I can be better informed on this, but I feel like there is a, a degree of gray area, at least in the way that we have characterized things with the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, I think to some degree, uh, there is organization amongst a small cell um, with a plan in mind. Uh, they carried it out. But the Taliban, by and large, is concerned with Afghanistan. The Taliban, by and large, who was, who was more responsible for 9-11, Pakistan or Afghanistan? That's a difficult question. I'm not sure if I can answer explicitly, because as we saw to some degree when, you know, the Osama bin Laden raid happened, uh, there are a lot of stories that came out around that time. about. It's a rude question to ask, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful because you served our country. But it is my humble opinion that when General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testifies two months ago and says that the Taliban have taken over Afghanistan, we have to keep an eye on them so they don't attack us again like they did on 9-11, he's doing a disservice, first off, to the people of Afghanistan, and then secondly, to our troops and to our national security, when, as I understand it, we were not attacked by Afghanistan. We spent 20 years fighting in Afghanistan, fighting people who had nothing to do with 9-11. And it's a lie 
that is told over and over again, and it's disrespectful to our troops, it's disrespectful to the American people, and it, it allows more troops to be, if they can get away with this lie, then they can create more lies. Did Saddam Hussein attack us on 9-11? Of course not. And I, and I feel like, you know, it's a broader conversation around. I'm not trying to be disrespectful or rude. No, 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 it, I, no I, just, I, and I, I understand. I also understand that people in the military, people who are veterans. <sighs> I, I went there. There was a period and I think you might resonate with it, this. There was a it's period difficult for people who are in the military to come clean with themselves and the American people that the war in Afghanistan was a 20 year lie. The same way Iraq was a lie, the war in Afghanistan was a lie. It's a painful reckoning. But until we do that, especially, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful because you served. And, but until the military will admit that Afghanistan was a lie, a 20 year lie that the Taliban did not attack us. It was Al Qaeda, maybe working. I mean, bin Laden was killed in Pakistan and he was from Saudi Arabia. Well, well, Mullah, well, well, Mullah Omar did not want the United States to invade Afghanistan. And until we as Americans say this was a 20 year lie in Afghanistan, and a 15 year lie in Iraq, we will keep doing this over and over and over again. And we will exploit more and more of our own troops. The point, I would, do, the, the point I would like to make is, yeah. and the point I was uh, uh, trying to make is like- and I uh, apologize if I'm being disrespectful to you. No, uh, no, I'm not no trying worries, to. No worries, no worries on that. But like the point I was trying to make is, when Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan, there are a lot of stories that came out where it was more or less an open secret. Like, you know, everybody knew that's where he was. Like, everybody knew that he was there. And it was an open secret that there were certain factions within the Pakistani government and in other uh, parties that weren't like in power at the time, but in Pakistan who were, you know, openly supporting them. And a lot of uh, our US foreign policy is obviously um, motivated by money. That's one of the reasons why, you know, um, with with Khashoggi in uh, Saudi Arabia and the Crown Prince, we've basically been sort of limp-fisted in, in terms of our reaction. If that was, you know, anybody who's supposedly on our list, if that was like North Korea, you know, we would have been bombing them for like two years by now or three years. Um, I think there needs to be a reckoning in terms of foreign policy with the American people, because there are a lot of us who are characterized as, you know, crazy lefties who basically say, hey, we should not fight any more wars for profit. We should not allow people to convince us to get into wars, no matter how eloquent they are. You know, uh, Colin Powell could give a good speech, but he also talked about, you know, WMDs and all of this hidden stuff that did not exist did not exist right. and most of the crimes that people held up to justify going into iraq had happened a long time ago and of course there's the fact that you know we were actively arming the taliban you know in the late 70s early 80s uh that was that was american foreign policy a lot of the so-called uh conflagrations that we have and uh, the enemies that we have around the world were produced by us they were produced because we were intervening on the part of corporations and the military industrial complex. They were produced because that's been our foreign policy for most of the history of this country. And we don't actually talk about that. So right. while there were uh, groups of people who had connections to Afghanistan, who might have been involved in, you know, 9-11, like you said, people, a lot of people came from Saudi Arabia. A lot of them were trained in Saudi Arabia. And we don't push back on that and we don't try to hold Saudi Arabia to account because there's so much money involved. That is it. 
it's depressing to hear, but it's true. It's about money. Right. Daniel Wayne Lee is running for Karen Bass's seat in Congress. Uh, we think it's going to be the 37th congressional district. We'll know uh, in a couple of days. Go to DanielWayneLee.com. Please give him money. He's endorsed by me and Howie Klein, more importantly by Howie Klein. So that's all you need to know. Give him money. You do not take corporate donations. We do not take corporate donations. We don't take donations from fossil fuel companies or developers. Um, we don't take money from corporate PACs. Progressive PACs, we do. Um, but uh, yeah, we're trying to run a completely clean uh, grassroots campaign uh, fueled by people who are passionate about, you know, really showing an empathetic and humanitarian side, uh, both for domestic policy and foreign policy. Los Angeles, every time I talk to people in Los Angeles, they say the homelessness is astounding. And you in your campaign talk about having a home is a basic human right. Yes. Uh, the head of DreamWorks, Jeffrey Katzenberg, got to meet with all the powerful people in Los Angeles to get to the bottom of homelessness. And if I had him on the show, I would say, look in the mirror. Who, who is to blame for homelessness in Los Angeles? I think it's a lot of us elected officials and policymakers, uh, frankly, but specifically, but specifically who's to blame in Los Angeles city. I think a number of the members of their city council, obviously to blame. Uh, and I would say the who's last paying the who's donating money to who are the people who are giving money to the LA city council to keep homelessness going. Who's to blame? It's affluent people like Jeffrey Kratzenberg, but then it's also people like the police unions uh, that actually hold a lot of power and a lot of sway, not just in Los Angeles, but in cities around California, oh, yeah. around the country. Um, but why are there no homes for these people? We're told it's a mental health issue. Well, if you live on the streets, that's going to create mental health issues. If you have if you have public housing that's livable you're you're you may have met we all have mental health issues but it won't be as pronounced because you have a place to live so what is preventing los angeles from building affordable and free housing for the people of los angeles what's keeping the city from building these homes these these buildings it's very hard to track, but it, I, I tell people the fossil fuel lobby is big in California. Uh, the healthcare lobby is big in California, but I feel like the real estate lobby is the largest lobby in California. And uh, for the most part, if you've been in Los Angeles in the last 15 to 20 years, you know, downtown LA used to be sort of a ghost town after five o'clock, people in work. There are a couple bars open, but most people are gone. And there were some homeless people, but there weren't nearly as many as there are now. Now, all of the land that was there and all of the old historic buildings that were there, instead of being used for SRO housing or homeless housing, is luxury housing. And I, I have fights and I'm, you know, well, I need to leave for our council meeting in about 10 minutes, but I have yeah. fights with my colleagues uh, because they believe any housing at all is going to help because you know it's going to drive the price down and the market and this and that and for me i'm like the people who are feeling it the worst don't have time to wait on the fucking market to make things livable for them they need housing now they should be our priority there what is the best interest if, if you're a real if you're a real estate magnate and you can control la city council you can control the market what do you want? You want rents to be high. Is that correct? You want rents to be high and then you want to create condos and housing developments uh, that, that are expensive. You want to make it so at l that the average resident of Los Angeles is paying one third to half their income on housing, right? 
Exactly. And like in when people mention what you just said, which is the housing burden, uh, you know, it's usually 30 percent or above. I push back a little bit because I know people at a number of different income levels in Los Angeles County who are paying 50 to 70 percent of their monthly income on housing. And they have very little to do anything else. When people talk about saving and poor people just needing to save, and it's like, well, what do you save? One dollar a month? Like, because there is not much left. You don't just have to pay for housing. You have to pay for food. You have to pay for health insurance since we don't have single payer health care. Since our assembly members and state senators, you know, say the right thing, but they drag their feet. It's expensive to be poor. It's super expensive to be poor in Los Angeles. And there are so many people who are on the precipice of being in unstable housing and possibly being unhoused. And that should be what we're focusing on, not building more luxury housing, but building housing that people can afford or that we can put unhoused people in for no charge as quickly as possible. I want to be uh, I know you have to leave. Why can't the city of Los Angeles build low income or free housing. They used to do that. That used to be something cities did, not partnering up with realtors, private public partnerships, but just public housing. We used to do that in this country. What would be more efficient? What would be more bang for our buck? Spending tax dollars on public housing that are that's built and run by the government or partnering up with a realtor what's more what what where do you get more bang for the buck well i'm a huge advocate of uh public housing of government built housing but also of community land trust uh that are held in private hands but private hands in the community so that there's permanent affordability the problem with these public private partnerships is there are affordability covenants that usually last 10 or 15 years some of the good ones last 50 years but then things become market rate uh, and people are set aside there's article 34 of the california constitution basically says that no government can build public housing in the state without first having a referendum of the people um, and, you know, there are some positive signs in the last few years. L.A. County and L.A. City passed uh, Measure HHH and Measure H, what was supposedly uh, designed to facilitate the building of more housing. Almost every council member has had a super difficult time actually building it. Some, I don't know if they've had a difficult time. Some, they, some just basically didn't want to do it. Um, La- but- last question. La- last question. The infrastructure bill, $55 billion towards broadband. You were talking about universal internet and broadband. Why can't the city provide broadband and compete with Spectrum, AT&T, and Verizon? Is the 50 some odd billion dollars on expanding broadband, isn't that just a transfer of wealth to the internet companies? There, I, I, I think it was on either ProPublica or um, a couple different groups that were advocating for net neutrality. There was a huge push a few years ago for public internet, for public, fast, free, available internet. The telecom companies effectively lobbied legislators, both at the state, uh, county, and local level, to squash it. There was a point where almost every major city in the country was considering having municipal broadband, which would have been incredibly competitive. You could still pay more to get like slightly faster broadband from a private company, but it would have driven a lot of these companies out of business to some degree. Because if you look at the speed of our broadband compared to countries like England, especially compared to like South South Korea or Japan, we don't not just not just for like a home internet but also cell phone we pay way too much and we get way too little uh if we actually did have municipal broadband or some type of state or federal program where we just made sure that the internet was available widely available to everyone who needed it no matter where they were uh, then these companies would exist or their profits would be reduced. And that's why they lobbied so hard to kill municipal broadband. I was looking forward to bringing something similar to Culver City because we have slow broadband 
downtown near uh, our city hall. Uh, but you know, we are a small city. We could cover the entire length of our city for not much money, uh, but the telecoms, you know, they pay state legislators, they pay federal legislators, they pay city council members and sort of sideways ways that are hard to track to not bring these type of proposals forward. And there was a concerted effort, you know, with AT&T and Verizon in particular to kill municipal broadband, uh, something that, you know, should be like telephone service. It should be like water. It should be something that, you know, it, it's something that you need to exist in the 21st century. And it's not something that should, you know, break your bank or cause you to have to make a decision about paying for broadband or paying for, you know, food for your kids. Uh, it's You're the mayor of Culver City. You have to get to your meeting. So I'm going to cut you off. You're the vice mayor of Culver City. There's a meeting. Please come back. You're, I, 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 I'm going to do everything I can to help get you elected to Congress. You're, you're fantastic. DanielWayneLee.com. Will you come back, please? Definitely. Anytime you like. Thank you. Go and I'll plug away. Uh, I don't want you to be late and end up uh, blaming me. Thank you, Dr. Lee. We haven't even touched on the doctor yet. Go to DanielWayneLee.com. W-A-Y-N-E Lee, that's two E's, DanielWayneLee.com, and give him money. The primaries are in June of 2022. It's sooner than you think. It's sooner. The midterms start January 1st. Look at the calendar. So he's going to be in the heat of it, and he's endorsed by Howie Klein. Thank you for taking time to be with us, and I look forward to seeing you in Washington. Thank you for having me, and I uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Yes, please come back. Thank you. Everybody go to DanielWayneLee.com. That's DanielWayneLee.com. When we come back, my old friend, Johnny Russ, will join us. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, DavidFeldmanShow.com. Friend me on, how does it go? Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. And if you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience, go to my website and sign up. We're going to take calls from the listeners. Uh, oh, John, I didn't get to you. I apologize. John Hayes. When we come back, we will talk to the brilliant Mr. John Ross. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics a comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Please go to danielwaynelee.com and donate what you can. $5 makes all the difference in the world. You'd be amazed. Let us now go to Deerfield, Massachusetts, where 
comedy writing legend and gentleman farmer John Ross is standing by. Hello, John. Where's my video? I don't know. I hit I hit, I hit start video, but I don't see anything. You see anything? I don't see anything. Uh, let's should I stop let's it see. and start it, or should I? I think let's see. Uh, stop video. I'll, I'll stop the video, and now I'll start the video. Oh, and start my video. Now I have a little thing I can click. I come come on, you can do it. I clicked it. Nothing's happening. Should I rejoin? You could rejoin. You is is there a cap over your lens? <laughs> Aren't you funny? Or, or uh, go to go to preferences. Wait, what? Go to preferences? Yeah. In Zoom. Zoom. Go to your Zoom preferences and tell me what video says. Oh, 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 oh I was in my Mac preferences. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But what 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 does your Zoom preference say? Wait a minute. I have to prefer to be doing Joe Rogan's show instead of David Feldman. Zoom preferences say uh, where video. You want me to hit the video thing? That's also says what? That's also says what? What you just said. <laughs> Someone has a kid. Um, so well, I don't know what to hit here. It says video. Well, wait, okay, so if you go to Zoom, and you yeah. go to the preferences, right? And, and drop that to general. Go to video. video. What uh, does camera say? FaceTime HD camera built in. All right. I think I should and get out of here and re come back. Re come back. All right. We'll be here. I, I'm going to reanimate. You're going to reanimate, and we will do. We will do community billboard. Oh, shit. All right. Sorry, folks. No, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. You should pull his thumb out of his a, shutter. Let's go to a pretentious douchebag somewhere in upstate New York. Hello, pretentious douchebag. How are you doing, Jack officer? Very good. You're looking well. Oh, Thank you. you. Thank you for... Uh... So how's John Ross? Have you seen him lately? Oh, yeah. I saw him. He was uh, standing around an empty food court. Uh, most moisturizing his elbows for half an hour. <laughs> we have to get uh, Mike Rowe on again. I, I haven't had time to, uh, you know, we've been so busy with the midterms, not the midterms. What did, what did we call these elections? I can't remember, but they're yeah. over. Uh, great office hours and hours. Oh, we had a great one. Yeah, for sure. And you had to leave early, right? I had to leave early for uh, towards the beginning of the of the uh, event, but I showed up at the end. And I remember the uh, the two major history podcasts were going at each other. Oh my God! What you, it, this is getting really ugly. As you know, yep. Arjun, Arjun hosts what podcast? Deep into history. Professor Adnan Hussein and Henry Huckamaki have a podcast. What's that called? What's that called? That is called Gorilla History. That's Gorilla History, but I was thinking because of Brett O'Shea is also yes. one of the hosts. Yes. And it's getting ugly. It got really ugly. Team Gorilla History versus Team Deep Into History at office hours and hours. People are choosing sides. And, and I've said, hey, there's, there's room for both. But, you know, the American people want competition. They want to see Arjun going up against Professor Hussein and Henry Huckamaki. And the American people want blood. And it's getting, it got really ugly, uh, the fighting between yeah. Team was, Guerrilla History and Team Deep Into History. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a peacemaker. But it was after all of his hours and hours. It was past eight o'clock so we're officially past the ending point and our arjun started it all and yeah. he said those guys are a bunch of hacks right and Ed, ednam was there and he said arjun uh, arjun's ears look funny yeah. and uh, some asshole said uh it's not very difficult to tell people what Maybe already happened really you said <laughs> you said anybody can tell you what happened 
<laughs> yeah, it's not that hard. <laughs> so, so we're going to launch our own podcast called Gorilla Future and Deep Into the Future. That was so funny when you said that. <laughs> well, let's talk about our community and uh, I would say Gorilla History and Deep Into History is part of our community, right? Well, yeah, I sent you some pictures a few minutes ago and I have a, a couple of things here. Uh, this coming Saturday, November 13th at 4.30 Eastern Time, Valley of Oxidator honors Gratitude Month by celebrating solidarity with a screening of the 1952 film Salt of the Earth with special guest Professor Marianne Cummings. Oh, we know her. We, yes, yes. Uh, in the film, Mexican-American workers at New Mexico's Empire uh, Zinc Mine protest the unsafe work conditions and unequal wages compared to their Anglo counterparts. When an injunction stops the men from pro protesting, however, gender roles are reversed and women find themselves on the picket lines while the men stay at home. So you can get tickets to that by uh, going to get the free Zoom link uh, at Valley Vox at Twitter or uh, email them at valleyvoxtheater at gmail.com and theater is spelled with R-E at the end. Okay. This is, uh, I hope I don't crash. Hang on. Uh, this is from last week. That's from last week. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Uh, what was the name of the file? I put a date in it so it's obvious. November 8th. Oh, yeah. That's the one. Okay. Here we go. Oh, okay. Garlic. Garlic. This is from uh, Glenn. He is planting these with his... Uh, his new uh, pointy dibble, which I've never heard of this tool before. Hmm. Well, but, we'll use it. And does he make the garlic? Yeah, he grew the garlic, and you plant the, the individual cloves, and then you get garlic next year. And hmm. I still think that's a threat towards you, and it's an, an attack, because he knows you don't like garlic, so that's why he keeps posting that. Okay. John Ross is coming up in three minutes. And we're we're on time. Get it out. I'm back. Okay. Okay. This is uh, Tom Weber. What is this? This is the old man winter blowing. And, watch uh, it. Watch it. Watch it. Wasn't that your nickname back in the late 2000 <laughs> teens? <laughs> and where can we where can we buy this? <laughs> This is a pen drawing of the mythic figure of Old Man Winter blowing his chill upon the earth, digital color and highlights added uh, on his iPad. And you can uh, find this and many, many other artistic works at TomWeberArt.com. And speaking of blowing. Whoa. Joseph Brinton Jewelry. If, if you want to have relations, you need to give people gifts before, during, and after, where do you go? You go to josephbrintonjewelry.com where right. he makes his own jewelry from scratch. He, he makes them himself. They're beautiful. fantastic. Really beautiful. And our friend, look at that. She's, a, she's so great. Yep. So this is uh, Kristen Calabrese, otherwise known as Chartreuse in the Beldo community. Uh, there's an, a gallery going on in L.A. called AF Projects. And this painting uh, is called It's an Illusion. Hmm. And she says, this painting is of the White Oak Stairs at the Art and Craft Museum on Wilshire. And hmm. she says, I painted them looking head on, collapsing any outline that would make it obvious that they're stairs. I think that if you get close to the painting, the perspective of the steps reveals itself and the white spots on the painting are actually unpainted areas. And she was thinking about the past and present disappearing as we climb the stairs into the future. Fantastic. It's awesome. So the hours on those on the, uh, on the show are uh, 11 to five Tuesday through Saturday. And the show runs through the 21st. And that is at uh, 7503 West Sunset Boulevard in uh, Los Angeles. And the website is www.afprojects.com. She's amazing. 
She's absolutely amazing. It's fantastic. Truly. She sent me a few a few new uh, pictures of other paintings, and I was going to throw up the the picture of the sink again with the uh, with the eggs because that oh. that's the most fascinating one I've seen. But she sent me a, a new batch. So right. fantastic. And there's uh, Ralph Nader's Radio Hour. Yep. Uh, the, the most recent post is Ralph welcomes uh, Miranda Massey, director of the Climate Museum and institution focused on the intersection of art, climate science, justice, and activism. And that aims to make people feel that collective act action is both possible and necessary and the only hope we have of saving the planet. And Ralph lists, uh, answers questions. And I want to, I took a screenshot of the website just to show that the uh, the Congress Club, uh, like shortened square banner off to the right that you can click to uh, to join in and participate. Excellent. How do people reach you, sir? Uh, go to dentfeldman at gmail dot com. Send me an email, and we'll uh, we'll get your shout out up. Thank you, sir. Dan Frank. Nothing gets done here without Dan Frankenberger. And, uh, <laughs> Now we're going to go on to John Ross. And the last time we saw him, yes, uh, uh, he was, he, yeah, he was standing in a casino count room, jumping up and down for half an hour. Really? Yeah. We'll have to talk to him about that. That's the that's yeah. the news. Thank you, my pretentious douchebag. Going now to Deerfield, Massachusetts, where my old friend John Ross is standing by. I want to alert the affiliates. We're running twelve minutes behind, but. We're going to do a full segment with John. Ooh, Ross. I'm giving my, I yield my 12 minutes back. No, no, no you back. don't. No, you don't. You look. How dare you? Uh -oh. I heard earlier. How dare you forget Kenny Moore's name? That's right. Kenny, Kenny Moore. I, I worked with Kenny not that long after that. I was one of the, I'm the one who came back and told everybody that story. You brought me, I was, yes, I was living in South San Francisco and you brought the clip up to and visited me. Yes. Yes, you I, did. I was the one with the tape because I worked with Kenny and got to hear the story from him. He was still serving. Okay, hang, on, let, hang on for one second. Hang on. Oh, let me, yeah. because we have people joining us and they may start from the beginning because it was mentioned earlier. Who is Kenny Moore? What is this clip? This was before YouTube. Yes, this was before YouTube. And you actually had to have a VHS. And uh, Kenny was a comedian. I, I can't remember where we were. I think Texas somewhere. Uh, and I'm working with him. And I had heard the story. And I asked him about it. And he was still serving community service. You know, he had, I don't know how many hours he had to do for this thing. <laughs> but this guy, he... You know, and you could tell he would he'd just been on the road too long. You know right. what I mean? It was it it, it built up. And right. so he's on stage and this guy is in the front and he's just jabbering and most of the crowd can't really hear it. But he's just yelling all kinds of stuff. And he plays a song and the guy says something and he says, well, where, where are you from, man? And the guy goes, Oklahoma. And he goes, oh, yeah. And he, and he goes into an Oklahoma joke. He goes, yeah, your your license plate says Oklahoma. Uh, we're it's okay, right? Because I guess the initials for the state are okay. So he goes, it's okay. He goes, yeah, you know, we're not great. We're okay. And it's like, it doesn't get a big laugh. And he, then he says, I guess, so you, I make you an Oklahoma. Right. That's the joke. That's it. Right. Because what do you, what do you, what do they call people from Oklahoma? Oklahomians, o Oklahoma. I guess you're an Oklahoma. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and the guy, like, I, I don't know how you can't tell from the video because the guy's out of frame. And so it he kind of starts to stand up like he's going to do something. And Kenny just goes and you see his that's the moment, because when we watch it like the Zabruder film, you watch this moment when his eyes go wide, but his pupils get small. <laughs> it's like a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you, you can see the white all the way around his eyes mm -hmm. and you just you can almost hear the snapping sound in his brain 
<laughs> and, and, and he and he takes the guitar off. And like you said, he holds it like a, a baseball bat. And he goes, oh, get on up here, motherfuckers. <laughs> Which is a thing we all began to say all the time. Yes, that's how I would, when I, I would introduce, when I was hosting stand-up, I'd say, Larry Brown, get on up here, motherfucker. Go, get that, on up here. That became the, a refrain that we all used to say all the time. And then he, he steps, and that's the, it's framed, because it's, you know, everybody used to just, Kenny had the tape because he was taping himself. That was the crazy thing. He, he, that's, oh, that's right. Now I remember this. One of the reasons he was so mad, he, he needed a tape of himself for a gig, like to right. get a gig. And he really wanted this gig. I don't know if it was a TV thing or something. And he, and so, but they needed it like the next day. And this guy was just fucking up his set and he needed this videotape. So that's the reason he was taping in this club in the first place. Cause and so the way it's framed, he, he goes, I'll get on up here. And then Kenny steps out of the frame. Right. And you see the guitar swing through the frame, but you don't see it make contact. But you hear that. Right. Going, <laughs> like with strings popping and wood. Uh -huh. And then when he steps back and you see the back of the guitar is gone, it's like a comedy thing. Right. And, and yeah, then he takes the guitar and like you say, all of a sudden that pick appears and it's like just muscle memory. He sticks it back in the, in the frets and the strings and he goes, and, and you can tell like he's come back to his senses. I, I just remember, I just remembered. Yes, go ahead. And he knows this isn't good. And he right. goes, what, what do you say, folks? The guy fucking came at me. And people were like, no, no. <laughs> and he goes, all right, show's over. Yeah. All and, right, show's over. And, and he walks out. And yeah, yeah, like you said, you hear the guy go, I want my money back. <laughs> and then you hear somebody else go, uh, go, did you fucking see that? Like somebody who's near the camera. Right. That was uncalled for. That was uncalled for. That's right. People right. were yelling. And, and then the MC and, bolts jumps up on the stage and goes, Hey, how you doing? Remember yeah, that? that? And then, then it cuts out. You, you know, I, the tape I have done barely has him. He walks back on stage and grabs the mic and it's kind of like, Whoa, Hey, yeah, well now what? I remember you bringing that tape over. It had to be 30 years ago. Yeah, probably. Or 28 years ago. I remember sitting and just rewinding it over and over again. And I remember our saying, the fact that he swings the guitar, as you mentioned, out of the frame. So we never see the person he's hitting. Yeah. So it's left to our imagination. We don't get to see the guy's head split open. Right. We just see the, the damage done to the guitar. It's, it's clean. It's acceptable, you know, it, 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 it's just, yeah, yeah. So is he still around, Kenny Moore? And, uh, Dennis, bought, and Dennis bought the guitar. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I, I heard that. I, I couldn't tell Just you. touch it for good luck. <laughs> I used to walk over and go, uh, just I wonder how, how much did he pay for it, do you know? I think he, he would, he, I remember he bought it. He said, it's brought me so much joy. He deserves a couple of grand for it just because it's brought me so much. He just did what we all wanted to do to an audience member. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Kenny was glad to get it. I, I mean, it wasn't worth anything to him anymore. As far as <laughs> it should be in the Smithsonian right next to Steve Martin's white suit. Right. Yeah, the, the arrow <laughs> going through the head. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the great, uh, I, I suspect Mike Carano ended up with that guitar. I'll have to reach out to him. So how are you? Are you excited about this infrastructure bill and Joe Biden and he's back? Uh, you know, I am, I don't know what the answer is and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna claim I do but it really feels to me like, you know, th this show is, there's so many brilliant people and that guy you just had on, 
uh, Daniel Wayne Lee. He's a brilliant guy. But oh, you, you're idiots in this country. They're not paying attention. They don't know any of the stuff. Like I, I feel I, you know, I talk about the ball bearing factory, right? What is the thing that is you, that you get to the heart of to win the war to that you cripple the other side? The Republicans found it, and it's it's the elections. The oh, you're, you're just as you're getting fix the elections now. What? No, you were you were frozen. Oh, oh. Uh, Unfreeze yourself. I, I'm saying th they've gone uh, unstable. Why would that be? All right. Are we oh. in my back? Are they talking about you or the internet connection? You're a little frozen. Okay, it's not me, it's you, which is how I break up with everybody. It's not me, it's you. Well, you're frozen. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for John Ru Am I back? Well, yeah, but you're kind of frozen. Am I back? Sort of. Mm. Yeah. I feel fine. Um, okay. the Keep, right, so, so, so you're saying that it's like the ball bearing factory. You have to bomb the ball bearing factory. Right. You go to the thing. What is the thing that if you stop it, nothing else can go forward? Well, the internet connection would be one of those and things. The Republicans found it. It's a, um, I, now, now I see you. Do you see me? I mean, yeah, this is, we're, this we're is embarrassing. This is like, uh, this has never happened to me before. <laughs> sure. I, sure. I swear to God, this has never happened to me. I've never had this problem. Remember Laura Keitlinger's <laughs> big uh, bit about the guy who couldn't get it up to her? Do you remember her this bit? It's so frustrating. Yeah. No. Uh, Tell me. I forgot. <laughs> I blocked it out. No, she had a bit like I was with a guy who couldn't get up, get it up for me, and I try to be caring, compassionate. And I said, "You're really sick. You should see something." I don't know, but you're frozen. I'm just my mind is elsewhere. This right, is. I'm really trying the, my other. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying the other internet. Uh, try the other the other engine. I'm trying the other engine. How's this? Am I better? Yes. Better now or now? All right. Tell is, me, is Laura Keilinger. No, no. Forget Laura Keilinger. Uh, she was great on. She was great as Albert Brooks's girlfriend on Curb Your Enthusiasm. So the ball bearing factory. Right. So elections are already like how? What percent? of the population does a Democrat need to get to vote to, in order to win a seat? Like we we got to win 60%, right? In order to, to win a seat, right? And right. now, and you need 60% of the Congress to get anything. So we really need to get 70% in order for anything. And now they're attacking all of the people who count votes Right. The, the, all the people who work in elections, those are like volunteer jobs. They're shitty jobs. These people are all being attacked. Their families are being threatened and they're quitting and they're being replaced. It's like it doesn't matter what the hell Daniel Wayne Lee says about what he, like he can't get elected because it's all fixed. Like we're going to be the ones screaming election fraud next time. Right. They have to pay us a voter law. Like, fuck the infrastructure and fuck the Britain. Like, none of that matters. It's like, I, I, I get it that he's a great guy and there's other great people running. And hey, the, it was a good night for the progressive. Fuck it all. It doesn't matter. We, I'm telling you, I said this four years ago as a joke. I don't know if you remember this. I Because when, like, Trump was so awful when he first got in and everybody was like, oh my God, I never thought I would be nostalgic for George Bush. Mm -hmm. I'm nostalgic for George Bush. And I said, you know what that means, don't you? One day we're gonna say, I can't believe I'm nostalgic for Donald Trump. <laughs> right, right. Like, I, because 
Like, yeah. They, remember when they didn't used to just execute people on the lawn of the White House? Like, <laughs> that's where we're going. And, and I'll tell you this. When democracy is dead and the autocrats take over and they start lining people up to execute them, I am going to have a lot of trouble having a lot of sympathy for Merrick Garland when it's his turn to get a bullet in his head because he's going to and it's going to be his fault because what is going on? Like he's he could bring charges, cut the head off, bring charges against Donald Trump and and Ivanka and Jared. Like he's got it all. What is going? And now this. Oh, we're getting the subpoenas. How long ago was January sixth? And now, <laughs> like these guys are going to say, you know, who's Eastman is going to come in, and what's he going to say? I refuse to answer or go fuck yourself. What? Right. Like, and we're going to go. Oh boy, we really <laughs> won that round. <laughs> what but do we need to do? find out? What happened on January sixth? Don't we need to find out what happened? Yeah. We need to find out what happened. <laughs> we need to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th. Yes. You, and who was behind it? We need to find out. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I do not watch MSNBC. I do not watch CNN. I get clippings of it. Uh, the coverage of this infrastructure bill is beyond. It, they don't talk about what was in the infrastructure bill. The Washington Post kind of did. They do, but I think even if they did, people don't pay attention. I mean, that's such a tiny fraction of the population. I mean, how is, you see Gosar today had something where he, he put on his site uh, an anime of him killing uh, AOC? No. And, and yeah, him like killing AOC. It's an anime of him. And he's like, hey, everybody, look at this. I and he's from his private account. And everybody's like, hey, that's pretty good. I like this guy. How is how does are these people elected by uh, our population? I'm I, I don't think. Yeah. Matt Gates is still roaming free. Why is that? And Gosar. Um, uh, these people are literally insane. Green, right. Obert. And there's a lot of them. And the fact that zero Republicans would vote for anything of any value, and yet we want to blame, you know, the, the Democrats. It, it's, it's a, it, there's insanity happening. I, I'm flummoxed. I'm not speaking clearly. I'm sorry. Right. So how are things up in Peeper's country? Well, you know, it's uh, there, are, there are phases. We're in the kind of bronze golden phase where everything's kind uh -huh. of turning brown. It's very beautiful. Um, so it's getting cold. I'm wearing my, my winter hat, alpaca hat, because, uh, yeah, we're getting the cold nights now. Lovely, lovely. And what are you reading? How are you relaxing? Uh, it's cozy, right? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm reading um, a Ray. By the way, I can't believe you remember that. Not only did you remember that it was Kenny Moore, but you remembered every line of it, beat sure. by beat. You didn't miss anything. That's incredible. <laughs> I own the tape. I did watch it many times because I would have to show it to everybody. I, I wouldn't let it out of my hands. I mean, you were one of the few people I allowed Hey, what happened to these tapes? Do they degrade? I have all my yes. tapes in in an attic yep. somewhere. They're going to degrade. Uh, <laughs> I went up into my attic to to get them, and I was going to go. You know, I'm going to put these on DVD, and so um, there's a place you can send them, and they'll like burn them onto. And I like took them out of the box, and I opened them up, and they like turn to powder in my hands like uh really raiders of the lost ark you know they were just like they were nothing they were turned into dust so, shit all my yeah, sad but I, it, but there's part of me it's like yeah i don't need the evidence of that yeah remember when jim Merle dug up that video of me doing stand-up in like in 1986 well it's not as bad as the one of me where uh janine hansen had me put on that makeup <laughs> And I looked like a marionette. That was more like a French whore. That's yeah. right. You look like, 
how did you survive that? Seriously, I, re I mean, I've had my humiliations, but how did you survive? This was PBS. Yeah. This was around America. We were just starting out. Everybody is going to see this. People, you went. This was the sh this was the the one show that the PBS did out of San Francisco that highlighted the San Francisco comedy scene, and it was our way of showing the people we grew up with that were making it in San Francisco. You were dressed up to look like a French prostitute. You the, you had lipstick on, rouge. You had eyeliner. It wasn't punk. It was bordello. You looked like you were working a bordello. It was, it was humiliating. It really was. It was disgraceful. And that it was, was nationwide. And I remember watching that, and I was so happy it was you and not me. And I remember thinking, he will never survive this. He will never, ever be able to put... How did you survive that? That, that, that utter humiliation? First of all, first of all <laughs> you know how, how much money I made on the way home that night? <laughs> <laughs> that took some of the sting out of it. <laughs> well, I, I, I honestly think... Did you know you were being humiliated? That's the thing is the value of back then where there was no internet and there was no video. It was hard to see. I don't think I saw a copy of it until so long after the thing even happened. I didn't even know until I saw it. When I saw it, it was it was sort of like, oh, my God, like, take that thing out. I can't watch anymore. I, I just have to forget about that. But I, I did have a great guys in that you grew up with guys in Jersey. And you're now in San Francisco. Not that there's anything wrong, but back, what, what do you sometimes wonder? Maybe a couple of friends of yours thought you went to San Francisco for something other than stand up, the way you looked. Not that there's anything wrong. Friends, friends. Huh? how about my family? How about my family? <laughs> <laughs> Brought my brought my wife home for the first time. They were like, "Oh, oh, oh, okay, okay, good. Oh, no, this is great. Right. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> wow. What for you? <laughs> was that the most humiliating thing you ever went through as a, a stand-up? You know, honestly, it was. I was not human in the moment. I had a great set. I I destroyed. And of course, I, they were they were laughing for the wrong reasons. Maybe I don't know, but I I had a great set, and I, you know, so I wasn't humiliated in the moment, you know. And then, I, like I said, I don't think it was like months later that I saw the video, and I had already kind of moved on from there. Right. So. Right. That's the great thing about stand up, is you can have a public humiliation, and you next night you kind of somehow make it to the stage and in front of 50 people you kill and it's like nothing happened you're back right it's like you, it's like being a relief pitcher you know about being a relief pitcher no you give up the game winning home run you come in with the game on the line in the ninth inning you know with the tying mm -hmm. run on second base and you give up the game winning home run to the other team and it's like you got to shrug your shoulders and go, well, coming back tomorrow night, you got to leave it behind and you got to be able to come out the next night and have confidence that you can get the strikeout of the guy and end the game and get the save. That's so, why McGraw is such a great performer. Who was his dad? Tug McGraw. You got to believe. Yeah, Tug. Now we got that nickname. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was it involved something. It was not a baseball, but it was some kind of. So. What was the greatest night of doing stand-up for you? The, 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 the greatest show where you thought, this is, you know, I'm going to... Well, gonna... you know, I probably, I probably have a truer answer than this, but this is probably a better story. Um, I, all I wanted was to be on Letterman. Right. And Bob Morton, 
Morty, Morty. was 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 booking Letterman, and uh, he had seen me a bunch of times, and he was kind of like, "You're not you're not ready. You're really more of a writer." And I was like, "No, man, I'm the real deal." <laughs> Have you heard my set? Have you heard? You've heard my jokes. I'm not a writer. And so he, you know, and he was like, "You know, you're not." not quite there he goes you, you know you'll get there and one night and this was in la at the improv and i went up and i just had the set in front of him and it was just no question about it and even he was like call me on monday it was a friday over the weekend he leaves the show <laughs> I don't know what that, remember when he left, he, he, yeah. you know, it, and it actually was, I think I called a few times and it was like, oh, he's not in. And, and eventually it was, <laughs> yeah, he's gone. He, he doesn't work here anymore. And I was, oh, are you kidding me? I was that, I, that's how undeniably great that set was. I have no choice but to quit because I'm not putting this MF on Letterman. So I'm, so I'm quitting. Where, where did he quit for? He went, did he go someplace else? You know, I, I, yes, he did. He went to some other cable late night thing or something. I think Letterman kind of wanted somebody else. So, yeah. so I remember Morty, Robert Morton came to San Francisco and Larry Brown and I realized that San Francisco for, I, this is not fair, but it was like Mayberry. People were showing up. Like we were auditioning for Morty to get on Letterman. And then other people started showing up trying to meet Morty. And I don't want to mention any names. But these weren't comedians. These were like people like Hank. And I'm going, what are you thinking? Like, why are you trying to meet Morty? I realized how small the town was. Uh, it was like a jet had landed there for the first time. Now, there's the famous story about you and the Capizios. You keep telling this story and you keep calling them Capizios. I've never owned a pair of Capizios. I had a new pair of shoes. They were Capizios. They were, I, don't, I don't even... You didn't know they were Capizios. They were Capizios. How do you know what that kind of shoes they were? Because Warren told me. Because Warren told you. Warren. They, you had bought I, I, there's, there's, there's a reliable source of information. Uh, no, and I, I, I slipped jumping onto that uh, tile stage and, and I went down and rather than make some dumb joke about it, I just went on. And, and Warren spent, I don't know, three hours the next day regaling us in the story of your public humiliation that the fact that you, <laughs> you jumped up I'm not doing it any justice, but Warren says, and he jumps up on the stage, Mr. Enthusiasm, and he slips and lands right on his ass, which is the funniest thing you can possibly do, fall on your ass, and he gets up and goes, hey, how you doing, everybody? <laughs> like you acted like it didn't happen. Are you getting pissed off? Are you getting a 30-year no, sense? I mean, you, I mean, it's the same story every time you come on. I, mean, I feel bad for the audience who's hearing it for the fifth time. No, because I'm digging up something here that makes you uncomfortable. That is, that That's is, the that difference is. between you and me. I never had, I was never humiliated in San Francisco doing comedy. Never. <laughs> Not once did I ever say or do anything on stage that would give me a, uh, did you ever just like have a complete and utter breakdown on the road where you just were? Well, I don't know if it was a breakdown but, but a guy was heckling me once and I just, I, I got, I started saying really mean things to him. And, mm -hmm. and I kept saying that I go, this isn't a joke. Like <laughs> you're a piece of shit and I'm better than you. And I, and, and like people laugh and I go, see, they're laughing, but I'm serious. <laughs> In any metric you can come up with. I'm a better person than you. I'm smarter than you. 
I'm healthier than you. <laughs> go outside, let's have a race. I'm faster than you. And, you. <laughs> and I just, I would, everything, I, I said, I have more money than you. I will always have more money than you. I said, and people were laughing and he was, he was like, all right, I've had enough. And I went, no, 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 we're going to keep going. And it, was just, it got really ugly, but it was fun. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that was maybe the closest I got to kind of snap. I didn't care how the sh- rest of the show went. I was just, I wanted that guy. Um, Did you ever punch anybody? No, 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 When's no. the last time you got into a fight, a fist fight? You play Very baseball? Good. You What's play that? baseball? I play baseball, yes. But I'm, it, baseball is, uh, a, there's not too many jerks. There's more jerks in softball, believe it or not, than baseball. Because baseball is more of a humbling game. And that ball's hard and a, a pitcher can throw it hard and he can hit you in the head with it. And so, you, uh, there, and there's more distance. The geography of baseball is more, uh, softball, like guys can hit 800. You know what I mean? Like you can go up and get a hit every time you can be, and you're right on top of the, I used to play in the entertainment league in Hollywood. Uh, and there was really a lot of assholes. And when I started playing baseball, there were a lot fewer. I, there was one guy who was on steroids that I played baseball with, and he was a little bit nuts. And I think he got thrown out of the league. What, what is to prevent a, somebody pretending the catcher is Ray Fossey and you're Pete Rose? You mean just running somebody over? Yeah. What, what stops them? That you'll get, that there's there's no collision rules. You, you do that, you're out. I, I, I There's guys who've been thrown out either for a game or two or permanently. Out of a league. What is to prevent you from thinking the catcher is Bob Fosse? <laughs> uh, Ray Fosse just died, right? Did he? I don't know. Yeah. From uh, a bad case of jazz hands, I believe. I believe Ray Fosse, he, he had to stop catching because he had jazz hands. I don't know what that means. So. It must be close to the end, right? I got to go. No, no, no. Actually, we have, to, in all honesty, we have to kill 19 minutes. We think I swear to you. I just looked at the calendar. I just saw you're scheduled for another night. I'm being serious. You did, did you know you? I didn't know you signed up. We were booked for uh, this long. Somebody booked you. I, we have 19 minutes to kill. Mm. So, so uh, here, do you watch Succession? I watch uh, the porno version, Suck Session. How long have you been told you. That? Uh, <laughs> I told you, we have 19 minutes to go. Do you watch Succession? Uh, I've seen parts of it. I, I've enjoyed it. You like Because I know you like to talk about how The Sopranos is a comedy. And right. Succession is so funny. It's unbelievably funny. It, it starts well, to why get... why don't we watch it right now? Okay. <laughs> Do we have a clip? Do we have a clip? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> So you've been watching Suck Session? Yes, and it's just, uh, it's great. It's its a really great show. Uh, it's very funny. You you understand when you realize Adam McKay and Will Ferrell exec produced it, you go, oh, now I get it. But it's it gets harder to laugh at stuff. You understand that it's funny. Oh, you got the clock up. <laughs> I'll start to... Uh, I'll start going over some of my tweets that I, uh, do you, do you so you're, that they're, they're calling uh, Donald Trump here his new nickname? No. Yam tits. <laughs> <laughs> calling him yam tits. Really? Uh, on Twitter. And I think that's, as much as I dislike the guy, I think that's disrespectful to call a former president that. So that's why I call him sweet potato bosoms. <laughs> Sweet potato bosoms. Yeah, I think that's the way grandma used to make them. Sweet potato. So we have uh, 16 minutes to go here. How how much have people donated so far? Let's (laughs) Let's go to the tote board. Tote board. (laughs) They took they took money back. We're in negative territory. And what are you reading? I told you I'm reading the 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 price. Uh, book. What's his name? Is it... Oh, the guy who wrote Clockers. Yeah. I don't love this one, but I'm reading it anyway. And uh, hang, on, hang on, let me do this right. This is going to be funny. Hang on. Okay, a little vid- visual humor for those of you 
who are listening to the podcast at home. How did you get booked for a full hour? Did you know you signed up for? No, I didn't sign up. I said, uh, your flunky, Hannah, yeah. sent yeah. me and said, can you do 8.30? And I went, mm, can you, you got anything earlier? And, and she came back and said, how about 8? And I said, well, that's certainly earlier than 8.30. And she said, well, we have, we have a TBD at 7.30. If that opens up, I'll let you know. And I said, okay, I'll be ready for 8. But a lot of TBDs on today's show, by the way. Well, nobody told me. Yeah, nobody uh, wanted to do the show today. Why don't you interview me? Why don't, why don't, but you know, I should what, have a guest. Okay. What I have, your... I should, you should be a guest. Like I should take, a lot of people say to me, why don't you take one or two years off from the show? You seem yeah. tired. So you, you be the guest host. All right. And you interview me. All right. What was your uh, greatest night of stand up, single night of stand up that you can remember the best? The single greatest night of stand up. Well, what does that mean? No, you asked me, so it was your question that I'm throwing back at you. What, what does it mean? That, uh, the first time I did Feldo the Clown at Foo Bars in front of, oh. in front of uh, Billy Jay and Steve Kravitz. And the crowd went nuts. And did you think, oh my, this is it. Like, I, this is it. I, I'm going to ride this all the way to the White House. Yes, it was a the flip side to a month earlier. I had done the comedy competition and came in last place. Mm -hmm. And a, a close friend of mine said, you are not funny. There's nothing you could do to make you funny. Even if you wore a clown suit, maybe if you wore a Bozo the Clown suit, you would be funny. So I, I don't remember who was the person who told me that. I, I, see, I'm I'm not mean. I think Billy J said that, no, and no, I think don't. I sat there, and I said I said actually, you should do that. That would be brilliant. A clown doing dry political humor, going Raymond Donovan in a clown suit, and then honking a horn. Like how great would that be? Where did you get that suit? Well, first of all, you it was your idea. And then Steve Kravitz and I were opening for Billy J at Foo Bars in Pleasanton, California for a week, suburb of San Francisco. And Steve Kravitz and I went to a costume shop and we picked out a Bozo the Clown outfit. And I went up on stage and did it. And I killed. I killed. Yeah. And I thought, this is it. I, I, I got a brand. I got a character. I'm set. And this is when people were doing characters, like Goldthwait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember you coming back from that and feeling like I knew it. I told you this was a genius <laughs> idea. And, and then it never went as well again. And I, kept never. Thinking, and I kept thinking, like, what are you doing wrong? You're fucking it up. This is a great idea and you prove that it works, but you can't repeat it. Why not? And because I, I it was not because I was still trying to do political humor and not clown stuff. Anyway, it was three, three years. Here's my three, question. Three answer, years. Answer truthfully. Yes. Do you ever have sex in the suit? Yes, I did. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yes, I did. Wow. Uh, the there were two suits, and some and uh, it, women loved the humiliation. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how humiliating it was to wear a clown suit? I think I wore it nonstop for two years, and then like the third year off and on what was Never. it like what was it like the first night out of the suit getting on stage it was in seattle i was opening for kevin rooney and he said take that shit off 
was it was it was it like uh Shawshank Redemption, like you were Morgan Freeman and you got out and you were like, I can't handle it. I got to go back in the suit. <laughs> Once I took it off, I never put it back on again. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I just like, ugh. It was, uh, yeah. How the, yeah. How the, what about wearing it for the podcast? <laughs> it's somewhere and it's in the attic and uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, I bet it still fits. I bet I I hope so. Yeah. All right. Next what about mo uh, most humiliating? It, it was it in the suit. Yeah. The uh, I would say the set <clears throat> at the comedy. <clears throat> the uh, the comedy uh, competition that <laughs> made me go get the. Uh, is that, the one, is that where the one where you open with uh, doesn't all music suck? Yes. Steve, Stephen Pearl told me to open with doesn't all music suck. And then it went downhill from there. Well, he did not tell you to. You asked, what should I open with? Which is insanity to, to be at a thing where people spend months crafting their set. And then to moments before you go on, say to a group of comedians, hey, what should I open with? And then <laughs> Stephen Pearl, who was a genius, was just trying to be funny to the other comics, thought to himself, I'll think, what is the, the worst thing anybody could say as an opening line? And if I thought for a hundred years, I wouldn't have come up with, doesn't all music suck? <laughs> well, what he originally told me to say was we should make the guy who killed John Lennon a saint. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> what about sainthood for the guy who killed John Lennon? And I looked around and everybody laughed. And what was my reaction? You, you, I remember you remembered my reaction, how desperate I was. Like, whoo, everybody's laughing. <laughs> I know. I thought, well, what? And then uh, I went, no, I can't do that. He goes, well, let's just say it doesn't all music suck. It will be edgy. So I went up and said, doesn't all music suck? And people go, no, we like music. And the, the people, most humane. It just sounds like a setup. And so you, they, they, people just sat there waiting for, OK, then what? And you just went, ah. Oh. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted Stephen Pearl and you and all the comics to like me. So I thought if I did that joke, I could hang out with you guys. I figure I'll take a hit, so I'll be accepted. And then there's this, uh, the encore point. Remember this? Yes, keep going. You ain't getting it. <laughs> so you, you would do, and blah, blah, blah. Thank you and good night. And the crowd applauds. And if they applaud long enough, you get an encore point for the comedy competition. And you're supposed to stand to the right of the stage in the pit with the audience. And this woman in a wheelchair looks me straight in the eye. I'm like, at, she's in the front row. She goes, keep walking, asshole. You ain't getting it. <laughs> keep walking. You ain't getting in my head. Oh. That was the worst night. Of, that was the worst night I ever had as a stand-up, where I just realized I'm not funny, and I, I like I made decisions to please you and Stephen Pearl, and there was a pact. I, I was I cared more what you and Pearl and all the other comics thought of me than the audience. I I just it was bad, yeah. bad. Bad. I was a grown man. And then, then uh, when did you make the decision to move down to L.A.? Uh, I got called down. I got drafted. Oh, oh, oh because you were, you were still uh, in, living in San Francisco when you worked on the road with Tom Arnold? Is that what happened? I No, I went up. I performed at the Improv one night and bombed. And Tom Arnold walks up to me and goes, that's great stuff. You want to work on Roseanne? And I said, sure. Like, I thought he was joking. And next thing I know, I, I moved to L.A. And uh, I, bombing, you know, bombing is not the worst thing, actually. No, I, always, I mean, I, 
Look, but I, I, mean, I'm, I really bombed in front of Tom Arnold, but he loved it. Well, uh, comics can uh, appreciate a good bombing uh, of another comic. And, and I mean, we used to watch Jeremy Kramer bomb in front of audiences and we would be in tears, not, not laughing at him, laughing with him. He was just so funny and they just didn't get it, but we got it. And I never really saw him very few times do really well with a crowd. Do you? Uh, well, the same, you know, he and Kevin Meany, like, did, I think Kevin Meany eventually started to kill because he, he became in, in in there was a period of time in New York City where he ran Catch a Rising Star. And I mean, when I say ran, I mean, he dominated that place. He went on at the peak of the night every night and it was just pandemonium he destroyed that room the walls were shaking right. he would do i don't care and we are the world and it was monstrous i mean he right. said on the tonight show where johnny right about it and said you got to come back and do that exact same set in two weeks like nobody had ever done that right he, he god audiences loved him they so, loved him but in san francisco it took a little while. I would, what it took a little while for for him to really start like for them to get it like he didn't care what anybody thought and he right. just did his thing and then eventually it just like caught you know what i mean and he then, wouldn't he and kramer inspired me i would go because i realized watching them that it if something's funny it doesn't matter what the audience thinks and i can remember watching i remember going i remember going to watch some sitcom horror you know, male whore who had a sitcom and he was in town to do stand up and he sucked, but he was famous and was packed. And I remember going, this is unbelievable how bad it is. And he was killing. And then I went to the punchline to see Kevin Meany and he was, you know, absolute genius, but he wasn't, he was headlining, but he wasn't lifting the lid off the place in terms of audience response and i remember thinking this is just so much better but he had to be I, famous i did not have that kind of bravery where i could withstand the silence for very long you know what i, I had mean no what's that i had no choice yeah yeah you had to learn to no yeah i would just like and if they would feel bad because within my material i had the stuff that i liked better and then the other stuff that like worked that was a little bit more physical or it was about sports or it was about you know animals it was like easier more accessible and i would just pull the ripcord on the stuff that i really wanted to do and then just go to the stuff that was working because i just couldn't stand i i couldn't stand the failure you know right so. hey uh, we have uh i wish we had more time <laughs> God, are we just, we're, all, we're all out of time where does where does the time go we're you down to one euthanized this section uh, no it's great i have to i'm not going to share this with uh the listeners there is a comedy special that's out there that is being praised that we have to watch together it is breathtakingly horrible where you just go wow wow it's it, it'll bring much joy to us to to share what is being passed off as critically acclaimed comedy it's unbelievable i like would I, love to come, down, come down to the city and have a little feldo time i mean i don't know i i'm gonna watch this with you and, I, and i'm just gonna like who thought who thought that this should be shown to people and then it was shown to people and it got great reviews and I'm going, no, no, this is, this is everybody agreeing that the sun revolves around the earth. This is not correct. Well, look, I don't like to, you know, diss people yes, anymore. Well, it just, it cost me so much <laughs> to have <laughs> had that attitude for so long. But like, honestly, point. when, when he was at his, like destroying, I would watch Dane Cook and go, 
I have, I honestly, I'm not being mean. I just don't understand. Like, I don't even see where the joke is. I don't even understand what was funny about that. And people would be laughing and screaming and be packing places. And I, and I'd be looking around like, is this like, I thought it was like a goof on me. Like this was like an elaborate prank. I honestly had no idea what, what was funny about any of it. It was just a lot of energy and guy running and saying crazy things. I, it, it was, I, that made me feel old. Right. I remember his, well, we're out of time. John Ross, where does the time go? The clock on the wall says, whew, glad that's over. <laughs> it was great. How do people should follow you on Twitter at fun with friction. You're, you're tweeting. I, I think, uh, I think I have uh, 230 some odd followers and I think that's the entirety of your audience. So that's no, that's more than my audience. Okay. Well, that's, how many do you have? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, not well, many. You, can, you can about 200 more than listen to this show. Follow John over at Fun With Friction. Thank you, sir. Bye. 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 The rest of the show, I look forward to listening to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I didn't know you were going to be forced to do an hour. We're going to. This is uh, like the old days at the Holy or Cobbs when uh, John Cantu took over and there were no comics and you'd be on stage. You had five minutes of material and he'd be on the side going, stretch, stretch. Right. And you go, oh, OK. Right. Hey, there's a documentary about Tom Sawyer. Really? Yeah. We need to have a film festival. You and me. We'll, we'll... Yeah, we, we could do it here on Office Hours. We should have Tom on the show, actually. I always say yeah, that yeah. he was the best gatekeeper there was because he never because he didn't approve of my act no uh no he had taste he really did thank you johnny right. ross thank Carry you on. thank you let us now go you know what i'm gonna play a song by uh professor mike steinell and i see that professor marianne cummings is here and we will we don't have professor mike steinell here tonight he is busy so we will uh be back right after this but first uh oh i don't have i don't have did i clean this out by, by accident here i'll show you something here let me bring professor mary ann cummings i think i could show this professor mary ann cummings is parks commissioner of a parks commissioner of Aurora, Illinois, and she's a physicist. This was, somebody sent this to me when I was working with Triumph the Incel Comic Dog, right, oh, this was during the impeachment. And we sent Triumph the Incel Comic Dog down, uh, I think it was Colbert, sent Triumph down to cover the impeachment. and. The, the, the Robert was getting into trouble with the Capitol Hill police, so he couldn't do what he wanted to do. So this was, let me see if I can find it. Here we go. So this was us during the last impeachment. Miss Jones, and I thought that was inappropriate and the way some of the uh, women were treated. But having said that, I accepted the verdict of uh, the Senate and the cloud has been lifted. So, um, yeah, just there you go. Thank you, bud. Um, so, so the point of Lamar is that to those who. That was, can you hear me? Yep. I, yeah. yeah. That was my experience. This is why the insurrection for me was uh so painful watching the police treated that way because uh so it, for the listeners robert was being <laughs> hassled by the capitol hill police and as triumph he's like sneaking up and doing and lindsey graham's giving a uh press conference so i had to go sneak up behind him as triumph and hold up a sign that says we'll lie for rubles and you can see the police uh, firmly, you know, sh gently escorting me off. And I, I'm not a big fan of 
most police officers, but those Capitol Hill police officers were something else. They understood freedom of speech. They understood Medea Benjamin and Code Pink and the purpose of spectacle, that it was part of this kabuki dance of democracy. And uh, they were great. You know, they, 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 they laughed. They said, don't do this again or we'll, you know, we're going to have to take you in. And uh, I think we've lost that because of January 6th. Well, they, they weren't uh, so nice and pleasant when Black Lives Matter had their very peaceful march around the Capitol. I know, but I'm and white. Were, I'm white. Yes. It's a different person. <laughs> and and <laughs> you probably don't look as dangerous if you, as you want to think you are. But, uh, you know. Yeah, they were not nice. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're they right. were not even worth beating up. That's that's kind of demoralizing on some level. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, that was just. Oh, so you, uh, you know, I would have listened to your war stories about stand-up comedy. Hey, you guys kind of, you know, nothing terrified me more, at least in my earlier years, than going to see a stand-up comic, which I did a couple times. And I was a graduate student, and I went. It was in. Uh, we were in L.A. We were in a little physics conference, and we went out to a comedy club, and three guys were featured. One of them was Sam Kinison, which I'd wow. never seen before. And wow. he actually was started screaming at me. And then he started screaming at my boyfriend at the time, which was actually kind of awesome because uh, he was like trying to be Mr. Cool. He's getting to be Mr. Nervous there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but the thing is, is that it's not so much. I'm not terrified by what they would do to me. It, I have the kind of terror like watching a high wire act without a net. It, it's kind of horrifying on some deep level. So just to tell well, you I mean, that to me, yeah. see, to me, that's why I enjoyed stand up. Mm -hmm. I got to a point where it's got to be for me. Mm -hmm. It's got to be dangerous. It's got to be win the audience and then lose the audience when the because it, it just sharp. It sharpened my mind. And I, I only found stand up satisfying unless I was constantly in danger of pissing off the crowd, which I would do, and then I have to win them back. To me, you know, that that that's just what I enjoy seeing. Well, my friend was uh, back in Boulder in the 80s, was a stand-up comic. You know, he was Buddy Idol, uh, Buddy Boulder. First he was Buddy Idol, then Buddy Boulder. And he, one night when they were doing their, their shtick, we came to do a shtick, Robin Williams was a headliner. And that was just when Robin Williams said, was his first, it was the first year of Mork and Mindy. So the comics knew who he was. So he gets on and of course he's insane and he grabs the whole house. And then after he leaves, no, not a single other comic wanted to go up and follow that act. Right. So of course the only one who would, was willing to do it was my friend Buddy. And apparently since Buddy, I've seen some of his tapes from that era. He was just outrageous, fearless out there weirder than Robin Williams. And he did win the audience back and he ended up, you know, being at the bar, having a few drinks with Robin Williams later. A month later, uh, he gets a call from Robin Williams saying that, hey, would offering him to be an opening act, at which point my friend said, no effing way. Am I gonna be an opening act night after night after night? You know, So they went and saw, he and his girlfriend at the time went and saw uh, Williams about a year later after that in Denver. And there was a comic that got up and man, the crowd went from being kind of heckling to kind of downright hostile with this poor guy. And uh, Buddy turned to his girlfriend and said, hey, that could have been me. And his girlfriend said, nah, you would have been, you're just too wild a guy to have just kind of skittered off the stage like this guy for him. But yeah. you know, in general, it's to me, it's just about as raw, I don't know, that that is in, in terms of, performing arts that's about as terrifying to me as it would get apart from physically well, eventually it performing stops being, without a net yeah it, when it stops being terrifying it's no longer funny it, it, to me <laughs> my well, my okay. taste it, that that if if the audience isn't terrified and the performer isn't terrified it stops being fun that's why kennison who i never approved of because it was kind of right wing and he meant it he was a 
He was a genius. Well, you know, he was genius. comedy should shock. And I remember yeah. seeing him again on the TV where it was kind of safe for me. Uh, and, but, you know, I would laugh at stuff I knew was wrong. Right. Like when he said something like, you know, and he's kind of building up the way that preachers do. And, you know, the poor, the pagan babies. I remember that from early childhood and these poor people with their bulbous heads and bodies and blah, blah, blah. And then he would just break out and start screaming, wake up, you live in a desert. Stop having kids, you morons. And, you know, it was funny because it was like part of you is thinking, yeah. <laughs> it's right. like, of course, that's ignoring the entire pol geopolitical reality of everything. But, you know, uh, comics kind of get to let people release that way. You know, like he said it, I didn't. But there laughter was... is kind of involuntary. So it's like. Right. I mean, I, you know, he and Hicks pretty much started. I think they started the Velveeta Room in Austin. Hmm. And yeah. Hicks was just better he was saying stuff that holds up to this day yeah. sam probably i mean i watched sam kennison with my mother two years ago his first hbo special my mother and i were laughing so hard at just the the misogyny which he got away with because you know he was a victim you could tell <laughs> He yeah. was a victim in the marriage, you know. He would but slam he the gals, then slam himself harder, and then end up with, hey, you gals were right. Every single one of you, God bless you. Right. You know, so that right. sort of made up for his previous sins of the last hour. Right. But, um, yeah, this I was watching. has been going on with cancel culture has been yeah. going on since the early 80s they were picketing and boycotting sam kennison they were picketing and boycotting andrew dice clay this has oh, been going I on that. Uh, either well, you know, way, sam I always... kennison also got himself banned from saturday night live remember that sketch no oh he was taken off after preachers and religious and he says oh jesus told you so jesus is speaking to you huh well did you consult the easter bunny Maybe Santa Claus had something to say on this. And then right. he said, and that would have been okay, except that he ended it with, the last time anybody physically heard Jesus say anything was, and then he gets on the floor and starts hammering like he's hammering. <laughs> and my, my friend, I was a graduate student, and my friend who grew up in a very Catholic house was laughing so hard he couldn't catch his breath. I literally had to slap him from behind. He was gasping. He was laughing so hard. I'm going, whoa, he's not coming on Saturday Night Live anymore. <laughs> soon after that. Just, I, can't, I can't imitate Sam, but he would scream no. it. Well, I did have, there was a boyfriend who was kind of problematic I had several years ago. Yeah, it's fine, but, you know, he's a little bit of a hothead. And the um, the dial tone when he would call was a Sam Kinison, you know, scream. And uh, everybody would hear that. Who's that? Sam Kinison. I was like, oh, that's my honey bunny calling me. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have anyway, you, have you, have you, yeah. have you listened to Bill Hicks? You know, I haven't. So Bill, here's I've the only listened to a little bit of Phil Oaks too, so I'm not culturally, you know. Bill really. Hicks, Bill Hicks is so great, and my son got into him, and I I don't like to listen to Bill because it upsets me, and so and I really didn't watch him all that much because I didn't want to be influenced by him, but my son has just forced me over the years to listen to Bill Hicks, and. It's more timely now than really? it was. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible what how how everything how prescient uh, he was. I should listen to that because I've been spending some time at a friend's house the last two nights. I've been helping out, and he's a a big two and a half men devotee, and so I've been watching several episodes. And look, number one, the ensemble acting is terrific. I mean, I have to say, it is funny. Number two, I'm like, ooh. I mean, that was considered edgy then, but a lot of that humor is kind of gay humor, trans. I mean, it's kind of like I'm, 
you know, you guys are really heavy handed with that stuff. And it's now borderline offensive. You know, we kind of right. I know that they were kind of making fun of each other, but it was that's that's an example of humor that is still kind of funny in its own setting, but uh, not aging all too well. It's and, you know, so when well, you have something not like aging, speaking of not aging too well, uh, uh, I know uh, I hear. the Duchess of Cornwall. Camilla oh, no. mm. claims that she was talking to the president of the United States in Glasgow and he let one rip. Have you heard this? That Joe Biden. No. I mean, let a joke rip or just, you know, had was a... uh, one of the sources of methane was ah. <laughs> was talking to Prince Charles and Camilla. And not only did he fall asleep, but he also you know, I this, this is a nice way history. to introduce what I just heard this morning. I was seeing the polls this morning. So Biden is uh, 21 points underwater. But even more astounding is Kamala Harris is like 24 points underwater in the polls, favorable, right. unfavorable. I'm going, how does a vice president, you know, poll so badly? It's like she's hardly doing anything. So I'm thinking, wow. Harris Buttigieg, you know, 2024, right? <laughs> I don't uh, think so. He, but he is going to be a player because of this infrastructure bill. It's, he's the Secretary of Transportation and a lot yeah, of Yeah, I know what's coming down the pipe there. Um, but yeah, that's going to be... Now, there's something else that I was just... I got off another Zoom meeting for our progressives of King County, but it's something just struck me today. Years ago, somebody once said, I'd heard that every senator looks in the mirror in the morning and sees a president. And that's why presidents have a hard time with the Senate in particular, because there's a whole bunch of bulls that want to be head bull. And it just occurred to me that Manchin probably looks in the mirror and says, I'm already doing Joe Biden's job. I mean, I'm setting the agenda. Why not me? Hmm. And, you know, so I'm. Uh, oh, I hope. How well, great would that be if he ran for president? Yeah, well, that would be great. How great it would be if Bernie Sanders just decided, screw it. I'm running again because this is just, you know, this is just ridiculous. All of it. And there's no. And. Problem is Joe Biden among the corporatist Dems. He's probably their best guy. I mean, he's sunsetting pretty dramatically now, but he does have a certain political skill set. Anybody who can be such a corporate tool for so long as him and still have a Joe Lunchpail kind of persona, now that's a political skill. That's, you know, he's got something. And, you know, they can't run him. I mean, they could barely run him this time around. And uh, I mean, just uh, Sanders did not, did not have killer instinct, but, you know, they can't really have him in public around. So I, I don't think he's going to run again unless there's a can, can complete disaster. Do you think he's going to run? No, maybe that's yeah, that's because Jill wants him to the run. Of course, the whole hive around him, it's, you know, there's always a swarm of people around us, whatever candidate or politician you have, and their fortunes are kind of hitched to that star. So I don't think the Biden people are going to want Kamala to like venture out on her own, you know, and elbow them to the side. So, but it's going I, to I be- I don't see, I don't see Harris getting the nomination. I just don't. Well, because we haven't seen her getting anything. Right. I mean, she's... They don't you know, represent... So this, this infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. I tried, you know, now Professor Juan Cole... Yes, said, I did read that. Yep, he says there's stuff in there. And I was reading somebody... Oh, David Dayan over at the American mm -hmm. Prospect says right. there are goodies in there. Yeah, I read, no, Milan Cole wasn't being um, very specific. I didn't read Dan's article, which I almost always, you know, I always read his stuff. Right. But here's the problem with that. I mean, 
they were constructing the, we'll call it Bernie's bill, the BBB bill, at, to complement the, the few shards that were left in the, uh, in the infrastructure bill. For instance, there's like 9 billion in uh, credits for a hydrogen economy. Well, that sounds, that sounds good, except how is the hydrogen produced? I mean, there's a very carbon intensive way of producing hydrogen. There are other ways of producing hydrogen, not carbon intense. Um, there is zero carbon footprint if you get hydrogen out of a, a subcritical nuclear reactor, but that's a whole nother set of technologies. But I don't the want thing to have is, to debate you on, I'm kidding. I don't know. No, but the thing is, is that there's, there's a lot of things in there like credits for electric cars. Okay. Uh, incentives for electric car, that's fine. Uh, nobody in this neighborhood is going to be able to afford one, but basically you are, you know, subsidizing um, people who are better off. But what if you don't have an energy grid for that electricity? I mean, there was so many things that, it, there were many things in that infrastructure bill that could branch out, you know, could, could be the link to the present and the future if we had the full 3.5 trillion bill, which we do not. And that's the problem, because I've been telling you, yeah, I know people do not like you know, nuclear, but I don't advocate that nuclear is the one silver bullet. It's got to be the entire system. It's got to be everything from our food production to our housing, to our transportation system, but particularly our energy grid, which can't, accommodate any of this stuff at the moment. So it's uh, the fact that you have these things in the infrastructure bill, which is, you know, just a massive giveaway. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of giveaways to fossil fuel. They, the, the fossil fuel industry, um, I, I was reading some of the outline of it and, I'm, and I realized that, oh, that's right. That's the use it pro bill that was being pushed in the Senate like two years ago. That and the use it bill was basically a combination of carbon capture and sequestration and enhanced oil recovery. And as John Lash pointed out in his column for for Howie Klein months ago, that it seems to be in more and more enhanced oil recovery. What is that? So you've got a whole bunch of older mines with or, uh, older wells that don't have so much head pressure because you because they're being depleted. But if you can go there in there with water or fluid it's like hydraulic mining fracking only it's pushing out oil rather than natural gas and you're in principle not cracking only uh, open any substrates so um yeah so that gets all under the rubric of clean you know car or carbon net carbon neutral with a whole lot of you know um non-existent technology into this well, so let me, let me just because we owe it to the listeners mm -hmm. the it's 550 billion dollars in new investments it's 1.2 trillion if you repurpose yeah so they're, they're gonna what, what's 1.2 minus 550 billion it's like what 600? yeah it's about 600 it's very close to um as i said you know the history was about eight months eight months ago or seven months ago it was uh, Biden came out with a 2.5 trillion infrastructure bill that had a whole lot of clean energy stuff in there. And then that got stripped at, and and uh, Mitch McConnell countered with a bill that was a little over 500 billion. So, right. so yeah. let me ask you, let me just go through the numbers here. Right. Uh, 110 billion on roads and bridges. So who gets that money? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it does it go through the states? Yeah, and they yeah. and 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 they and it and it gets privatized. There, there's a and mandate. And it goes through companies. Yeah. And public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. And the ability for uh, the ability to raise these kind of bonds, this particular kind of bond, which is basically tax money going directly that will be going directly to these these companies. The problem with that is that there doesn't, there seems to be very little oversight on how that money gets spent. Right. So that's about, you know, this is over 10 years, right? So we've got 
Um, I think five. Or five, five yeah, years? I think. Okay. Yeah, I think some of this is five. We you are know, something Pete like, Buttigieg you know, is in charge of this. We are like, two. the last time I heard about a year and a half or two years ago, there was some, like numbers like two or three trillion dollars worth of decaying infrastructure. Right. And this is just this is just negligence. This is this is just stuff we should have been keeping up on. Right. The government wasn't working. You know, right. so now it's just like it's like saying that, oh, I'm going to make improvements to my house. But what I'm doing is fixing the roof that's been leaking for the last 10 years. Right. You're doing they, they're taking a victory lap for something yeah. that they're supposed to do. Sixty six billion dollars for railroads. Some of that goes towards Amtrak. A lot of it goes towards to private companies who own these railroads. Right. And what they're Warren doing Buffett. is that they're overlaying. They're, they are running far more trains than, than they used to have before. And they're running them. So, you know, I've just noticed that I'm getting stopped at this out in the country. Uh, I'm just getting stopped at train stops where I hardly ever used to get stopped at before. And there's just, and God knows what's in some of these cars. Um, right. Because they're, you know, pipelines are still being held up because of egregious uh, environmental concerns. So a lot of this sludgy stuff gets transported by rail. And there was that infamous fire outside of Quebec a few years ago when one right. of these trains. So anyway, it's like, you're subsidizing, you're, you're making repairs that should have been done decades ago. You're subsidizing private industry. Right. And, you know, and you're just, you're doing subsidies. And this is a whole other conversation I should have because I think uh, Professor John said something very important the other day uh, when we were talking about energy. We're talking about, we were talking about energy in general, but nuclear and fossil fuel in particular just the vast amount of subsidizing that goes on. Well, all, all energy sources are subsidized. You know, the winds mills are heavily subsidized. Uh, the, the solar panels are, and that's fine because we need that. But the subsidies they don't talk about is that all of this infrastructure is this handed over to private industry. And so private industry, there is no reason why like the head of Exelon, which is the nuclear power plants, or the head of this, you know, this big, these big coal operating plants should be getting $15 million a year. And then they're asking for subsidies on top of that. Right. You know, so that's, right. that's basically, the, and as I said, one of these uh, maybe office hours, I think we should watch Planet of the Humans. Yes. And go through it because I think the lead, they buried the lead in that. And it wasn't, the, you know, the takeaway wasn't that, um, that that the renewables aren't up to the task. They aren't up now and not the current technology. But the real takeaway was once you get private, once you put all of this public R&D, uh, the results of public R&D into the hands of corporations, they don't want to change. There is no incentive for them to modernize, which is why the nuclear industry hasn't been modernized. That's why the coal and, and fossil fuel industry get to pollute. I mean, at least the nuclear people have to like you know, take account of their waste. But I mean, the the gas companies, the oil companies have been uh, contributing to climate change, which they've known for decades now would have been would would be disastrous for the planet. And yet, you know, the, the there's no accountability. There is absolutely the there is. They they uh, privatize they they privatize all the profits and and they I'd only socialize the losses which are you know are damaged to come but they've just you know they've socialized the costs all that money that went in to this technology and I don't care what technology you're talking about anything that has solid state controls on it anything that has cryogenics that's particle physics of uh, the first order but all of this stuff was developed by R&D that was you know mostly donated by the taxpayer and we're exactly. not we don't charge royalties on any of this so we're we're in a place where we can't, and this is the last thing I wanted to say, and then I wanted to get Peter Collins' take on this. We're in a place where we, as a, it appears that we cannot solve problems anymore. 
because we've allowed this commodification of our industries, of our entire government to take place. It has to be our two scientists in the house, uh, Foster and Caston, saying that it has to it has to be market driven solutions to solve climate yeah. change. And the kids are just saying, you're out of your freaking minds. So yeah. anyway. Yeah, I mean, um, I was talking with uh, earlier, uh, we were talking about private partner, private public partnerships. Why can't the federal government or the city government do the hiring? We, yeah. you know, wh why, if you're going to spend $50 billion on uh, rebuilding uh, uh, roads, they're spending more. Why can't the Army Corps of Engineer do do the hiring? Right. Why, why? There's like tw the, the economist was saying that there's like a 25 percent cost overrun baked into this. Oh yeah. Look, when when it was scientists and engineers and government funded, Fermi Lab came in on time and under budget. The one the one molten salt reactor was built on hardly any budget and ran for five years over at down over at Oak Ridge. And there were several reactors over at Idaho, uh, Idaho National Lab that did the same thing. You get these contractors, private contractors in there, and they just always jack up the price. That's par partly why the big collider in Texas didn't happen, because we got an admiral, a Navy admiral, I think, who became the project manager. And that kind of mentality, instead of just, you know, everybody on board, all hands on deck, this is war. And everybody, when when Wilson built Fermilab, he told even the, the theoretical physicists, no, you're not going to sit behind your desk. Everybody's going to be an accelerator physicist until we get this thing built. Right. And we right. don't have that anymore. And that's kind of the problem we're in. I don't know. I have to think more on this later. <laughs> yes. I, before you go, I think the progressives should have killed the infrastructure bill. I do. I, I think. Where were the, I mean, look, not only AOC, but Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar have millions of Twitter followers and Instagram followers and TikTok followers now. And I mean, where they should have gone on the road with this. The fact that they couldn't get 20 members of the Progressive Caucus to vote with them tells me something about their leadership ability. But it also tells me something about Pramila Jayapal's leadership sensibilities. This is crazy. The, I mean, this bill, you know, you know, I, I look at what people are saying who aren't following it too closely. It's something. It's something. It's a start. No, it's what they should have done 20 years ago. And it is a transfer of wealth to the richest 1%. This, this, this infrastructure bill, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, transfers money to broadband, the people who give you broadband, it transfers money to the military industrial complex because they make a lot, like Martin Marietta makes a lot of construction equipment. This stuff is, we're paying way too much because it's not the government building the infrastructure, it's private enterprise. Exactly. We were had this discussion on batteries. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, we were talking about how there's lots of private companies for decades have been working on lithium batteries. But I know that culture. A lot of know a lot of those companies. They're getting money from the same pot that my company gets money from. And we're desperately trying, you know, to help high energy physics and in the energy sector. But for a lot of these people, the incentive is just to get intellectual property. And there will be lobbyists. And we don't have the better. I mean, they're brilliant people. That's not the problem. It's just the incentives is not to work for a collective good the incentives is to get rich and get intellectual property. That's why we've been over 20 years and the, the energy destiny of batteries is lithium is like one, one and a half percent of oil. And, and okay. oh, anyway. Well, I'm Professor sure we'll Mary Cummings, before we go, you had a question for Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins joins us from Marin County 
up near San Francisco. He was recently inducted into the Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame. And Professor Marianne Cummings wanted to ask you a question. Well, good evening to each of you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Feldman and Professor Cummings. I'm delighted to see you both. Please, Mr. Feldman is my father's name. Call me <laughs> Professor Feldman, please. <laughs> Show me your paper, your sheepskin. <laughs> Hi, Marianne. No, it's, you know, we were, we, we probably heard a little bit of the discussion that, you know, there have been some people that have, uh, like people who we respect, like Juan Cole and, and David Dan, who have said that there is some good stuff in this infrastructure bill. And I countered that the good, the quote, the possible good stuff was only good stuff if it was a, if it was bridged by the, what was going to be in the $3.5 trillion Build Back Better bill. You know, so if you subsidize hydrogen cars, if you subsidize electric cars, you need a grid because you need to put up charging stations everywhere, like you have gas stations everywhere. You know, and that grid, where is that electric electricity coming from? Coal, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> oil. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Marianne, yeah. I, I heard about the last 15 minutes of, okay. of your comments, and uh, I echo many of the things you said. To answer your question directly without um, hopefully offending too many vegans, uh, this is Jimmy Dean's pure pork sausage. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some good stuff in Jimmy Dean's, along with the sawdust and whatever fell on the floor of the uh, slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. And this is a collection of earmarks. It is one of those massive packages that is intended to deliver something to every uh, senator and, and his or her respective state and to every district for mm -hmm. uh, members of Congress. And that includes Republicans who will brag about mm -hmm. delivering the pork that they have obstructed exactly. uh, the exactly. entire way. And I have not steeped myself in uh, the intricate uh, uh, spending plans that this bill will fund. But I did note that Joe Manchin is getting money in West Virginia to complete uh, an interstate highway link that Bob Byrd, who was the longtime senator who recovered from his uh, racist past to become a master of pork barrel politics. And West Virginia has some of the best freeways <laughs> in the entire country. Uh, so they're gonna complete that link. And there is also money to clean up uh, the toxic waste and damage from mountaintop mining of coal. Uh, and uh, I think I saw in the New York Times that two billion of that is going to go to West Virginia. And the, the other thing that, uh, because I'm retired, I don't obsessively study these things quite the way I used to, but I, I used to keep track of the... Um, you know, the amount of tax dollars that a given state pumped into Washington and the dividends that they got back. Um, and I am just going to speculate here, but it's a probably a pretty good guess that, uh, you know, West Virginia is not a net donor state to the federal treasury. Exactly. And I'm guessing that's probably right. And yeah. so when, when you look at the mechanics of this, Yes, we have, you know, uh, uh, really serious backlog of infrastructure projects, some of which are as dangerous as that bridge that fell down in Minneapolis, uh, the, the Brent Spence Bridge. I grew up in Cincinnati, and that's the I-75 connector between Mitch McConnell land and uh, Ohio. And uh, these are badly needed projects. But Marianne, you correctly pointed out, uh, and, and David, you too, that these are SOPs to private corporations. And by not using a national um, a contracting system like you suggested, David, they are permitting, uh, to the extent that many uh, cities are run by Democrats, uh, they're permitting this money to be spent uh, with a whole lot of that Jimmy Dean grease uh, to take care of political favors that have long been owed 
Some of that's going to go to labor unions, and I'm a pro-labor guy, but that doesn't blind me to the way that uh, unions uh, sop up the pork uh, in the same way that corporations do. So uh, this is an old style uh, package. And uh, uh, I, I do want to make some comments about Pramila Jayapal, but I don't want to dodge your question uh, if, if I haven't answered it completely. No, no, this, that, that is, you brought up a very good point, particularly unions. Unions have been part of the problem people they, in the state of Illinois and our local uh, Sunrise Movement groups have been having because they're all for keeping the, the coal powered plants open. There's a lot of coal powered plants in, in, in Illinois and Dirk, Dick Durbin is a big promoter of clean coal. And even though these jobs won't be forever, I mean, they just, they don't look to like 10, five or 10 years out. They look to, are we getting contracts next year? Mm -hmm. But this is a labor, a fractured labor movement that has no sense of solidarity. You know, if we had a serious infrastructure program handed out by the federal government, there would be like 10 times the jobs. And this would be a long-term, not only to completely uh, restructure our, our energy grid, but to maintain and to keep expanding into the renewables and things like that. This is going to be like uh, all hands on deck, like, you know, New Deal type of project. And it's unfortunate we have no leadership. Well, and, and the problem with unions is the self-interest that they see short term for their members. And let me name names. I have a lot of friends in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Mm -hmm. And IBEW was a, a sponsor of my syndicated radio show and uh, for a time, uh, my podcast. Uh, but they've been on the wrong side of climate uh, for as long as we have articulated the climate issues. And it's because they see uh, benefits in cozying up to the utilities uh, that generate electricity, whether it's from nuclear, and I'm not entirely opposed to nuclear except for the cost overruns of the plants and the uh, mm -hmm. lack of a, a reasonable plan for dealing for, with nuclear waste. And 65 year old technology that they have no incentive to upgrade. Well, our fleet, yes, as they call it. I love that. Yeah, term. it's a fleet, like a murder of clothes. <laughs> the proper term is a fleet of nuclear reactors. Yes, our, our fleet is, is as aging as the Democratic leadership. And, and that the aging is the people who need a fleet enema. <laughs> well, and that, that ties into something that you touched on a little while ago, that our Democratic leadership is on its last legs. And they have held on to power to the point that we don't have much of a bench. You're talking about Kamala Harris, a daughter of California, who I've tried to, you know, kind of turn the page uh, since she was uh, installed as vice president. But her history in California is terrible. And it does not bode well for a national run for office under the microscope of, uh, of a, a Trump style campaign. And so there will be no challenge to Joe Biden if he chooses to hold on in, in 2024. Uh, and once again, uh, you know, we, we'll, we won't have the kind of primary uh, that there was CPAC, uh, the conservative uh, gathering in Las Vegas over the weekend. And there are a dozen people who are Republicans who hopes Trump will go to jail or drop dead uh, before 2023, uh, starting with Chris Christie, uh, CNN improperly said former President Mike Pence hmm. in a, in a pre-recorded well, Freudian slip there maybe. Yeah. Well, it was in a pre-recorded package that they didn't bother to correct. Uh, it's one thing for a live reporter to slip, but this was package. Anyway, uh, you know there are people lining up from Nikki Haley to you know uh, Mike Pompeo. A lot of knuckle draggers, some with uh, polished nails, uh, who hope that Trump will not be their candidate. Uh, but we don't have any bench like that at the presidential level, nor do we have it particularly in the House. 
Nancy Pelosi has promised this is her last term, but uh, she also promised the moderates that there would be a vote on the infrastructure package by the end of September. And now uh, to come back to Pramila Jayapal, I've lost a lot of respect for her <clears throat> because, you know, she was spinning things appropriately to try to reach compromise and uh, get things passed. But as late as Wednesday, which was after the exaggerated uh, impact of the defeat in Virginia of bagman uh, Terry McAuliffe, uh, she was standing firm. But by Friday night, uh, the deal had been worked out where Pelosi, who is an excellent vote counter, knew that she had some Republicans, which permitted the squad to vote against the package. And I can't say that I respect any of them because I disagree slightly with David. I don't think they should have killed this package. They should have stirred, stood firm and not decoupled it from the uh, pared down uh, reconciliation bill. But, but they did decouple it. Yes. <clears throat> so they would have had to prevented the vote then. Pramila Jayapal should have said no vote. Yes. Yes. And then Joe Biden supposedly got on the phone and ironed out an agreement that we you should trust me. We'll give it two weeks. Let the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, score, build back better. What bullshit? <laughs> I mean, this is simply an invitation for Joe Manchin to oil up his chainsaw that he keeps in the trunk of his right. Mas Maserati. <laughs> 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 and he's just going to cut this thing to shreds. And David, you know, at the end of our conversation last week, you had a kind of diabolical um, uh, projection of the two Joes, Manchin and Biden, and that they have this uh, mano a mano understanding that uh, Manchin is going to kill this uh, after he shrinks it to the size that it can be drowned in Grover Norquist's bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when Nancy Pelosi reinstated the family leave provision that we know Joe Biden believes is, uh, you know, as evil as limitations on coal-fired power. Joe Manchin. Production. Joe Manchin. I'm, Yes. Did I say Biden? No, I you wanted to clarify which Joe. Yeah, yeah. Manchin. 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 Yes. Um, that's a poison pill. Now, it can be stripped out in the Senate. Then the bill has to go to conference and the House will have to vote again on the uh, amended package. Um, it's unlikely, given the cave-in and the decoupling, that that's going to be a serious problem. But... Uh, it is a sacrificial lamb, and it does give Joe Manchin another opportunity to invoke Republican talking points and to say that, uh, gosh, inflation and supply chain and we can't afford this and our children. And I, I mean, this is what passes for political debate. And I... I I'm prepared to talk about the uh, McAuliffe loss and the media malpractice in covering it. But the, yeah. biggest, the biggest omission of the media is the obstruction of Republicans. And they focus only on the squabbling of Democrats and they blame progressives. It's all their fault. They just will not be moderate. And then they praise Abigail Spanberger and uh, Josh Gottheimer. And by the way, uh, Spanberger didn't sign on to the piece of paper that Pramila Jayapal is now saying is the commitment of the moderates to uh, hold a vote and to pass the BBB in the House the week of November 15th. We know that is not going to happen. And she is, you know, looking into the camera and pretending, that, oh, by golly, you know, we're going to trust these moderates and you know, uh, Joe Biden co-signed on their, their agreement. Uh, and, and Biden can't deliver the Senate. He really can't. They should think, have. Peter, oh, I, I'm sorry, but what do you think of 
the fact that Joe Manchin may be thinking that since he's gotten a little, you know, he's got a little bit of a chance flex power, uh, maybe he doesn't want to give Biden another win with the BBB Act. Maybe he's thinking of running against Joe Biden. Be so great. Mm. You so, know, I, I honestly haven't thought of that because he, you know, he's always focused on pandering to the uh, majority Trump voters in West Virginia. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't know if his coal baron buddies have some polling going on out there to see if Manchin uh, in a matchup with Trump, uh, you know, could could actually perform better politically than uh, than Biden. That's that's a really interesting scenario. It's the only way to get even with him, because if he runs for president, then, you know, I'm a big believer in the politics of personal destruction. And I'm not joking around and we can destroy his wife and daughter. You know, everything will come out and the closer he gets to the White House, the more likely he, the wife and the daughter will be indicted. It'll be like a big, um, you know, inflatable who will be punctured by an EpiPen that costs six hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> the b- before we talk about the the lesson from last Tuesday, the the fake lesson, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about. Uh, uh, San Francisco and the okay. Bay Bridge, because mm-hmm. that was a major infrastructure build. The earthquake was in 1989. The Bay Bridge was pieced back together, but it had to be replaced. And they they rebuilt. This was a major infrastructure bill that I'm going to assume the federal government funded a little in the state and the county. They overcharged, they underpaid. Did they take foreign bribes? I know they (laughs) had their, I know uh, China was making the cement, correct? Um, No, China made the steel. Um, But but David, let me clarify a little bit because the Bay Bridge the impact of the earthquake was one section of the Bay Bridge. I do not recall what exactly that repair cost, but it was done within about 60 or 70 days. And the cost was covered by the state of California. The larger uh, reconstruction project was the freeway that collapsed on the mm-hmm. Oakland side. And it's, uh, it's the Harbor Freeway that connects to the Nimitz uh, Interstate uh, 880. And interestingly, uh, the Clinton administration did appropriate several billion dollars to rebuild that, that freeway. But in the interim, uh, the Northridge earthquake destroyed uh, important freeways in Southern California. And so Governor Pete Wilson screwed Oakland and diverted the federal money to speed up the repair in the Northridge area. Uh, And then Oakland uh, actually had to wait for another two years. Uh, So basically then federal money came in for the uh, Northridge project and that was diverted to Oakland. So to your question, yes, they did buy the steel. Uh, and, and then they also rebuilt. But it was the, collapsing, wasn't it? Wasn't it shoddy? I remember reading the, the bridge was, well, they were trying to save this, money. Right, but this is actually well after the earthquake. They rebuilt the eastern span of right. the Bay Bridge entirely. And that was during the uh, Schwarzenegger administration. There was federal money, but a lot of it came from uh, California. And it it partly is funded by tolls on bridges and freeways. Uh, They raised the the fees for all of the Bay Area regional bridges, except for the Golden Gate. That's a whole separate uh, entity. 
And so we, <clears throat> the California taxpayers, paid the bulk of the bridge project. And there were two things that jacked up the cost. One was that Willie Brown was mayor of San Francisco, and he didn't like the ugly utilitarian bridge that Arnold Schwarzenegger had uh, approved. And so he said, I want a pretty bridge. And uh, as a result, they renamed the Western span of the bridge for Willie Brown. <laughs> right. and, and in fact, it's a prettier bridge uh, on the, the Eastern side. Uh, but there were uh, huge cost overruns. Of course, it took longer. And yes, they did buy the steel from China. They claimed that there were no more steel mills that could produce the grade and probably the, uh, the lengths uh, of the steel that was required uh, for that project. And it, and it was shoddy, right? It, w it wasn't, things were collapsing. Well, <laughs> there was a UC Berkeley professor who after the construction was completed, went public with a study and they did have to go back and reinforce uh, key parts of the buttresses uh, for the structure uh, connecting to the, um, the towers in the water. What do you call that? Uh, the support structure. And there were parts that uh, had rusted out, uh, you know, these hella long bolts and the nuts that uh, secured them. And so there was a project to repair those and we have completely forgotten about that, but someday it will probably rear its ugly head again. Who, who are these people who build these bridges and tunnels? These are defense contractors. Is it Bechtel? Who, who are, who, Halliburton? Who is gonna be getting the lion's share of this new infrastructure bill? Uh, honestly, that's hard for me to predict at this point. Uh, Halliburton, to my knowledge, doesn't uh, get into infrastructure deals. Uh, Bechtel does, but usually uh, outside the United States. Um, Bechtel was the company that rebuilt the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant to, after the first contractor installed the cooling system backwards. Uh, but by and large, uh, these are, are regional companies who have juice with the state government uh, where they're located. Uh, Does it concern you that most of this will be, the spending will be determined by Pete Buttigieg, a McKinsey guy? Well, you know, Pete's gonna parcel it out to the state level. Uh, there, some of these are alleged uh, shovel-ready projects. Right. Um, but you can just bet that there are going to be all kinds of, uh, of companies at the trough. <clears throat> and, you know, here in Northern California, there is an Italian company. And I don't want to make any inference that they are mobsters just because they're Italians. Uh, but they managed to, it, it's the Gelati family. They managed to get all of the, okay. the business uh, basically from San Francisco up through Marin and Sonoma counties. And so uh, separate from this, and this goes back 50 years, but uh, when I, uh, I, at one point I was married and my father-in-law, uh, he and his brother owned a construction company that built uh, three of the interstate highways uh, in, in Ohio. And uh, his brother, <clears throat> my, my father-in-law was a pretty straight o potato guy, but his brother was the one who wined and dined uh, local and state officials to get the contracts. So uh, I would just guess that that's how it will be replicated uh, in each locale. Before we, before we turn to last Tuesday, I've played clips of Ayn Rand saying, government does not create jobs. That is received wisdom, that government is a hindrance to job creation. The truth is government could make jobs, but corporate interests prevent it. 
we could spend this $550 billion more efficiently if we did the hiring and didn't give this out to contractors, right? This would be done more efficiently if we had an army of workers installing all this stuff. Well, first of all, the term job creation is a little slippery um, because, you know, these are short term jobs, Um, you know, working on infrastructure projects uh, are typically a year or two. And big dig, cost overrun, they don't make these things. Okay, but but there there isn't enough consistent work for it to become a career. So the the laborers and the uh, skilled construction workers are still journeymen and women who go from one job to the next. And I'm reminded of the breakdown of the jobs projections for the Keystone XL pipeline. And they, they uh, exaggerated and pressed up the numbers so far that it included bartenders and hookers and other people who would benefit from the uh, short-term projects that you know, brought workers and they would rent uh, you know, uh, dumps to live in and uh, they would be spending their paychecks locally. And so just like the way they Uh, create these uh, incredible numbers for the impact of the Olympics when we know that every city that hosts the Olympics gets taken to the cleaners. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, It doesn't stop them from making these same kinds of projections. But, you know, what I think you're talking about is similar to the the Depression era uh, uh, jobs that were created and uh, you know, some of those were people who would move from place to place. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't object to having a federal workforce that, you know, builds a, the, the bridge in Ohio to Kentucky and then moves on to Illinois. Right. Right. And, and that might break up the, um, some of the corruption because I, I lived in Chicago for a number of years before I moved to the West Coast. And I'm pretty familiar with the layers of uh, political uh, influence and the patronage systems that uh, work not just in the Chicago machine, but um, it, it's, it's a statewide uh, issue there in the land of Lincoln. Last question. What would have happened if Pramila Jayapal said nothing? Nothing. You're, where, you you want to play with us? You need this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, as you pointed out, the, the giveaways to West Virginia, the giveaways to the oil companies, all the people who are Joe Manchin's constituents, all of cinema's constituents. McConnell wants this. McCarthy didn't, but McConnell in the Senate wants it. What would have happened if... Jayapal said, she's the head of the Progressive Caucus, said, no, nope, you're not getting it. And well, we're prepared to walk away entirely. Now, we're talking about, we're not taking anything away from the American people with, by, by killing the infrastructure bill. There's nothing the American people are going to lose. One third of our bridges are creaky, I get it. We need about $3 trillion worth of money for the next decade spent on infrastructure. But you walk away from this infrastructure bill that got passed Friday, the American people aren't losing anything. Nobody's taking away your bridges and tunnels. They're just not going to get fixed. The people who have the most to lose are the Republicans who want it and Joe Manchin. What would have been the fallout if the progressives said, well, we'll walk away from it. There's nothing in here we need. Marianne, you want to take a shot at this? I do have some comments. but Well, you know, the thing is, is that you wouldn't even walk away from that bill. I mean, this is a bill that has to get passed. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, their 
their donors wanted that bill passed. Right. It has to get passed for for the for the Republicans and the yeah. right wingers so, and the Democratic it's, it's Party. Like, but the left is, didn't need that. The left doesn't need that I infrastructure. Understand. I understand. It's so it's like you, you're you're absolutely right about this, David. They she could have walked away and said, we're passing. You pass this three point five trillion dollar bill. We'll pass your bill. You will we'll get the stuff that you we wanted. You get the stuff that you wanted. And, you know, that's how bargaining works. You're not bargaining when you're giving everything away. <laughs> and, and people giving will everything say, away nothing. people say, no, no, but rural, rural uh, areas will get Internet. Well, yeah, you're not taking rural Internet away wait, wait. from the American people. You're just not giving it to them. The, the American people would not lose anything if the progressive wing killed the promise of new infrastructure yeah, yeah. and repairing something. So, you know, you know, they, but as I said, you're right about that. But furthermore, it was a bill that was going to have to pass. It was just kind of like they could have held out months ago with the uh, with the Recovery Act, because that was a bill also that had to pass. If the progressives had stood firm and said $15 minimum wage in there or no go, they wouldn't have killed the bill. It would have had to go on back to the negotiating table. When you and say had to pass, was, when you yeah. say had to pass, you mean the 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 right wing, the the corporatists had yeah. to get this passed. And but and, but of the and country. there had to do something. I mean, we were still in the throes of a depression, a COVID depression, and we, you know, the, the vaccines were being distributed, but you know, we were a couple months from having it. What the at least half the first shot. The problem is they had to have passed them because it's kind of like the defense bill. Those two bills have bills have to get passed also. That's when the progressives can use their leverage, and they failed to use their leverage. Uh, you know, uh, Jayapal, if she had told her progressive caucus to stand firm, she would have had a lot of people standing firm. That wouldn't have killed the infrastructure. I mean, that the infrastructure bill would have been deferred. That's it. That's all yeah. that would have happened. Here's the and deal, folks. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> okay, no malarkey, right? I believe that Jayapal had a pretty firm grip on the Progressive Caucus until sometime around Thursday. And this is speculation. I don't have any inside sources. It's based on media accounts. But <clears throat> it appears that at the behest of Joe Biden, and with the help of his uh, godfather, James Clyburn, that the Black Caucus right. basically caved. And when, right. they, when they did, Jayapal lost the leverage, or at least the full leverage that she thought she had. And when it came to the SmackDown on Friday, she was left with a way to save face. The other card that Pelosi pulled out was the 13 Republicans who uh, broke with the total obstruction uh, orders from McCarthy. And these are people in the so-called problem solver caucus. They operate from very safe seats and they don't need to fear uh, mm -hmm. McCarthy or a, a further they right probably got primary. Permission. They probably got permission from McCarthy because, you know, he said, fine, go ahead. I mean, they're going to stand firm against the, the, the Republican leadership that was going to stand firm. But as David point out, they're going to get the goodies from this. And most people aren't even paying attention or may not right. connecting, you know, the right. Byzantine uh, politics of legislation with something they eventually get in their district. And it's you would be, think you know, that Pramila Jayapal yeah. would have seen the uh, the Congressional Black Caucus giving her trouble uh, months in advance on this. Cause well, the, there are a number of uh, Black Caucus members who are also in the Progressive Caucus. Right. And the other piece of this, if you remember, I mentioned the uh, surprise that Pelosi reinserted the family leave four weeks uh, into the bill. Uh, build it better, not this bill. Yeah. 
um, yeah, into the reconciliation. Right. But, but she did that before the cave-in and the decoupling on Friday night. Mm. And I, 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 again, I'm just guessing that there was some sort of horse trading there with the progressives. And the squad, to its credit, um, you know, refused to hold their noses and cave in. But Pelosi knew that there are only six of them and that she could outflank them with the Republican votes. Before we go to Tuesday, <laughs> last, uh, I, I'm putting up on the screen an Economist YouGov poll. Every week, The Economist polls the American people and asks them what are the most important issues facing this country. And you're asked to put it in, in order of priority. Number one, health care. 19%, nearly one out of five Americans think health care is the number one issue. Not Democrats, Americans. Health care is the number one issue on people's mind right now. Number two is climate change. Number three is the economy. Number four is civil rights. Number five is government spending. So that would be a, the, the one conservative concern, government spending, only 10% are concerned about government spending. Number six is immigration, so that would be a right-wing concern. Number seven is national security, that's a right-wing concern. Eighth is education, that's a right-wing concern, but maybe not. Ninth is abortion, a right-wing concern. Ten is crime, a right-wing concern. And at the bottom, gun control, that would be the eleventh, that would be a uh, a left-wing concern. The first four, the top four, healthcare, climate change, the economy, eh, that could have a right-wing bent to it, actually, and civil rights, number four. I would say four and a half, three and a half of the biggest concerns of American people are left-wing concerns. Is that fair? Yeah, but, you know, they don't pull the donors. David? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, the polling, you, you know, one of the smoke screens that's thrown up repeatedly in this, this media frenzy is Americans don't know what's in the Build Back Better bill. Well, damn it, they do. Particularly, they know the things that would benefit or affect them. They may not know the exact dollar amounts and the length of time that's all been uh, rejiggered and and you know even the people in the house only got the bill a few days before they voted on it but mm -hmm. they know the general uh, thrust of the package and they know you know particularly on child care on early childhood education uh, they know what will benefit them uh, and Every one of those items polls at, at well over 60%, in many cases, over 70%. And so right. the, the will of the people is not a material issue here. Right, right. Well, the lesson from Tuesday, obviously, I, I Peter, I'm very grateful you're a regular on the show. You find time for us. I think Professor Marianne Cummings and you and I agree that the message from last Tuesday was a stentorian call to reel back the left. That what happened, I know Professor Marianne Cummings believes that Terry McAuliffe lost because of wokeness, because we're just too woke. I can't even <laughs> pretend. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> what, what, what happened on Tuesday? Terry McAuliffe lost by 2%. And this is being seen as a blowout, a, a drubbing. I mean, the language of the media, I, I grabbed a few headlines today uh, from the Times, a couple of them here. The Democrats, no good, very bad day, changes the landscape. Rough <laughs> night for Democrats, exposes the party's weakness. Wow. Uh, in rural areas, this is the Sunday Times, uh, you know, five days after the narrow loss. In rural areas, prospects sink for Democrats. 
And so all this is being projected from Virginia. And, and the two biggest uh, uh, misleading facts are that Biden won it by 10 points a year ago. Well, those were Republicans who didn't want Trump. And right. they, they did not suddenly become blue and, and you know, decide that uh, they want a more liberal uh, state government. Ralph Northam did some interesting things after his blackface scandal, uh, you know, on the death penalty, the removal of Confederate statues. Uh, but <clears throat> the payback for COVID has hit a lot of Democratic governors. And, and so this idea that, that this off-year election in Virginia is any kind of a bellwether is just pure bullshit. Yep. And there were only a handful of contests, and they want to look at Buffalo, New York's mayor's race. They want to look at the defeat of the police reform bill in Minneapolis and the socialist candidate who lost in Seattle and try to make out that these are critical and measurable national trends. And that, too, is bullshit. These are local issues that are hardly connected. And it's only in the minds of the media and the fact that the cable channels decided to overcover election night. Uh, and yes, uh, you know, uh, uh, Murray or Murphy in New Jersey is holding on to a slim lead and uh, Chiabata or whatever his name is, uh, he is playing the Trump game and saying, oh, I'm not going to concede. And I think it was rigged. Well, New Jersey is not the least corrupt place in the country. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I, I support candidates who wait for uh, a certified result. But uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the guy's name. It, it's Ch Chittister or something like that. Uh, he clearly is appealing to Trump voters uh, with the stop the steal uh, kind of message. But these are not uh, any indications of a failure of progressivism that, uh, you know, the obstruction in Washington, again, this is the big omission from the whole narrative that the Republicans are forcing the Democrats to squabble among themselves because they won't touch anything that they believe would give Biden a win. And so uh, oh, here's another one, Virginia governor's race, flashing red warning sign. Uh, the black newspaper in Philadelphia, the Philly Trib uh, election, a warning for Pennsylvania Democrats, uh, all the way out to Northwest Arkansas, the Democrat Gazette, election results raise alarm for Democrats. And then we have the New York Times piling on uh, in a way that they didn't do to squelch the Tea Party movement but they are using to squelch the progressive movement in this country. And so uh, the, you got Maureen Dowd, who cites James Carville, who is as much of a Clinton and corporate tool as Terry McAuliffe, and uh, acting as if he is this wise man. And what did he do? Here's the quote. Uh, There's some truth in what Carville told Judy Woodruff on, on PBS. What went wrong is this stupid wokeness. Don't just look at Virginia and New Jersey, look at Long Island, look at Buffalo, look at Minneapolis, even look at Seattle. I mean, this defund the police lunacy, this take Abraham Lincoln's name off of schools. So- That was uh, San Francisco. One, yes. one school in San Francisco removed Abraham Lincoln's name, one. No, they actually never went through with it. And to okay. be fair, it was a rogue school board that actually listed 40 schools that should be changed to PS21 or something like that, including Diane Feinstein, who is not a hero to me, but you know, she was mayor here, she's been a senator for too long. And to name a, an elementary school after her to me is, is not something that people should be uh, getting all woke about. But, you know, Police reform in Minneapolis is a really important issue. And Carville joins Bill Maher and the Republicans in uh, denigrating the concept of wokeness. 
uh, which diminishes the racial disparities and injustices in this country, and which is something that began with Trump. When he was able to tweet, uh, he attacked wokeness. He, even though 94% of the BLM protests in the summer of 2020 were peaceful, uh, there was looting in Los Angeles, there was looting in Portland, and he made it out that that was what happened everywhere. So to see this pile on, and then I want to give credit to David Sirota, because he broke down and unpacked a lengthy op-ed that was published in the Times today under the byline of Mark Penn. He was Hillary's pollster and Andrew Stein. And both of these guys are up to their necks in conflicts of interest. Uh, Penn is involved in hedge funds, uh, equi private equity. Uh, he is uh, connected to the dark money group called No Labels, funded by big donors that's been vilifying Democrats' uh, uh, reconciliation bill. It declines to mention that Mark Penn advised Trump during his first impeachment. And nor does it mention that Stein is the guy who literally ran Democrats for Trump. So these are the bedfellows wow. that the New York Times is hopping into the sack with in order to just obliterate uh, any sense of a progressive movement and declaring it dead on arrival. Now, we've discussed this before, David, the mechanics of gerrymandering and the uh, general trend that in the off-year elections, the party in power loses seats. The Democrats have, you know, they've got to pull off a miracle next year to hold on to the House. Before you bring any of Virginia or these extraneous issues that are being, uh, uh, you know, packaged in with Terry McAuliffe's singular loss. And let me take you take a couple of minutes here to talk about McAuliffe, because uh, I have interviewed him twice uh, during the Bush years. There were these events in Washington called Take Back America. That, that was a left concept at the time. And so we'd go to this gathering and there'd be these radio rows. And so I would do my show from there and they would assign you guests. You could, uh, you know, reject a handful of people, but basically, you know, they would tell you, I've got Terry McAuliffe for you. And you got 15 minutes with him at, you know, a certain time slot. Well, I got this smarmy asshole twice. <laughs> and he is so condescending. Now, most people who come on to a radio show, and you've experienced this, David, uh, they, they offer at least some respect to the host. But McAuliffe is the guy who comes in with his ego leading and he considers himself a superstar and he's full of the Bill Clinton era, um, third way uh, democratic leadership council. He's a corporate tool and he believes that uh, like Carville, uh, he defines what is moderate and what is outside of the acceptable lanes for the Democratic Party in the left lane. Mm -hmm. And so he came into these interviews with me with a chip on his proverbial shoulder. And whatever the question was, he's a very skilled uh, polemicist. He never answered the question. He just said what he wanted to say. Exactly. And he would bulldoze the hosts to get his talking points across. So coming into this second attempt uh, in Virginia, the term limits are that you can't serve consecutive terms, but uh, I guess you can have at least two terms and maybe more. They just can't be back to back. So here's a guy who uh, his only political office that he's ever held is governor of Virginia. It was engineered by Bill and Hillary to take care of their bag man. And uh, he did not distinguish himself in his first term. So he comes up for a second term 
he, you know, wins the primary. And uh, I don't even remember who he lost to, but it was, uh, ugly. Yeah. it was ugly because everything Terry does is ugly. So the polling shows that he's neck and neck with this uh, Republican who dances around Trump and Youngkin, you know, has his own issues by, uh, you know, acknowledging Terry McAuliffe's weaknesses. I'm not uh, Im imputing strength to Youngkin. But he took advantage of this situation where he, you know, got the Trump voters supports uh, support without having to totally kiss Trump's ass. Now, McAuliffe then decided to try to emulate what Gavin Newsom did here in California, which was to say the recall was Trump engineered. In fact, it wasn't really. It was engineered by people who were upset about COVID mandates and masking and the, the lockdowns that occurred in uh, 2020. And I don't agree with the uh, backlash about that. I think that our governors, even Republicans, were confronted with a public health crisis. The, not only the lack of leadership from Trump, but his open, um, uh, you know, he, he threw monkey wrenches into every, uh, you know, he didn't coordinate the acquisition of masks and ventilators when we thought that those were the most critical things that we needed. The whole PPP shortage, not to mention the TP shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, governors <clears throat> were confronted with a crisis that uh, they didn't expect. Uh, we know there was a playbook that the Obama White House left behind and Trump shredded it. Uh, so they were on their own. And, you know, I don't think Gavin Newsom uh, deserved to be recalled. He did make a number of serious blunders, like allowing the unemployment agency to be fleeced for billions of dollars. And we still don't know exactly how much and who got it. Uh, they tried to blame it on prisoners when prisoners got only about a half million of the estimated 11 to 30 billion that was uh, you know, uh, defrauded. Uh, and so I'm not an apologist for Gavin Newsom, but he didn't deserve to be recalled. And when uh, the uh, talk show host, Larry Elder, an African-American conservative from LA became, uh, you know, he eclipsed uh, Caitlyn Jenner who was the first to challenge Newsom in this bizarre recall, recall process. So, uh, you know, Newsom has a very skilled political team and the polling showed that he really just needed to get the people who had voted for him uh, originally to vote for him again. And so he ran a base election in California and he did run against Trump. But he did it by tying Larry Elder to Trump. And Elder was a sitting duck because he was so pro-Trump. Mm -hmm. Youngkin was more adept at uh, pretending that he wasn't totally in the tank for Trump. And so given all of these factors, Terry McAuliffe deserved to lose. <laughs> and... The media is taking this and flipping it as if he were entitled to win and that this then becomes the template moving forward that only moderate corporate tool Democrats should run and that uh, you know that's the only way to beat the national Trump machine, all these people who have genuflected uh, to the Donald. And it is exactly the recipe for disaster. And so I'll, I'll wrap up this rant by saying. No, I, I, I really appreciate it. And it's infuriating and it's a lie. It's this was going to be the conclusion no matter what. Had McAuliffe won, had it been a blowout in New Jersey, the conclusion would have been we have to move to the center. No matter what the results on Tuesday were going to be, it was already predetermined. They would say the, the, the lesson was move away from the, the left.
And so to take this and instantly put it in the microwave, heat it up and exaggerate it, and then say that Biden hasn't had a win without mentioning that the real reason for that is the Republicans who are you know, following Trump's orders to obstruct, obstruct, and obstruct. This was then turned into this gospel. And it is now the uh, conventional and accepted wisdom. Uh, you know, I was watching a panel with uh, Jake Tapdancer on CNN today, and they're all just there. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, moderates, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, uh, this, uh, they got to go. And we come back to the explicit results of the polls, which show that not just the Democratic base, not just progressives, but a majority of Americans support the elements in the reconciliation package. So uh, I'll note one more thing. And um, Peter Van Buren is an unusual guy who I got to know. He got bounced out of the State Department by Hillary and has become a Clinton hater. He also uh, offended a lot of people. Uh, he got bounced off Twitter even before Trump. He's written a lot of stuff that normalizes Trump, and I, I, I do not embrace any of that. But he wrote a piece. The only place he can get published now is at the American Conservative. And so he does pander to that audience. But he makes a very strong case at the American Conservative website today. He said, of, of all the things Terry McAuliffe is, mediocre former governor, race monger, liar, visa fraudster, uh, tech scammer, um, he is also the last bit of Clintonite pollution in the body politic. And this, I do think, is an important takeaway, much more important than all of the bullshit in, in the corporate media saying that this is the you know, harbinger of death for progressives. Uh, McAuliffe uh, really is the last uh, Clinton appendage. Uh, Andrew Cuomo was the other who was a, a spawn of the Clinton administration. And so, if there is a positive takeaway, um, we can hope that the personified elements of the Clinton machine are now pretty well uh, purged from the system. But just like Trumpism has not subsided, the pro-corporate, moderate, pro-death penalty, uh, pro-war, uh, elements of, of Clintonism that have infected the Democratic Party are thriving. Mm -hmm. Well said, sir. I appreciate it. David, Thank I have one personal thing to pass along. I ran into uh, another Radio Hall of Famer, uh, Michael Krasny, at the post office last week. I love him. Well, he said he was at your wedding. Yes, he was. <laughs> and he wanted, to, he wanted to send his best to you. Well, why don't you bring him on? Okay, I'll ask him. Professor Krasny, he would love this show. Well, you know, I have no idea what his political positions are. Because he, he was in the cage at uh, the San Francisco NPR station for so many years. Before that, he was on as a liberal... Uh, talk host on KGO, the commercial station. Right. But he's been, um, you know, in that cage where opinions are not permitted for so long. Um, it would be very he's interesting. An English professor. He, he's a professor. He taught English at SF State. We'll yes. have him come on. We'll talk English. Okay. He speaks English. We speak <laughs> he, English. He does. He's He'll run circles on. around us in literature, though. Right. But he's also a student <laughs> of comedy. I would love to have him. Did he retire? Is he kind of? He retired from uh, KQED in February. Yes. Is he still teaching? He has been doing a seminar at Stanford, from what I understand. Uh, but I think he's, he's got grandkids and he's enjoying uh, not working. I believe he's a Michigan man, the same way Professor Marianne Cummings is, I believe. Uh, it's either Michigan or Cleveland. It's a great lake. <laughs> yes, it's one of the lakes. He's a great lakes guy. I would love if he could find time for him to come up. 
for him to come on the show. We could just talk about English literature and uh, pretend I know what he's talking about. Me too. Peter Collins, fantastic, fantastic. Professor, uh, go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of podcasts and interviews and radio shows. Peter B. Collins, Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. I hope to see you next week. I'll be Thank here. You. Good to talk Thank to you, David. You. And great, thanks for being job. with us, Marianne. Yeah, thanks. great job. Oh, my, my honor. And Professor Marianne Cummings, thank you for joining us. I think Ethan was supposed to be here. But... Yeah, hey. Oh, so yeah. you are here. Yeah, the anonymous caller yeah. into the show. Oh. Yeah, you... I've been uh, I've been listening uh, on my phone. I'm, I'm in the middle of a long car ride, and I, that was brilliant, that Peter B. Collins. Oh, my God. Oh, I, I thought the mystery caller was Terry McAuliffe. It's Terry McAuliffe. Yes, we oh, have Terry hey. McAuliffe. How us. dare you talk about me that way? How dare you call me <laughs> smarmy? <laughs> Ethan Hershenfeld is... Uh, right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Ethan Hershenfeld's new special is streaming right now on YouTube. Thug, Thug, Jew. We spoke to him Thursday night, right before he was going on. And I was worried. Somebody said I was trying to get into your head. And I was. No, but I wasn't no. no. Here, it, didn't, it didn't feel like that. You have been... You you were you've been under a lot of pressure, a lot of Oedipal pressure this week. On Thursday well, show, you performed yeah. for your mother, and then you took her to the Paris Theater yes. to see the new movie that you star in. What is the name of the new movie you're starring? In? <laughs> I don't star in it. Nothing could be a, a less accurate description of my role. I don't star in it. No, I play uh, an Egyptian billionaire who is a... I'm a linchpin in the plot. I won't give anything away, but I'm in a very important part of the plot. But I'm, I'm, my screen time is pretty brief. But the stars of the movie are The Rock, uh, Wonder Woman, and Ryan Reynolds. So they are reputed to have each made $20 million on this movie. So, and... Uh, so I, you know, my my role is pretty pretty small, but what is the name of the, movie? the plot? What is the name of the movie? Red, red like the color, and notice like uh, notice, red, red notice. notice. It's an action comedy, and it was at the and Paris it, Theater. That's unusual. Was it? Is it in French? No, <laughs> no, there's the no French in it. For French uh, movies. No, it's just, it's, uh, I'll tell you what it is. It's a Netflix movie, but I guess in order to be awards eligible, these movies now have to be on a big screen, at least a little bit before they start streaming. So for the week, at least a week, so the movie is going to start streaming on Netflix uh, on Friday in a few days. But a week before that, they start uh, projecting it on some big screens. Was this yeah. the movie... We you were filming in Georgia, we would talk to you and you were going it, down. Exactly. Oh, that was a year ago we were shooting it. That's it. It's out. Exactly. And yeah. this was during COVID and you were constantly being tested. And this is exactly. Exciting. Yeah. And it's exciting. It was fun. It was fun to see, uh, you know, I already have quite a large skull, but to see your skull, then, you know, your cranium projected on a big screen, then you have a really, really big noggin. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's kind of fun when you're sitting next to your mom and then she sees your giant noggin on the screen and, you know, she elbowed me like, hey, there you are. It was fun. And she said, you have no idea how painful. Now you have an idea yeah, of how painful exactly. the birth was. <laughs> yeah. Look at the size yeah. of that head. And she was proud. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, we had a good time. Yeah, we laughed. We we got. We, yeah, we had some real I laughs. Fact, I know for a fact that your mother. Yeah, she was proud. proud. Yes, I know for yeah. a fact. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, now, when were you more nervous and, um, performing stand-up oh. in front of her on Thursday night, or taking her to a to see you in a movie? 
Oh, that's the nice thing about seeing yourself on screen. There's no nerves. It's already cooked. It's already baked. Right. There's and nothing you, you could do at that already? point. But had you seen it already? No. I saw my scene do- during uh, ADR when we were recording some extra dialogue lines. So I knew it looked pretty good. But uh, um, I thought there was another scene. They had me go back down in June to shoot an extra scene. And uh, then that, that extra scene didn't make it into the movie. So that extra trip to Georgia in June, um, it turned out to, uh, I wouldn't say for naught, because we picked up some other shots also. But, uh, and you get paid. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I got paid. It was nice. It, it, was, uh, it was a real godsend, this whole gig, because there wasn't a hell of a lot else going on for that right. whole pandemic year. Yeah. Um, tell let me, me let me just tell you, David. Yes, sir. The comedy, yeah, it went it went well. I had notes out because everything was new. I thought I had kind of spent the day memorizing it, but you know, I haven't been getting on stage a lot in all. I decided to do a whole new twenty minutes. I did about twenty two new minutes. I closed with that vegan uh, joke I told you. It went. It really landed very hard. It was good, and I have a joke about the Jewish space laser that worked really well, also. With so, the, you uh, met Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene and the Rothschilds. Yeah, yeah, except in my retelling of it, it's that, in fact, there is a Jewish space laser. People think there isn't, but there actually is. Um, and I'll tell you what it is. You ever look on Zillow, uh, and you, then you go to the open house, and you say, no, there's no way this is 800 square feet. And then <laughs> the agent takes out this device, and they, it beeps, and then you look at it, and it says 800 square feet, and that's the Jewish space laser. I see. Okay, yeah. I guess you would have it's to... Real, it's a real estate. It's, it's a, a real, real estate, estate situation. Right, right. Yeah. Now, you're in the car. Yeah. I'm in the car. I'm, I, I, I'm, I was going to be in New York for a few more days, but I decided to come back up here to, uh, to Truro because... One of our dogs, the old guy, is having some difficulty, and um, I want to uh, be there. Uh, you know, the family. It's me, my girlfriend, and the, the three dogs. i got to tend to the family. Right. And how old is he? He is 14 and three months. What's his which name? Which is a lot of... His name is Loki, and he is a shepherd mix. And he came with that name. He was, he's, a, he's an amazing dog, just very sweet and uh, very good-mannered, even as a puppy. He was found in Rockaway, in Queens, in a box with some other puppies, and they were all named after Norse gods, like Chaos and Thor, and he's Loki. And so he's been uh, my dog for, you've, you know, you've, you've had him since 14 years. And you had him since yes. he was a puppy. Yeah, he's the he's the longest relationship of my life. The second longest relationship with a German in your life. <laughs> he's a German shepherd, right? That's right. That's right. He's a shepherd. He's a German shepherd mix. Um, and, and where are you now? As we as we're I'm uh, I'm just one town away. It just timed out that I you know I left uh, New York in the afternoon and I'm. I'm I'm now in uh, in Wellfleet. I'm just one town away from from my destination. Wow! So is COVID over? Yeah. The, the, the 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 messaging we're getting today is no, 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 no. It's not uh, over. Did you read about uh, Sag- Saxony? You know, in former East Germany, these there's a a whole new spike. They have their highest number of cases per day of the entire pandemic right now. There's a spike in Germany, all because of these vaccine deniers in, uh, in, in East Germany. And then in, in Trieste, in the, in the north east of Italy, they have a giant spike there because uh, they're holding anti-vax rallies. And the anti-vax rallies become the super spreader events. It's, it's brilliant. Right. So, right, but there, um, I thought there was some good news I thought there was some good news. What? Oh, pill. some good COVID news? Yeah, the pill. Oh, that's the good pill. news. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 the pill, yeah. Um, okay. okay. 
Yeah. All right. Are you going to come on the show Thursday? Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's the linchpin of my week. <laughs> we love you and your dad. How many, we, and, and, and I, you. Now, how many more hours of the show happens? I'm never on this late. Does this go till about 2 a.m.? When does it end? No, no, when you're the last guest. I didn't realize. Oh, my God. I didn't realize that you were coming to us via phone. So I I know because I tried to I tried to go in the normal route through my phone and then it was asking me to punch in all kinds of codes, which would have been fatal while driving. Right. So, but you should have done it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I should have done it. I know. Priorities. All right. What, now, what's the story with Renan? Are we going to get him on the show or not? I think so. But that's pretty fancy. He had a set at the Comedy Cellar tonight, I think is what he said. Right, but he's got this so, big special that he's recording on the 21st yes. of December. And yes. he's, has he outgrown the show? I, I don't think, I will, I don't know, but I, I think he would be happy to come on. I'll, I think uh, I'll pester him again. I'll ask him what, what date, what date works. Okay, where are you performing stand-up next? Um, oh, that's a good question. I, I, I'm going to do that... Uh, Christmas Eve show at the comic strip, which is an annual event. That's very fun. So that's one thing I know for sure. Before then, I'm not, uh, I'm not positive, but everything uh, my, I'm focused in my head, at least I'm focused on, uh, polishing up all this new material and, and then recording it for one of those dry bar comedy specials out in Utah in the spring. Great. That's the big right. plan. Thank you. All right, uh, David. Thank you. Let, let's do Mondays. Uh, and, you know, uh, I like having you I'm on game. as much as possible. I'm game. We Let me know. You. I'd love to. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. We, thank you. We, Ethan Hirsch no, no from, no. and go see his special right now on YouTube, Thug Thug Jew yeah. and Red Notice. Red, Red Notice. Red Notice, yeah. And here's on, what we're going to uh, do. We're, street. Yeah. I, on Netflix, and everybody, well, I was going to say everybody should write in the comments on Netflix how much they love Ethan, but that might look suspicious. Yeah, I don't even know if there are comments on Netflix. But, oh, uh, okay. Well, give yeah, him a thumbs but, up. Um, thug, thug, yeah, too. thumbs up, thumbs up. All right, thanks, David. Have a good I night. Give my love to Loki, please. Will do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Right, thank bye. you. Bye. bye. Ethan Hurtfeld. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye now. I love bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. I love old dogs. Puppies and old dogs are the best. I see we have some calls. John Hayes, are you here? And we have two hands raised. Yes. Sorry you... to keep you waiting. I just checked the people who were on hold. Yeah, slight wait. Um, so you had um, Dutch on a few weeks ago, and I invited him to office hours. I also invited Daniel Lee to office hours about nine months ago. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I was shocked and pleased to see him today. And uh, right, yeah, he's great. He uh, he was. I met him at Occupy, Occupy LA. He was part of the yeah. home. Right. I was going to ask. Following uh, John is uh, a union brother, a member of IATSE. Hey, what what is happening with IATSE? They. Is there a, a settlement yet? No, we had a two-hour meeting yesterday morning uh, for my local. I'm sure the others have been doing the same thing to describe the contract and what we're getting and, you know, general, and just taking questions mostly. And I was also chiming in uh, a bit um, critically at the uh, end. I was like the next to last person to ask a question. And... Um, they, you know, the business agent is kind of touting it, something we should vote for, but I'm going to vote no, probably. And yeah. as the person who followed me, who I've worked with, also said she's going to vote no because we need to show that we're not totally 100% on board with this thing. You know, we got to have some opposition, and I agree. That's why I almost yeah. always vote no. We work so hard on making this deal. We work so hard on negotiating with the studios. You don't know how hard it is. We work so hard on this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that's really just $550 billion. We work so hard 
don't we deserve any credit for working so hard on this lousy deal? Yeah, it it could be worse, no doubt about it. Everything. But it could be better too. Yeah. It's, it's like politics in general. Yeah. At some point, you know, I'm cranky, but at some point, the the people who are supposed to be representing us have to stop. I'm not saying this about IATSE. I don't know what the final deal is. But they tell us it's compromise when, in fact, it's we're just giving stuff up. What yeah. is the compromise? I, I don't know enough about the IATSE, but what's the compromise that Manchin made on the infrastructure bill? What, what, what did he give up? What did he lose? Mm. Yeah, they don't. he doesn't compromise, but we have to. So yeah, we have to compromise, even though we've outnumbered him. But we have to compromise. Well, I did. Um, I did point out on this meeting. There was about 150 members on this Zoom meeting. I did point out how IATSE has a very pretty despicable <laughs> origin and past. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, we've never gone on a strike. And why does our uh, president of our Union make about half a million dollars a year, and he explained that as you know, you got to pay because he's he's dealing with the AMP. A, well, AMP, did you ask PP. him? Wait, 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 hang on for one second. Did you ask the president of the union that question? No, not him. This is our local, our business agent. He's yeah. Right. No, the Matthew Loeb is our president of our international, so he's top. He's the top of the hill. So mm -hmm. my business agent is. Well, and what's down. their defense for the head of IATSE making? at least five, maybe 10 times what the rank and file learn. Yeah, the, you know, there are, now you were saying, what was your deal is like, s the head should be making how much? The highest ranking, highest no paid more. person? The head of the union should make no more than the highest paid member of the rank and file. Well, I will have to say, there are some cinematographers who probably make something like that maybe not as much but they're definitely in you know well into six figures so that could be an excuse that they could use but they're also saying he's, he's dealing with these major corporations so and the compensation has to kind of match comparable comp uh, compensation for other people doing really I, you don't think somebody with dirty fingernails and a uh, a plaid shirt and comes in and starts negotiating with these pricks, these lawyers. No, yeah, I, 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 this idea that you need somebody with clean fingernails mm -hmm. in a suit, always, of course, yeah, in a suit. And who was appointed? He, these guys don't get they don't get elected initially. They get appointed by their predecessor, who retires before this term's over, in order to install somebody so they'll already be the incumbent when the next actual election comes up, which gives them a favored uh, vote. Well. Yeah. Well, we know about, I don't want to get you into trouble, but they're IATSE. I, I don't want to say anything about IATSE and yeah. its reputation. Well, Thank he also you. was, but he was, he was giving us some of the fear stuff, you know, which that's, as we know, works very well with getting people to vote a certain way. It's like, well, yes, we could go, well, could go back to this table and maybe we'll lose everything or we might yeah. get more, but you know that, oh no, we might lose everything scares a lot of people. Um, you got to take a chance if you want to get anywhere. <laughs> you got to take a risk. Um, and he was also talking about right to work states where they can get people to uh, take our jobs that way. And I was like, I'm pretty dubious about that because they would be so incompetent that production would be a mess, you know, if, if they really tried to do something like that with inexperienced people doing these jobs. I think that would not uh, turn out yeah. so well for producers. These people are so full of shit. They just are. They're just completely full of shit and they will say anything to hide the fact that they're just greedy and they don't care about us. I'm not talking about the leader of IATSE. I'm just talking about yeah. Yeah. The, the leadership no. in general. Yeah, my own, my own business agent, He's better than we've had before than I've had in the 31 years has been that I've been in this union, 32. He is better than any of the others I've seen. There were some that were le legitimately corrupt. I mean, they actually were charged with corruption in my time in the union, in my local. Right. But this guy's he's like the best one we've had. And I, I do 
appreciate him overall. I have to say that. So I don't have to. I want to say that. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you, John, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Rodrigo in Mexico. For those of you who are not regular listeners of our show, Rodrigo is calling from another country. So that means he has to speak four different languages. If he came to America, he would only have to speak one language. That's the, that's the best thing about being American. You only have to learn one language. Hello, Rodrigo. Oh, okay. I guess, are you done? Rodrigo? Rodrigo? Hi, hi. Oh, I just unmuted you. Hang on. Okay. How are you? Rodrigo. Hi. What? Rodrigo, are you there? I just am here. How are you tonight? I'm depressed, but I wanted to share something about Mexican politics that might entertain you. Okay. Uh, you've heard me ranting and raving about uh, Manuel Bartlett Diaz, who stole the 1988 presidential election and is now in charge of Mexico's federal power company. Okay, so this is the guy who, who was president of Mexico in 1988? No, he was, in 1988, he was uh, the equivalent of the Secretary of State, and he was in and charge of... The election. He was in charge of organizing the election, and he was running the computer systems that crashed um, the day of the election, and okay. you heard me explain how uh, Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas was winning, then the computers crashed, and then a few hours later, the computers came back up, and he was losing, and Eventually, Gautemo Cárdenas uh, kept running for president. He managed to install the current president as mayor of Mexico City. And a few, a couple decades after that, uh, it was Andrés Manuel López Obrador's turn to lose two elections in a row. So in 2018, he knew that he needed help and he made a deal with the well, allegedly that's Manuel Bartolet Diaz who stole the election from the guy who made him. And two weeks ago, a Mexican reporter finally asked about these voter fraud and Bartlett said something absolutely hilarious. And if you can laugh at your own misfortune, you're still laughing about this because he said that yes, there was voter fraud, but it was organized by his future boss and the other party that lost the election in 1988. Why these two groups would work together when he was in charge of organizing the election and he was running the computers? 
I don't think we'll ever know, but you know, uh, you might call this the Trump effect. People are no longer afraid of the pitchforks coming out. They just say, oh, I, I didn't steal the election. The guy who was going to be my boss and this other party who also lost the election and lost the next election too, they're the ones who stole the election from me. But that doesn't mean I'm incapable. That means they're the bad guys. Right. I wonder if you can make a joke about. No, but I think uh, you've got me depressed now. Is that a word for someone who murders democracy and then he comes back to life 30 years later, becomes the guy running the country's power grid? Uh, it's certainly tragic enough. Let me read up on it, okay? Okay, and just one more thought. Uh, I, I wish you could spend more time saying well, maybe Jayapal is not the hero we were waiting for. Maybe yeah. we yeah. should uh, send more people to Congress instead of backseat driving and saying, well, here's everything that Pramila Jayapal did wrong. And I'm not going to run. I'm not telling people to run. I'm just saying this is what she did wrong. Right. No, I agree with you. But you also have to hold her feet to the fire. You, you, you. I agree with you. the The reason Bernie could not win in 2020 is there was nobody to support him within the Democratic Party. He was just. It's a miracle that he got that far. There was nobody in the infrastructure of the Democratic Party to help him. And had he been elected, the entire Democratic Party would have turned on him and undermined him because we don't have enough leftists inside the halls of Congress to support him. So I agree with you that the, as we were talking about earlier, the Congressional Black Caucus did an end run around the progressive caucus and cut Pramila Jayapal off at the knees. But she should have seen that coming. She should have been making, she should have protected her flank. She should have known that this was coming down the line. She should have known what Clyburn is capable of. He did this to Bernie in the, in the uh, South Carolina primary. So I got to run. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Rodrigo. I'll see you Thursday, I hope. Don't be, uh, I can't say don't. Don't be depressed. Things get better. They do. Well, what did we learn today? We learned that, I think, what I learned is that Mansion Cinema, his donors, Pelosi, McConnell, who supported this infrastructure bill, who wanted it passed. What we learned is that the Democrats are in trouble because they can't run on this infrastructure bill in the midterms because they gave the Republicans something to run on as well. This is bipartisan. Pork has been delivered to both sides of the aisle, both sides of the aisle can run on this infrastructure bill. 
So this was not a victory for Biden. It was not a victory for the Democratic Party. It was a victory for bipartisanship, but really a victory for the right wing of the Democratic Party and the corporatists in Washington. They needed, this is what I've learned today, that the corporatists needed that $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill more than we did. And personally, I don't know that much. I think we should have walked away from it. I think we should have killed it. I think that as we find out more and more about all these little goodies in that infrastructure bill, we will find that it is a transfer of wealth, our tax dollars being transferred up once again to the wealthiest 1% while this Social safety net bill, Build Back Better, will languish in Congress. And if it does pass, there will be nothing in it. Maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe we'll be surprised. I think, I think that when you exercise your muscle, when you walk away and flex your muscle, that muscle gets stronger every time you use it. And if the progressives want to get stronger, if the left wants to get stronger, they have to realize how powerful they are. And that is by destroying bills, walking away and being willing to walk away from it. Uh, there is this eighth grade thinking that this bill is something, I, I see this on Twitter, I had some friends who said to me, but it's something just because you pass something doesn't make it good. When Obamacare passed, what was it, 11 years ago, everybody said, well, it's something. It's a start. The Ivy League populists in the Democratic Party back in 2010, when Obamacare passed, they were saying, it's something, it's a start, it's a start. No, actually, Obamacare was an end to Medicare for all. And so the Democratic, uh, the, the, the faux populists, the Ivy League populists in the Democratic Party, who've never had to worry about their own health insurance or somebody else's, they say to us that Obamacare is the beginning of something big. It was the end. It was Obamacare was a payout to health insurance companies. It was a payout to big pharma. The 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 big pharma, the health insurance companies, they didn't compromise at all on Obamacare. This was a, a subsidy to big pharma. Obamacare was a, a subsidy to Big Pharma and to the health insurance companies. Yes, you couldn't be refused uh, health insurance due to pre-existing conditions, but that cost to the insurance companies was, was offset by all the subsidies they were going to get from the federal government. Obamacare was a massive transfer of wealth from our government to the health insurance and the pharmaceutical companies. More Americans now have insurance, but they can't afford to use it because of skyrocketing premiums. More Americans have prescriptions, thanks to Obamacare, but they can't afford to get those prescriptions filled. Obamacare subsidies go directly to the hospitals, to the insurance companies, to big pharma. It's costly, it's inefficient, it's why America continues to spend more money on health care than any, any country in the industrialized world. We spend more and get the worst care in the industrialized world. But when Obamacare was passed, the Ivy League populists in the Democratic Party assured us that once America got used to Obamacare, once we saw how great Obamacare was, then we'll move to a single payer. But there was no pathway in Obamacare.
to single payer. They got rid of the public option. All Obamacare did was make the insurance companies richer. It made the uh, insurance companies more powerful. It gave them more money to spend on lobbyists, which makes the likelihood of single payer or Medicare for all impossible. You cannot beat the health insurance companies. They have skyrocketing profits because health care costs are skyrocketing. But the Ivy League populace, the same people who sold us this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, assured us it's a start and we can improve upon it. And who's to say that this is the only infrastructure bill? It is the only infrastructure bill we're going to get for the next 20 years. We're not building off of this. That's it. We got an infrastructure bill passed and there'll be another one in 20 years and it's not enough. So when people say it's something, something's better than nothing, actually, sometimes nothing is better than something. And maybe, maybe, maybe the left should have killed that infrastructure bill. Maybe, maybe. We'll find out. Let's, we'll see what was, what's, uh, who's going to get all that money in that Can infrastructure. Can I introduce the radical idea, David? Oh, who, yes, you're back. Well, I'm wrapping up, but very, very, uh, very, very quickly. quickly. Uh, what if all the lefties told CNN and MSNBC, I'm not watching you anymore. I'm not going to bother uh, with boycotts of this or that show. I'm going to stop watching CNN. I'm going to stop reading CNN.com. Would that scare them into being a little more objective, you think? Maybe. I don't know why anybody would watch CNN. I have no idea why anybody would watch MSNBC. I would, I would assume that there are people in the Zoom room right now who have MSNBC going on in the background. I would assume that most of MSNBC tonight was about January 6th and Michael Flynn and uh, Trump. I would assume they weren't talking about what is inside Build Back Better. I would assume they're not telling us what's inside that infrastructure bill and where exactly the money is going. I would assume Pete Buttigieg is not making the rounds of the cable news networks. He's the Secretary of Transportation. He's not answering questions like, okay, you got an extra $550 billion. Where's that money going? Who's getting it? How do you prevent the cost overruns? Why isn't the government doing the hiring? Why is this a public-private partnership? No, they're talking about it as a big win for Joe Biden and what it means for the midterms. So I don't know why anybody would watch CNN or MSNBC. They, they have become a propaganda arm for, for, the, for the Ivy League populists in the Democratic Party who are not only destroying the Democratic Party from within, they're getting us killed. They're, you know, climate change, there's nothing. Anyway, uh, yes, I, you know, do not watch CNN or MSNBC. You're getting your news, don't get your news from millionaires. Millionaires will lie to you and say anything they need to say to make you stupid and complacent, including Rachel Maddow. If you're getting your news from millionaires, you're being brainwashed and manipulated and terrified, terrified into compromising. Don't get your news from corporations. All right. I want to thank our guests. Good, good point there, Rodrigo. I want to thank all our guests. And I can't remember <laughs> who they were. Uh, I have to look it up. I do. Uh, 
Let me see if I can do it. Dan's asleep. Uh, Dave Cyrus. John Ross. Uh, Howie Klein. Uh, Peter B. Collins. Professor Marianne. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, Who was with Howie? I'm sorry? Who was with Howie? That was somebody we should donate money to. That would be the... Uh, Daniel Lee. Daniel Lee, yes. And Mark Breslin. And Ethan Hershenfeld. All right. I'm going to get some sleep. I've been sleeping. I find if I listen to this show, I go out, boom, out. Remember to friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to the newsletter by going to my website. And if you'd like to participate in the show, join our Zoom room, hit the attend a live taping, office hours every Friday night. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the week. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. What a stupid goat. Look how he's being exploited by that monkey. The monkey hitches a ride on the goat. And then the goat doesn't even realize that the monkey is eating his own fruit that belongs to the goat. And then he gets on, gets on the goat. Doesn't even have a decency to walk, say thank you. Bad monkey. Bad monkey. Bad monkey. What a bad monkey. Taking advantage of that goat. Eating all the goat's fruit. Bad monkey.